So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto has Hashirama Sage Mode. The movie. If you guys enjoy this, what if? And if you want another. Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 1, Everything Was The Same. His seat in the corner, him feeling sleepy, loud brats making unnecessary noise and Aruka trying to control the class. But, he was feeling sleepy. So he would sleep. He could feel it, the soft hands of sleep caressing his cheeks like no one else ever did. But then again, he could not sleep. His tenant had a habit of making his life as miserable as it could, even in sleep. So Naruto made it a habit to not to sleep. Unhealthy. Yes. But necessary nonetheless. Naruto, can you please tell us about the Shidei Hokage and his special abilities? Huh? What did he want now? Did he not know that he was trying to sleep? Did he not know that he knew the answers? Was he even trying to sleep? Did he want to sleep? He did not know. Ashadai was Hashirama Senju, he was known as the god of shinobi, due to his immense powers. He commanded the woods through his wood release and. He trailed off, realizing that this was all he knew, but he had already said, and so he had to speak something now. And he had brown hair. He finished off lamely. A sigh escaped Ruka's lips. He knew that Naruto knew the answers. Naruto was an ideal student. Well, as ideal as a shinobi in training could be. He was top of the class, never missed the academy, never talked back and learned everything quickly. But, Iruka hadn't taught him anything. His basics should not have been this solid. Yes, he regretted it, but that did not take away the mystery that Naruto was. Correct, Naruto. Please be a bit more involved in class. He really tried to be friendly with him, but whenever he saw his face, all he could think of was the rampage that he had caused. Naruto did not reply. He wanted to sleep, or at least he thought he wanted to sleep. He wasn't sure. As soon as he left the academy, there was a bird waiting for him. He understood them. Sometimes, it was an eagle, sometimes a sparrow and sometimes an owl. He loved owls, they did not sleep at night, just like him. Given, they did sleep during the morning, but he did not care about the technicalities. Regardless, the point was that he could talk to them. He understood. They obeyed him. They loved him. Did his mother love him? Did he have a mother? Kaiubi had called him a monster and so did the villagers, so maybe he had no mother. But he was going off topic again, he did not like this about himself, but he was hungry, so searching for a good food stall was in order. Searching for a good food stall was not hard. Searching for a good food stall that would serve him was a different matter though. He did not like being sneered at while he was eating so, he had to look for some decent stall now. He could not wait to learn the transformation. Gucci was a good man, he helped orphans, was very friendly, and always looked out for his daughter. He had a soft spot for orphans, he encouraged his daughter A.M. to befriend as many as she could, but not him. After all, he was the reason why A.M. did not have a mother. But, Tucci was a good man, he would serve Naruto like he would serve anyone else, given his daughter was not around. He had made it very clear. Naruto should not approach if he saw his daughter around. He did not want her to be associated with him. Luckily for Naruto, A.M. was off to the academy. So, he could have some ramen and collect some toppings for the birds. The food was awesome, like always. But now, it was time for some training. He did not like to train, but if he did not train from time to time his body would get lazy and would want to sleep more, or that's what the birds told him. His birds had a lot of knowledge, his birds could spy. They told him what to do. They knew of some, but since Naruto did not know how to make hand signs, that would have to be done later. He started off by running up and down a tree, followed by general shinobi workout, and finished with meditating for a few hours. Meditating calmed him. He did not know why the birds had told him to meditate to begin with, but he was glad that he had accepted their suggestion. It was the only time he felt at peace, well not truly since the masked guys were always watching him, but they had been with him for such a long time that he had accepted them as permanent. Once the training was over, he fed the birds the food he had collected and took off towards his house. Chapter 2. He was different. He knew that very well. The villagers had not left one opportunity to make him feel unwanted. But his looks demanded attention. With blood red, shoulder length hair, golden iris and purple markings below his eyes, he stood out like a sore thumb. But he was proud of himself, he was proud of not shedding a tear in front of anyone, he was proud of his independence, and if anyone believed he should think otherwise, they could lick his foot. But, being proud would not fill his stomach, he had to swallow his pride and use the transformation to eat anywhere other than a few selected stalls, and he did not mind that. After all, survival is your priority as a shinobi 101. The day he had mastered the transformation. It did not take him much time to do that. It was first taught in the second year of the academy, and Naruto could perform it easily enough. 
As simple as this was, it was a major boon for Naruto. Now, he could walk without being noticed, he could experience a normal life or, at least, a mockery of his ideal life. Must you bring me here unannounced? For a few moments there was pin drop silence. Then, a deep voice, almost growling in a mocking manner, spoke. Ironic, is it not? You do not even have the freedom to enter your own mind without my consent. What do you want? He questioned the voice. Freedom is what I want, but this world is hardly fair. I believe even you would agree with me on this. As this voice echoed in the dark chambers of his mind, a large eye, whose slit pupil was alone as tall as Naruto himself was, opened. Naruto was not afraid. This has happened before. He had played this game before, but it was not going to happen again today. If the world was how you wish it to be, it would be dust and debris, would it not? He countered. Hardly. The voice scoffed, we were perfectly content in living our lives in peace, it were the humans who hunted down for their own benefits. The gigantic creature replied. Regardless, I am as much a victim here as you are, why must you seek to make my life harder? Entertainment, why else? What else am I supposed to do here? He questioned him mockingly. As I said, I have work to do, let me go from here. He demanded. I thought you would understand my misery as a fellow slave, Naruto. The voice was full of mockery. I am hardly a slave. What else are you, tell me? Naruto did not reply. He had not cried in front of anyone, and he did not want to cry in front of the Kaiubi. It had been three years since he had joined the academy. He was undefeated. Nothing to be proud of, their hits just did not hurt him, and he knew a lot more than others. His birds told him about everything. He was easily able to master the Academy 3, he knew the questions of the test before the test was given, and he knew how to use his chakra to enhance himself. He wanted to graduate early, but he could not. After the tragedy, now termed as the Itachi Ichiha fiasco, early graduation was not permitted anymore. Anyways, the graduation was on the verge of happening, and he could not have been happier. Ah well, he was not happy right now. It was the graduation day and he had been in the class since the morning. Since the roll numbers were based on the first alphabets of the clan name, he had a long queue ahead of him. The day was the first time that the whole class was quiet without any supervision. Everyone was anxious. Naruto lazily glanced over everyone. He did not know the name of a single child. He had pummeling almost all of them in the ground at least once, yet he knew not one of them by their name, and he did not really care. Before he could continue with his thoughts, a voice came from the door. Uzumaki Naruto. He stood up. It was the first time he was walking down the stairs of the academy while there were people behind him. He was always the last one to leave without any exceptions. Well, today was an exception, but it was a mandatory sacrifice. His red hair had maintained its length. His golden eyes were still unnerving. The purple shadows below his eyes were still there, except for the unique natural eye shadow, his face was flawless. Not a single scratch or mark. To complement his shadows, he wore a high-collared, light-colored kimono held close by a purple slash, and the kimono had red accents to complement his hair. He looked like a proper noble looking down on peasants. Leaving the room with a red hairband, there was nothing that could make his day any better. He was now officially an adult. He could now have his own house, not sponsored nine by the village, in which he could allow as many birds as he liked. Seeing him so cheerful, all the birds in the surrounding area started chirping, and this, in turn, made him even happier. Chapter 3, Are You Sure? And Blood 2. Like, a hundred percent sure. Alright alright, I will do it, no need to poke me. Contrary to what the Anbu guarding him were thinking, Naruto was not talking to himself. He was, in fact, talking to the owl resting comfortably on his shoulder. Following the owl's instructions, Naruto made the hand signs he was told to. Or. Dog. Bird. Monkey. Ram. Following this, he bit his thumb, rubbed some blood on his hand and slammed his hand down on the ground and promptly disappeared in a poof of smoke. H. Hey. Where am I? It was a forest. He thought it was a forest, at least. None of the forests near Kanoha were like this though. It was way too bright, the trees were way too tall, and there were only one or two comically large leaves atop every tree. Also, he could not sense any humans. Yeah, no humans. Shit. Tell me, young sage, what are you doing here? Hearing the voice, Naruto turned around and it was an owl. It was talking. Yes, Naruto could understand the birds, but this one was really talking. Like, really really talking. How are you speaking? The same way you do, although our biology differs. But, I am sure you would not be very much interested in that. So tell me, why did you come here? The owl asked him. Dunno. He said, that owl told me to do those hand signs and I ended up here. So, you can actually talk to the owls. Sure can, who are you anyways? He asked. A born sage, truly. The owl said, ignoring his question. Follow me. The owl said and began moving forwards. Not knowing what he had gotten himself into, he followed the flying owl silently. 
As he moved forward, he could see a lot more owls, some lazing around, some making food, some playing and some training, apparently. The owl which he was following landed down on a chair-like structure, carved out of a tree, and asked Naruto to take a seat too. Not wanting any unnecessary drama, Naruto obeyed. So, can you tell me where exactly I am? This is Mount Basin. The land of the owl summons. The owl told him. So, that actually was the summoning Naruto was not sure before, but he had his doubts. So, how can I go back? He continued. We will send you back, but you would not mind indulging me in a conversation, would you? The owl asked him. The conversation. Why not? He prompted the owl to ask away what he wanted. My name is Fukuru, young sage. What might your name be? I am Yuzumaki Naruto. He is now named Fukuru. Tell me, young Naruto, since when are you channeling? Sinjutsu? What is that? Naruto asked, a bit too curious to learn something new. Sinjutsu, or the art of channeling nature chakra is exactly what its name defines. It means perfectly balancing your own chakra with the energy of nature to enter a transformation known as the sage mode. Fukuru explained. I don't know what you mean, I have never even heard of nature chakra before. Naruto replied, a bit curious. You say that, but these eyes of yours are a sign of your sage transformation. Your body has been balancing nature chakra on its own since your birth, it seems. He looked at Naruto with a more intense gaze and continued, although, it seems like this is not the perfect sage transformation. He concluded. You will need to explain more thoroughly. Naruto said, wanting to learn more about his apparent ability. Sage mode, as I explained, is a state of being which is established when the user balances his chakra perfectly with the nature chakra present in, as the name suggests, nature. It is a very difficult skill to achieve, and there have been very few true sages in centuries. So few, in fact, that you could count them with your fingers and still have eight fingers to spare. He said and took a deep breath to continue speaking, but, it seems that your body, for some reason, is pre-exposure to natural chakra and has learned to balance it passively. That would result in a much stronger body and much more potent chakra for you. But, because you are not channeling the chakra actively, you are not using the sage mode to its full potential. He concluded. And what do my eyes have to do with this? Naruto asked. Sage mode often results in some sort of physical change, for you, it seems, it is your unnatural eye color and the purple shadows of your eyes. He said. I see, so do you know how I could perfect this power? He asked. The owls have never produced a sage, but the holy land of owls has plenty of natural chakra for you to practice. If you become our summoner, I believe, it would be easier for you to master your powers. He said. Naruto stood up and bowed till his waist, please, accept me as your summoner. He requested. Stand tall, young Naruto. Be sharp, use your wisdom, and we of the owl clan shall never leave your side. Draw your blood and sprinkle it on the holy land of Mount Basin, and we shall accept you as our summoner. At this point, there were hundreds of owls surrounding them. Not falling into the pressure, Naruto bit his thumb and sprayed what little blood came out directly on the land. For a brief second his name was visible on the ground. And then, the journey of a young sage had begun. Chapter 4, A Hokage was tense. It was no more than five minutes ago that the guard detail of the village Jinchuriki had reported the Jinchuriki missing. The village gates were closed, but no distress signal was passed. Causing havoc in the village would do him no favors. Apparently, the boy had attempted to use the summoning. Who taught him the hand signs was anyone's guess. The Anbu were interrogated but, till now, nothing was known. Pirazin, himself, was guilty of neglecting the boy. He had promised his mother that he would take care of him, but he could not. He had not even approached him till now. He had certainly tried. Tried and failed miserably, but tried nonetheless. Whenever he saw the boy, he was reminded of the cold body of his wife, Owako. He tried to console himself, thinking that he had a lot on his plate already, but the dam of guilt broke whenever he saw his own grandson, Kinohamaru, bathe in riches. He could have certainly done much more, but he too was a human and humans resented, humans mourned and humans did not forgive. He knew he was a hypocrite. He could not bring himself to forgive Naruto, but he expected the boy to forgive the village, to forgive him, and to forgive everyone who ever caused him harm, and still protect the village with everything he had. But now was not the time to regret, he had to find it. The Kashi wanted to sleep. Or read his smut. Or maybe, read his smut and then sleep. But he could not do any of that. Why? Because all the summoners in Kanoha were called for a meeting. They had to make sure that a brat was not on their summons plane. But he just wanted to read and sleep, why was all this important anyways? The. Ah, so they had attempted the summoning. Now it made sense. He was only listening to bits and pieces of Thehokage's speech and building sentences based on them. After all, Jureyasama had worked really hard on this particular book. The search had borne no fruit. Regardless, the boy was found. He had reverse summoned himself and, judging from the tattoo on his hand, he was now a summoner. Pirazin exhaled a sigh of relief. 
if he was reported as missing officially, his leadership would have been questioned, and that old goat Danzo would have left no table unturned to get him off of the seat of the Hokage. Well, all is good now. He could let Naruto go with a slap on the wrist this time, he supposed. He could rest for a bit then, after that he had to attend to the accursed paper too. How he wished Sanadi were here to take his hat away from him. She would have been the perfect Okage, but things were not perfect. He had this burden and he would do his best to serve the village. Naruto was bored. Whenever he was here, he felt bored. He had forgotten how being in this classroom felt. But, hopefully, this would be the last time he would have to be here. He was here for the team distribution. He did not wish to be part of any team, but things were hardly as he wanted them to be. So, he had to suck it up and be a good little genin, at least, till the time he became a, who could take solo missions. But, coming full circle yet again, Naruto was very bored right now. Why was Aruka not getting this over with already? Should he punch him in the face and force him to announce the teams? Dean 1. Aruka spoke, coincidentally right when Naruto was considering standing up. So, Naruto relaxed and waited for his team to be announced. Team 10 will be Nara Shikamaru, Yamanaka Ino and Uzumaki Naruto under the Jonin Siratobi Asuma. He did not know who Nara was. He did not know who Yamanaka was. He did not know who Siratobi was and, honestly, he did not care. He just wanted to get this over with. Apparently, their sensei's name was Asuma and not Siratobi, just like his teammates' names were Shikamaru and Ino and not Nara and Yamanaka. Well, he honestly couldn't care less. But, what he cared about was the chef that was glaring at him. Yeah, Asuma had called them to gather in a restaurant for their first team meeting, and the owner, apparently, did not like him. True to the stature of Asuma as A, no one confronted him, but their glares irritated him anyways. At least he got a seat near the window, so he always had a bird on his shoulder. Yeah, that comforted him a lot. Ahem. Asuma cleared his throat before he could think any further. So, I am Asuma Siratobi, who may or may not become your sensei. Well, we will discuss that later. First, I want you all to introduce yourself. Your likes, dislikes, goals and the common stuff. He said. Acknowledging the silence, he continued, I suppose I should go first. He said as he released a puff of smoke from his cigar. As I already told you, my name is Asuma Siratobi. I like smoking, I dislike traitors, and I have achieved everything I wanted in my life. He said. Patching his look towards her, Ino started. I am Yamanaka Ino. I like flowers, I hate Sakura and want to make my clan proud. She finished with enthusiasm. Following the cue, Shikamaru sighed and started, My name is Nara Shikamaru, I like to sleep, I dislike people who do not let me sleep, and my goal is to retire. Adding a quick nuisance to his sentence, he laid his head on the table in front of him. Realizing he was the last one left and everyone was looking at him expectantly, he started. My name is Yuzumaki Naruto. I like birds, to this the bird on his shoulder chirped happily, I dislike people who bore me, and I wish to have a proper sleep someday. On the declaration of his goal, all six eyes shot towards him. What? He asked them. What do you mean you wish to have a proper sleep? The Nara boy asked. Ah, the Kaiubi won't let me sleep. So yeah, I really want to have a comfortable sleep at least once. He said, looking towards them. DH the, the Kaiubi. Ino stuttered out, visibly scared. He looked towards Asuma. They do not know. He questioned. Asuma just groaned and sighed, he was not prepared for this on his first day as a sensei. No Naruto. None of the kids your age know of that. Asuma said. But I suppose your teammates must know about this anyway. He finished. Following this, he stood up, got behind the three of them and sunshine to the training ground 10. Looking towards Naruto he said, do you want to tell them yourself? Naruto just shrugged and started. You are aware of the Kaiubi attack, yes? He asked them. Yes. They both answered in chorus. Well, that night, to defeat the Kaiubi, the Firth Okage sealed the Kaiubi inside of me, and that made me what he said. So, you are the Kaiubi? Ino asked, moving away from him. Well, no. Not exactly. He is sealed inside of me. Like, he is still a separate entity. He said. I see what Ino said. Well, that's that for today, I suppose. I do not believe we will be able to do the plant test today. So, we will meet here tomorrow at 6 in the morning. Come prepared for survival training. With that he disappeared in a flicker. Noticing that Ino and Shikamaru were maintaining their distance from him, he decided to give them their space and left in a flicker too. Well, they supposed they had a few things to think about. Chapter 5, Naruto was not sleepy. But, his teammates were. It was 5.30 in the morning, and the pair of them were constantly yawning. No, he was not jealous. He was only annoyed. Why did they have to yawn in front of him anyways? Were they mocking him? Before Naruto could think any further, Asuma appeared in a swirl of leaves. Good morning, little Jennings. He said, far too cheerful for this time in the morning. Shikamaru yawned, Ino's eyes twitched and Naruto stared at him. 
Ah, he supposed they were not used to training this early then. So. He started. Generally, newly assigned genins have to take a test to make it certain that they can work as a team, but I do things differently. He said. Differently how? Eno asked, ever so curious. I am putting you on a provisional period of one month. If you perform well as a team, I will officially accept you as my team. He replied. Did you call us here, at this hour, to tell us this? Shikamaru asked in a surprisingly threatening tone. Of course not. Asuma scoffed. We will be having survival training right now to see how strong you actually are. Asuma glanced at the clock in his hands, set it down, said start. And promptly disappeared in a poof of smoke. The three genin were still standing there, confused. You have three hours to land a hit on me. An echo came from the trees behind them. This stirred them into motion, and they ran to the other side. Ino was weary of Naruto. Shikamaru and her had talked to their fathers about Naruto. While Shikamaru's father had told him to do what he likes and not follow the crowd, Ino's father was not happy with the team placement. He had warned her explicitly to not use any of their clan on Naruto. Nonetheless, she would have to judge him for herself before making any decisions. So, what's the plan? Ino asked. Naruto raised his hand in the air, and a bird came to sit on it. Asuma is far from here, we have plenty of time to plan. He said. How do you know that? Shikamaru questioned. I can talk to the birds. He said. And, with this, an awkward silence was bestowed on them. Ahem. Ino broke the silence awkwardly. I think we should rely on Shikamaru's plan, that is kin to his thing. She said. Naruto shrugged and they looked towards Shikamaru expectantly. Asuma was surrounded by trees, relaxing and smoking without any concerns. He was holding a cigar in his hands and was reaching towards the lighter from his other hand. As soon as he got the hold of the lighter and both his hands got busy, a concentrated gust of wind, with a cry of, wind style. Gale palm. Was thrown towards him. As the dust settled, they could only see a shattered log of wood. Substitution. Shikamaru murmured. He continued, and on his command, Naruto released one more gale palm towards a seemingly unsuspecting Asuma, only to get the same results as before. Seeing the opportunity, Naruto engaged Asuma in a tajutsu battle, while Shikamaru tried to get behind their sensei silently. Shadow possession. He said, as a threat of shadow moved towards Asuma. Just as the shadow was going to bind him, Asuma jumped and dodged Naruto's punch simultaneously. Accepting their defeat, Shikamaru and Naruto retreated. Or so Asuma thought. Just when he turned back, two shuriken came towards him. Seeing Ino from the corner of his eyes, he dodged them and tried to flip backwards. Only to realize that he was stuck. Looking down, he saw a strand of shadow connecting him and Shikamaru, with the shadow of the now embedded shuriken, working as an enhancer for the shadow. Shadow possession. Success. Shikamaru said, almost smugly. Just as he tried to overpower the bind, a jaw-shattering punch connected with his face, and he was promptly knocked out. Asuma woke up with a groan. That boy's punch was hard. Looking around, he realized he was still in the same training ground. Sitting up straight and looking around, he saw the three genin enjoying their food. When their eyes met, we won. Came from all of them. I suppose you did. Asuma said, a bit grumpily. Chapter 6. It had been three weeks since he had become the sensei of Team 10. The three of them were coming along nicely. Since, somehow, the three of them already knew of the tree walking exercise, he had taught them the water walking exercise. He thought that Naruto would have some problems controlling his chakra as the sheer amount of it was crazy, but no. The boy had somehow managed to control his chakra very precisely. So, all in all, he should have been feeling proud, right? No. He was feeling shocked. Why, you ask? Because it had been three whole weeks of D-rank missions, and none of them had complained. Not even once. Shikamaru was happy with what he was doing, Naruto was happy that he was earning, so he could save up money for a new house, and Ino had, surprisingly, taken to follow the lead of Shikamaru and Naruto. So, now they were standing in front of him, and he was trying to convince his cute genin how the new genin should argue with their sensei to get some cool missions. Well, they did not budge. But enough was enough. He was done with D-ranks, so they were going to take a C-rank, whether his students liked it or not. Yes Hokage-sama. My team and I wish for a C-rank mission. Asuma said, trying to hide his indignity. Your team, you say? They said, looking towards the genin. The genin promptly shook their heads, and just as Ino tried to voice their decision, Asuma glared at her. And the glare was enough to shut the three of them. Yes, my team and I Hokage-sama. Asuma said. Well then, a C rank is in order, I suppose. He said, looking towards the pile of documents in front of him. Hmm. He murmured as he tossed a file towards Asuma. There has been an influx of sudden disappearances in the land of hot water. We believe that a group of bandits have set their camps there. You are to find and eliminate them. They said. The land of hot water it is, then. Asuma said, accepting the mission. 
Then, he looked towards the genin and said, pack your bags for two weeks, we leave tomorrow at eight in the morning. And dismissed them. Naruto was happy. Moving through the dense forest, he could see several new species of birds, and he loved them all. Right now, he was caressing a sparrow while an owl was sleeping on his shoulder. Yeah, his summon owls could sleep like that. They were pretty cool. He had summoned this one because he was a sensor type summon. Even though he was sleeping, he would wake up the moment he would feel any new chakra around. All in all, he was enjoying the C rank mission. Say, Naruto. Ino said, grabbing his attention. How do you manage without sleeping? She questioned. Ino had relaxed around him now. Even though he did not talk a lot, he was not a bad person. Just socially awkward, she supposed. And he probably did not even know that he was socially awkward. I do not need to manage without sleep. He replied, forming quotes in the air. Not sleeping is simply easier. He concluded. You always say that, but you never tell us what that means. She huffed. At this point, both Shikamaru and Asuma were trying to listen while pretending indifference. Naruto sighed and said, well, when I sleep, I end up in my mind. Ino blinked and asked, and, what's wrong with that? She sounded very curious. You would not want to spend full nights in front of a mass of oppressing chakra, which is full of hatred, would you? He asked. And on top of that, I am somewhat of a censor, so if I go there, I am constantly anxious for upwards of six to eight hours, and that just makes me worse than not sleeping at all. He finished. Ah, well, I suppose not. She had nothing more to say. The squad fell into a somewhat comfortable silence after this. Poor bastards. Naruto sighed out. The gang of bandits had tried to attack them for their food and material possessions on their way to the land of hot waters. Coincidentally, they were a gang of three. So, Asuma thought they would be good first kills for his students. Naruto had killed the bandit easily enough. Shikamaru, too, understood what needed to be done. But, Ino was currently sobbing after her first kill, and Asuma was consoling her. Naruto and Shikamaru were cleaning their kunai in a nearby stream. So, first kill. Shikamaru questioned. Yeah. Naruto said, not really caring. Ah, yes. A very good morning to you, Shinobi-san. The lord of the land of hot waters was an old goat. He was dressed in pristine royal blue robes, fitting of a noble. Had a mustache, fitting of a noble. And had an annoying verbal tick, again, fitting of a noble. Good morning to you too. I am Asuma Sirotobi, and this is my team. Yuzumaki Naruto, Nara Shikamaru and Yamanaka Ino, in order. Asuma said, introducing everyone. Ah, yes. A very promising team, it seems. I was not expecting the son of Thehokage himself. He said. We will do our best, if you could tell us where the suspected site is, if the pleasantries are done, of course. Asuma said, trying to get to the point. Ah, yes. The pleasantries are, indeed, done. The noble said. The suspected site is a cave towards the land of rice, the south, that is. Blood has been spotted there several times, and people have disappeared from there, too. He finished. We will depart, then. Thank you for the information. Asuma said. Ah, yes. You should, indeed, depart, I suppose. He said. The sight was gruesome. There was blood splattered everywhere, and Ino could have sworn that she saw an eyeball rolling. There were marks of bodies being dragged everywhere, and it seemed like the culprit used a sharp weapon, as there were scratch marks on the trees around. Be on guard, and let's move forwards. Asuma said. An eerie silence was set on the squad as they entered the cave. Since nothing was visible, Asuma summoned a ball of fire on his hand, and oh boy. How they wished they could have unseen this. There were bodies upon bodies lying around. Some full, some half. Some could hardly be called bodies. At first glance, Naruto could count eight heads lying around. And what might you be doing in my den? A voice questioned. All of them turned around to see the owner of the voice. He had medium-length gray hair that was slicked back and distinctive purple eyes. He wore no shirt, had bandages wrapped around his stomach, wore maroon pants with long, black shinobi sandals, each bearing an attached zipper. We are Kanoha Shinobi, and from the looks of it, we are here to kill you. Asuma said. Ah, in that case, my name is Haydn, a servant of Lord Jashin. And you. He said, pointing towards the squad, shall be my next sacrifice. And with that said, he rushed towards Asuma. Scatter and take advantage of our numbers. Asuma shouted. The genin scattered. Naruto taking the front, Shikamaru as a support and Ino at the back, waiting for the perfect spot to use her clan's ability. While they formed their formation, Asuma had pulled out his trench knives and was engaging the, now named, Haydn in a tojutsu fight. Asuma was clearly the superior fighter, but the guy, Haydn, just would not stay down. Wind style. Gale Palm Naruto exclaimed and sent a concentrated force of wind towards the shirtless guy. Haydn dodged him and pressed forwards to attack Asuma. Well, at least he tried to. Shadow Possession Jutsu. Success. And before he could think any further, a trench knife was embedded through his heart. 
Now assured of their victory, Shikamer released them and moved to gather with his team. Well, that's that I suppose. Asuma said. Good work, Uth. His eyes widened and he leaped towards Naruto. It seemed he was too late. Somehow, the guy was still alive and he was going to stab Naruto in the back with his scythe. Just as the scythe was about to make contact with Naruto's skin. Clank. The sound of metal hitting metal was heard. No, Asuma had not reached there on time. So, what had stopped the scythe? Naruto's eyes were wide, it was the first time he had been so close to dying. But, there was a glowing purple chain, growing from his back, that had stopped the scythe from hitting him. The chain wrapped around Hayden's hand and threw him across the cave. What is that? Ino questioned, flabbergasted. The hell if I know. Naruto replied, just as surprised. Naruto extended his hand and the chain curled inside his palm, like it wanted to be petted. Naruto obliged the chain and it shivered. Before anything else could happen, Hayden stood up again. Why won't you blasted creatures die already? He exclaimed, frustrated. Ash release. Fire blast. Asuma said as he released a gust of ash towards Hayden and burnt it. The explosion was great, but as the smoke gusted away, Hayden stood there, with only his clothes damaged. Seeing the opportunity, Ino captures him. In her mind transfer. As soon as Naruto realized that Ino had captured him and Asuma was still winded, he blitzed towards the shirtless guy and cut his head off. Still wary of any tricks, he remained on guard. You fucker, what did you do? An angry voice exclaimed. Naruto stiffened, expecting an attack, but it did not come. When the team gathered around the, now talking, head, they could not help but exclaim in surprise. Not wanting to wait for any further tricks, Asuma sealed the head and the body in separate scrolls. Ah, yes. Is it done then? The annoying lord asked. Yes, it was a Jashin worshipper. He is taken care of. Asuma replied. Ah, yes. A Jashin worshipper. I suppose thanks are in order, then. Would you like to stay overnight for a feast? The lord questioned. A generous offer, but I will have to decline. We must leave as soon as possible. Asuma said. Ah, yes. Duty calls, I suppose. You have our thanks. Please do visit us again. The pleasure was all ours. We hope to see you again. Asuma said and commanded his team to leave for their way back home. Chapter 7. The Jashin Cultist, you say? They asked. Yeah. Asuma replied, way too casual for talking to his leader. I suppose he is dead, then? They replied, uncaring. Well, Naruto did cut his head off. But, he is still alive. Ino chimed in. A Hokage raised an eyebrow, and before he could ask for it, Asuma summoned a scroll and released its contents. You blasted creature, I swear by Jashin Sama, I will kill all of you, slowly and painfully, and sacrifice your sorry asses in the worst possible manner. You can, of course, guess who said this. Adapting to the situation quickly, the Anbu guards quickly put a sock in the mouth of the speaking head. Looking at the flabbergasted expression on Thehokage's face, Asuma said, he just would not die. I can certainly see that. They said. Then, looking towards the Anbu, he said, take him to Ibiki, please. The Anbu followed the orders wordlessly and disappeared with the head in hand. No injuries, then? They asked, coming back to the topic. Nothing major, no. Asuma replied. That is quite an accomplishment. Since Hayden is a known missing ninja, this mission will be ranked up to A rank, and you all will be paid accordingly. They said, seemingly proud. Naruto was happy. With the money from the A rank mission and the money that he had been saving up, he could finally buy a small house with a nice garden now. Say, Naruto, will you mind joining us for a family dinner tomorrow night? Ino asked, breaking him out of his thoughts. Family dinner? Naruto questioned. Yeah, Shikamaru's, Choji's and my family usually meet up once a month since our fathers were a team and all. Ino said. Naruto did not know who Choji was, but he did not really care. Why me, though? I don't think your families would like that very much. Naruto said, dismissing the idea. My father certainly would not mind. Shikamaru said, a touch of boredom, like always, attached to his voice. See? My parents would not mind either, and Choji's parents are very good too. Ino chimed in. I suppose I can, then. He really did not want to go, but had no excuses. And maybe, he could feel like a part of a family for once. Channel your chakra through this. Asuma told the three of them. Team 10 was currently in training ground 10, and Asuma was pointing three sheets of papers towards them. Following what he said, the three genin took one sheet of paper each and channeled their chakra through it. Shikamaru's paper turned into dust and then burnt off. Ino's paper soiled and turned into dust. And Naruto's paper split in two and turned into dust. What was that? Ino, the voice of the team, asked. Interesting. Asuma murmured, ignoring Ino for now. Stop talking to yourself. Ino huffed. This was a chakra paper. It represents your chakra nature. And what happened here is quite unique. He said, obliging Ino. Unique how? She questioned again. 
Well firstly, all three of you have more than one chakra nature, that's pretty rare in itself. But, to top that, you all have one common element, the earth, that is, and one unique element. Fire for Shikamaru, water for Ino and wind for Naruto. He said, earth is a very good defensive element, and I can teach you some earth too. Fire and wind are my specialties, so we have that covered too. And for Ino, I will have to look up for a good water user, as water is contradicting my fire nature. He finished. Well, we can explore your unique natures later on. For now, you have to turn these leaves into dust with your chakra alone. He said, pointing towards the trees. Their routine for today was the same too. Chakra nature transformation in the morning and D ranks till the evening. They had completed upwards of 200 D rank missions. But that was not the point right now, the point was that he was heading towards the Yamanaka clan district for the dinner he had agreed to. He had not changed his clothes, since his kimono doubled as casual wear too, but he had tied his hair in a ponytail to do something different for once. Walking towards the Yamanaka district, he was feeling very nervous. Reason for your visit? The blonde guard asked. I was invited to dinner. Naruto replied, but he doubted the guys would let him in. Aino Yamanaka? He questioned. Yes. Naruto replied. The guy looked at the list in his hands and surprisingly, let him in. Yeah, if he had any doubts before, he had none now. Ino was rich. The district in itself just shouted dignity. But, the clan head's house was massive, he was sure that their whole room alone was as big as his apartment. Hey Naruto. Over here. Ino called him from the top of the stairs, calling him towards her. Naruto obliged and started to climb the stairs, when he reached there, Ino was not alone. There was a lady standing with her, maybe her mom. They look really similar, Naruto thought. This is my mom. Ino introduced, confirming his suspicion. Hello, dear. My name is Maiko, who might you be? Maiko asked. I am Yuzumaki Naruto, ma'am. He said. Now, none of that, you can call me Maiko. She said, raising her hand to ruffle Naruto's hair. Naruto was not used to being petted. He was not used to being touched, really. So, when the lady tried to ruffle his hair, he stiffened, and a purple chain shot out of his back on its own, seemingly leering at Maiko's hand threateningly. Maiko did see this, but ignored it and continued to ruffle his hair. Realizing that the woman meant no harm to its master, the chain retreated, but did not disappear, staying there like a loyal guard dog. Why don't you head to Ino's room? Shikamaru is waiting there too. Maiko said. Why yes ma'am. I am sorry. Naruto said. It's alright, and did I not ask you to call me Maiko? She asked. Yes, Maiko-san. I will take your leave then. Naruto said, and Maiko just giggled. Naruto did not know what he was feeling, but the head pat was really warm. He wondered if Maiko-san would mind doing it again. And maybe, if he would be good, she will even hug him, like he had seen mothers do to their children. Ah, well. He was overthinking again. The dinner was great, but uneventful. He had just sat there, eating and listening to how families behaved with each other. He had enjoyed his dinner for the first time. He wondered if that was what having a family felt like. Also, Maiko san had ruffled his hair again while he was leaving, and to him, that was the most important part of the night. She was really warm. Now, the only thing that could make his night any better was a warm sleep, but he was not gonna get it. So, he supposed he should be happy with what he had. Chapter 8 Balancing nature chakra with your own chakra needs very delicate control, but, for some reason, your chakra system is pre-exposed to nature chakra. As a consequence, your body has been subconsciously absorbing and balancing the natural chakra on its own. Fukuru explained. But, this does not mean that you are using the sage mode to its full potential. He continued. Sage mode, to its core, is about conscious balance. The very basis of this transformation is awareness. You need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to be aware of yourself. You need to be aware of your chakra, and you need to be aware of how your chakra mixes with the natural chakra. The owl said. I see, but rather than giving this whole speech about balance, how about you tell me what exactly am I supposed to do? Naruto questioned, impatience dripping from his voice. Young blood. Such impatience. He sighed out. Patience, my boy, is the key to using sage mode to its full potential. He said, and started moving towards his house, prompting Naruto to follow him. Hukuru took him to his house. It was a cozy home. Just as Naruto started to explore, an owl came and sat next to Fukuru. Not wanting to be rude, Naruto too, sat down across from them. This is Fuka-chan, my wife. Fukuru said. Ah, dear. Is this young Naruto? The now identified Fuka asked. Yes, he is. The owl replied. Nice to meet you, youngling. I am Fuka. She introduced herself. Hello, Fuka-sama. I am Yuzumaki Naruto. It is a pleasure to meet you. Naruto said, introducing himself in kind. Ahem. Fukuru scoffed. It is about time that Fuka and I start cooking, and you, young Naruto, are to observe us cooking, without moving. He said. 
Lacking the energy to argue, he did what he was told to do and sat down on the sofa in front of the kitchen. This was the first week off he had gotten since he had become a shinobi. Apparently, Asuma-sensei had teamed up with the sensei of Team 7 to a mission to the Wave, a small village near the outskirts of the Fire Nation. He had told them how a business tycoon was trying to take over the territory of the Hidden Leaf Village and how a guy named Kakashi and he had to assassinate the man. Since this would be a week-long mission, the Kakashi guy and Asuma had put the responsibility of training their teams on the sensei of Team 8, a lady named Kurkur. He was bad at remembering names, wasn't he? Well, anyways, taking the opportunity, he asked Asuma if he could visit his summons for training for a week. Asuma had agreed and gotten him the permission for a training trip from the... So, here he was, observing an old owl couple cooking. So, why did I have to stare at you for six hours? Naruto grumbled. Who cooks for six hours, anyways? He continued. We do, young Naruto. He said, and came back with a mirror. And this is why you did that. He said, showing Naruto the mirror. His eye shadow had grown thicker and had turned into a darker shade of purple. What is this? Naruto questioned, shocked. This is the partial sage transformation. Fukuru said. Follow me. He said and moved out of the house. And Naruto followed him. Now, they were standing in front of a large rock. Try punching it. Fukuru said. The rock Naruto questioned, shocked. Yes, just do it. Fukuru ordered. Fine. Naruto sighed and ran towards the rock, and. Boom. The large noise echoed, and the rock shattered into millions of pieces. Whoa. Naruto murmured, looking at his hands. This is what you get as a result of the partial sage transformation. Fukuru said, interrupting Naruto's musings. Senjutsu will also empower you. He informed me. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Sasuke said, exhaling a large fireball, the heat of which conveyed his frustration. Yes, Sasuke was frustrated. He felt like he was not improving at all. First, he got stuck with an annoying fangirl and a fatso. Then, his sensei was lazy, who would rather read his smut all day than train them. And finally, the same sensei had thrusted them to a lady for training, rather than taking them for the A-rank mission he was doing. He had not even awakened his Sharingan yet, how was he supposed to catch up to Itachi without his Sharingan, anyways? Even Team 10 had done an A-rank mission. Was he not stronger than them? Yeah, he had never defeated that redhead, but that was the academy. He was sure that if he awakened the Sharingan, he could beat him too. After all, Itachi was stronger than everyone when he was his age. She could not thank Asuma-sensei enough. Kurinai's natural chakra nature was water, and that made her the perfect teacher for Ino. Water style. Water wave. Ino exclaimed, happy to see the large stream of water coming out of her mouth. You have improved quite a lot, Ino. Kurinai said, appreciating the efforts the girl was putting in. Thank you, Kurinai-sensei. It's all thanks to you. Ino said, very thankful. Shadow sewing jutsu. Shikamaru exclaimed as a small thread of shadow became third dimensional. That is a vast improvement you have made, Shikamaru. Shikaku said. Asked, but not enough. How troublesome. Shikamaru sighed out. Indeed, these techniques are based on yin release, and these can be improved only with practice. Shikaku explained. Who knew that midget would pull out two air rank ninjas from his ass? Asuma said. Yeah, I really was not expecting that. Kakashi replied. The young boy was quite a fighter. His ice release was pretty solid. Too bad for him, my ash release was the perfect counter for it. How was yours? Asuma questioned. I would have died if it wasn't for Pakin and the pack holdings abuse off. That guy was one hell of a swordsman. At least, we got the Kubikuramju. It would be a good bargaining tool if we would need one against the mist. Kakashi said. Yeah. Asuma said, settling into a comfortable silence. So, are you finally using your inherent ability to use it took you long enough? A deep voice growled. Naruto was meditating, as per the instructions of the old owl. And well, things happened, and he was here in front of them. Inherent, you say. Did you, perhaps, know who my parents were? Naruto questioned. You have improved at noticing small things, perhaps your puny mind can, indeed, comprehend more than I thought it could. Kaiubi was mocked. You did not answer my question. Naruto replied. I am not obligated to answer any of your questions. But, yes, not only I, but many know of your heritage. Kaiubi said. Lies. Naruto scoffed. I have nothing to gain from lying to you, and contrary to what you think, I am the only one who has never lied to you. Kaiubi said, settling his jaw on his paws. Indulge me, then. Tell me who they were. Naruto questioned, trying to not sound desperate. Why should I? I have nothing to gain from telling you anything. They scoffed. Your selfishness is the only reason you are caged in here, perhaps. Naruto said, trying to mock the nine-tailed fox. A creature like yourself calling me selfish. Ha. They laughed. 
I have been caged for almost a century, just so you humans could have a trump card for the next inevitable war, and you call me selfish. He asked. Maybe you are right, maybe humans are selfish. But, then again, maybe you are wrong. Maybe you are on the other side of the coin which needs to be hidden for the other side to shine. Maybe you are the one sacrifice which needed to be made for the betterment of all the others, just like I was the one who had to be sacrificed to stop your rampage. Naruto said. Do not think too highly of yourself, boy. The reason for my attack on Kanoha was also human. You delude yourself too much. You have so much arrogance, well you are but a fragile creature. Humans manipulate, humans play dirty, and they go uncalled for to do what they think is right. Kaiubi growled. Thinking highly of myself is the only thing that establishes my existence. Have I not been subjected to enough hatred? Have I not done enough for my village? Why can I not think highly of myself when I am the only one who thinks highly of myself? You think you are the only one suffering. Don't delude yourself. The chain is not only attached to your neck, the same chain extends to my neck too. This seal not only binds you to me, it binds me to you, too. Do you suffer from isolation? I suffer from hatred. Do you suffer from unfairness? Well, guess what? I do too. Don't think I am happy with the shorter end of the stick in my life, but I am doing what I must to survive, and you are only making things harder for me, and ultimately, for yourself. Because, eventually, someone will come for you, and I will be the one fighting for not only my, but your safety too. Naruto said, now breathless, trying to cover his frustration that he was feeling for not getting the answers he sought. Ayubi did not deem it worth replying, and sent him out of his mind. Chapter 9 So, how was your mission, Asuma-sensei? Hino chirped. Pillar be killed, you know how it is. Asuma replied, puffing his cigar. Well, anyways, I have something for you today. He continued. What now? Shikamaru sighed. These are the forms for the exams. All three genin straightened up at this. I believe you are ready for it. Overkill perhaps, but at the very least, ready. He said, passing the forms to the genin. You can, of course, refuse if you feel you are not ready. Asuma said. Now, you can have the day off. If you wish to take the exams, be present at the academy at 8, a week from now. He concluded and disappeared in a swirl of leaves. So, daddy. What do you think? Hino asked. Well I would have liked it if you had more experience under your belt before you enter in the exams, it will certainly be a safer choice for you to take the exams this year. Inoichi said. Safer, why so? Hino asked. This year, the exams will be held in Kanoha itself, and it will be at least three to four more years before Kanoha hosts the exams again. So, if you think you are ready, I think you should go for it. Inoichi explained. H hey, what do you mean by that? I can take care of myself outside of the village too. Hino exclaimed indignantly. Of course you can, honey. I am just saying that taking your first attempt in your home village itself is a safer option. Inoichi placated. Yeah, whatever. Hino huffed. Maiko just giggled at the familiar scene. Troublesome, why do I need to do this? Shikamaru was willing to sleep the exams out. He would happily do D-rank missions for the rest of his life. But, he couldn't. Why? Because dot. You lazy brat, you are not sitting the exams out. You better start preparing for the exams now. Yoshino exclaimed. Troublesome. Troublesome. Why can't you let me sleep? Why can't you let me sleep? Shikaku and Shikamaru chorused. As soon as they realized what they had done, Shikaku disappeared in a swirl of leaves. But, Shikamaru did not know the shunshin yet. And well, his mother was heading towards him. With a pan in her hand. Damn. He sighed out. He should run now, should he not? But that would be too troublesome. He supposed he could take this one like a man. Naruto was happy. He had, with his savings, finally purchased a house. It was in the red light district and it was small. But, it was his, and it had a good garden. So, he was happy. Yeah, and the exams were coming too. He was really happy. And he was really tired too. He was happily tired, he supposed. But, did such a state even exist? Ah, he was overthinking again, wasn't he? Why was he tired, you ask? Well, he had been trying to control 12 chains at once. Till now, he had discovered that his chains worked like an automatic defense. They would automatically pop out when they felt any danger, but it was very difficult to control them consciously. It was like trying to control 12 hands at once. He could control 4 easily enough, he could command up to 8 chains to go in a general direction, but with 12, his control went haywire. Hey Naruto. Ino said, running towards him. What are you up to? She asked. Trying to control these. He said, pointing towards his back, from where the chains were emerging. I see, do you think you could spare some time to teach me the earth clone jutsu? Ino asked. Also, mom told me to invite you to dinner tonight, so, perhaps, we could go to the Yamanaka district now, train for a bit, and have dinner then. She said, I suppose I can, yes. Naruto said. 
That's awesome, let's go then. Ino exclaimed. He had been wondering if he would see Maiko-san again. Maybe she was just being polite in front of the guests, he thought. But, no. Maiko-san had called him over for dinner again. He was glad. Maybe she would pet his head again. Hey Naruto, snap out of it. Ino huffed. Sorry Ino. Where were we? Naruto questioned, not looking sorry at all. You were showing me the hand signs. Ino said, locking her hands at her waist. Yeah, look carefully. He said as he started forming the hand signs. Earth style. Earth clone jutsu. He said, as a perfect replica of himself formed beside him. So, you have to channel your chakra throughout your body and let it mix with the mother sand around you. As you will use your chakra to take your shape, just like the basic clone, an earth clone will be formed. He concluded. Alright, let me try now. Ino said, forming the hand signs. Earth style. Earth clone jutsu. She exclaimed. And a clone was formed. Somewhat. Yeah, it was brown. It was shorter than her. And had no head. Alright, it was bad. I suppose we have a lot of practice to do. Naruto said. It took her an upward of three hours to master the technique, but she had done it. And now, they were on their way to her house for dinner. Yeah, she was really hungry. So, Naruto, what have you decided about the exams? Maiko asked, serving the dinner and sitting on the chair, next to Ino. I am going to participate. Naruto said, without thinking for a second. They are quite dangerous, you know. You should not make such decisions hastily. She said, I have to earn, and the D ranks are not enough to let me buy forever. Also, as things are, I have practically no savings, I spent the majority of my savings on buying a house. So, I don't really have a choice. Naruto explained. Naruto spoke quite a lot when he was with her mother, Ino noticed. I see. Maiko replied. But, money is not everything, you know. Maiko sighed. I know that, but money is the only motivation I have as of now. Naruto said. Money should not be your only motivation, Naruto. You need to have at least one emotional aspect attached to your life, or else you will suffer later in your life. She explained. Hey, I gotta pay my bills myself. And well, no family, you know. Naruto replied. He did not want to argue with her, but she was questioning her motivation. And he had to justify his motives. Not to her but to himself. She understood, she supposed. To someone like him, who did not have a family to come back to, earning money seemed like the only motive to do any missions. She could really not blame him for such an outlook on life. After all, he had become what the villagers had made him, and she did not have any room to speak when she did not reach out to the boy before. The food was great. Naruto said, noticing the silence. I will take my leave, then. He said, bowing towards Maiko. Then, he waved at Ino and disappeared in a flicker. Yeah, he hadn't gotten any head paths today. Maybe, today just was not his day. Walking into the academy, they could see a lot of different headbands around. Synonymously deciding to avoid any conflicts, Team 10 decided to reach their destination silently. Noticing them on the second floor, Shikamaru prompted the other two to silently head to the third floor. And on the third floor was. Asuma Sensei. Ah, so all of you came after all. Asuma said. Of course we did. Ino huffed, her hands going to her waist. Well, it's great that you did, because if one of you backed out, the whole team would not have been able to participate. Asuma said. W what? Ino exclaimed. B but, you said. She continued. I know what I said, Ino. And I said that because I did not want to force any of you to join out of obligation. Regardless, you are all here. Do your best and take care of each other. Asuma said. Yes, sensei. The three genin choruses. Well then, don't let me stop you. You may go ahead now. He said, moving aside, and consequently, showing them the door. Heading inside the room, they had already started to feel the killer intent oozing out of the participants. There were a lot of people there. There was no specific age group either, at first glance, they could see people as young as 11 and as old as 25 to 26. Seeing Sasuke, Ino squealed and ran towards him. Sighing, Naruto and Shikamaru followed her too. Apparently, Team 7 and Team 8 were participating too. As things were, Ino and Sakura were hanging on either of Sasuke's shoulders, Chaoji was offering chips to Shikamaru, who, in turn, was looking half asleep. Hiba and Shino were arguing about something, Hinata was trying to separate them, and Naruto was standing aside, pretending he did not know any of them. You all should keep it low. You are all rookies, aren't you? A seemingly friendly voice cut through their bickering. What's it to you? Kiba growled, seemingly offended. Nothing, of course, but you are all attracting a lot of attention. He said, waving his hands towards the crowd that was glaring at them. And as a fellow Kanoha shinobi, it's my duty to guide my juniors. He said. We are the same rank, so you cannot refer to us as your juniors, you know. Shikamaru said. Of course, I know that. But, I have a lot of experience under my belt, and maybe, I can help you a bit. He said. 
And, how exactly can you help us? Shikamaru questioned, these cards of mine. He said, summoning a deck of cards in his hands. Have some information on everyone here. If you want, I can share some with you. He said. Everyone, you say? Sasuke intervened. Almost everyone, I would say. There are always exceptions. He said. Also, my name is Kabuto Yakushi. He finally introduced himself. Fine, tell me about Rock Lee of Konoha, Gara of the Sand and Naruto of Konoha. Sasuke said. At this point, all the teams had gathered around each other. Um, let's see. Kabuto said, channeling Chakra in his cards. Rock Lee of. Said to be unable to use Chakra. Graduated as the dead last under special circumstances. But, under the guidance of Mido Gai, he has grown to become a formidable Tajutsu master. He said. Next is Gara, yes. He said, separating one more card from his deck. But, before he could channel Chakra through it, Sand covered the card and crushed it. Try to talk about me once more, and next time, it will be your body. A redhead growled looking at Kabuto. He had fair skin, green eyes, and short auburn hair. He was wearing a black bodysuit with an open neck, t-shirt-like sleeves, and almost full-length leggings. With this, he wore a white cloth over his right shoulder and the left side of his hips. He had a wide leather band from his left shoulder to his right hip, with which he carries his sand gourd and around which he wraps his forehead protector. Ah, you are Gara, I suppose. Fine, I won't, Kabuto said. Then, looking towards Naruto and realizing he already had a chain floating behind his head. I think even Naruto-kun would not be very happy if I shared any information about him. With that said, his cards disappeared in a poof of smoke. Before Sasuke could protest, another poof of smoke appeared, this time in front of the classroom, and an imposing man came out of the smoke. No one will fight here. He barked. Take your assigned seats within five seconds, or you will be disqualified. He said. As everyone took their seats, he said, I am Ibiki Marino, the proctor for this phase of the exams. Now, you will be given a question paper. You will have 45 minutes to answer 9 questions, and 15 minutes to answer the 10th question, which will be disclosed during those 15 minutes. He said. Do not raise your hands, I am not your teacher. He growled as he saw a hand coming up. I will explain the rules only once. So, listen carefully. Each one of you will start with 10 points, for each time you are caught copying, 2 points will be deducted. If all 10 of your points are deducted, you along with your team will be eliminated. He explained and motioned towards his assistants to distribute the papers. Ino did not know the meaning of the test. But, she did not need to. She just had to wait till Sakura dropped her pen, and then she would just take over her body to get the answers. Yeah, this was easy. Shikamaru wanted to sigh. He really wanted to, but he could not. If he did, there was a chance that the proctor would consider it as him trying to cheat. So, he fought with all of his willpower to deny himself the chance of sighing. The test was not hard, he knew the answers. Well, he hoped Ino and Naruto would know the answers too. Naruto knew that Shikamaru knew the answers and Ino's clan were just made for these situations. But, he did not have the answers. He could not call any birds too, as he was far from the window. So, he supposed some creativity was in order. Willing a chakra chain into existence, he sent it towards the aim ninja sitting next to him. Poking him from the other side, he made him look the other way. As soon as he did, Ibiki shouted, Number 77, you are eliminated, you and your team may leave. Realizing that he had been played, he graciously accepted defeat and started to move towards the door. But, as soon as he stood from his chair, Naruto wrapped his chain around his leg and made him fall. On the desk of the next guy. And thus, a commotion was formed. Noticing the other girl next to him was enjoying the chaos, he switched their papers with a gust of wind. As soon as he confirmed the paper was completely solved, he wrote his own name and roll number on the paper and proceeded to plant his head on the paper and sleep. There are some special rules for the tenth question, and before I explain them, I am warning you only once, you will not argue with me or ask any questions. If you do, you will be eliminated. Ibiki said. So. He continued, the tenth question is special. You can choose if you want to take it or not. If you choose not to take it, you may leave. But, if you decide to answer it and end up giving the wrong answer, you will never be promoted to the rank of. He finished. You have five minutes to decide what you want to do. Just like he had expected, slowly but surely, people started to leave the room. After five minutes, he asked, are you sure you want to continue the exams? Yes. A chorus came. Fine then. You all. Pass. Chapter 10. Just when Ibiki was done with explaining the true meaning of the test of the genin, a banner crashed through the window, and in a puff of smoke, out came a woman. She was an average-sized young woman who was of slender frame. She had light brown pupil-less eyes. Her hair was black with a violet tint and was styled in a short, spiky, fanned-out ponytail. She wore an outfit that was crafted of thin metal mesh to fit the lines of her body that covers her from neck to thigh. 
Over this, she wore a tan overcoat with a purple inseam and a pocket on each side, a dark orange miniskirt, a dark blue belt, and pale gray shin guards. In addition to the typical forehead protector, she also wore a small pendant that looked like a snake fang. Come on brats. Are you ready for the second round of your exams? Bah, you better be, because if you are not, you are dead meat. She exclaimed. I am Anko Midarashi, the proctor for the second round of the exams. Meet me at the training ground 44 within 15 minutes, or else, you will be disqualified. With that said, she promptly disappeared in a puff of smoke. A moment of silence took over everyone for a second, and then, everyone rushed like a monkey towards the training ground 44. The training ground 44 was intimidating, even from the outside. With trees as tall as the tallest building of Kanoha, it was a sight to behold. Naruto had sunshine towards the training ground with Ino and Shikamaru. Since they were not used to the instantaneous movement, they were currently gasping for breath on the ground. You guys really need to learn the sunshine. Naruto said, and he sounded almost. Chipper. Ino looked up at him to scold him, but. He was grinning. Ino had hardly seen him smile, let alone grin. So, settling her anger within herself, she questioned. You seem awfully cheerful today, what's up with you? To this, even Shikamaru raised his head to meet his eyes. And yes, he seemed happy. I had a power nap during the exams, I had been dying to have one ever since I heard of the concept. Naruto said, happiness dripping from his voice. Ino was going to shrug the topic off until she realized. B but. You told us. You know. That you could not. Sleep and all. She questioned, trying to give voice to her thoughts. Yeah, but Kaiubi has been rather generous since our last talk. Naruto explained. And yes, Naruto had once drifted off to sleep while meditating, and surprisingly, he had a good 17 hours of uninterrupted sleep. When he woke up and realized that no, he was not having a panic attack, he was almost 100% sure that he was dead. But, as generous as the Kaiubi had been in suppressing its chakra when he slept, he had never allowed Naruto in his mind when he was awake since then. Regardless, Naruto was very grateful, and he was going to sleep as much as he could till he, inevitably, changed his mind. Why you talk to it? Ino shrieked. But, before he could reply, a kunai was thrown towards him. Of course, his ever so loyal chain had caught it and sent it back towards the owner, and the kunai never touched him, but it was the sentiment that mattered. So, Proctor-san, is it not against the rules to intentionally injure a participant before a task? He questioned. Not really, no. As a proctor, I actually have free reign to do whatever I want. She replied. Whatever did I do to earn your wrath? He asked, still smiling. Ignoring me is enough to earn a kunai to your neck, you should be grateful you are alive. Now, stop talking to your little girlfriend and listen to me. She said, you speak as if your kunai actually touched me. Naruto replied, just as confident. Anko did not deem it worthy to reply to his jab and continued with her speech. This is the training ground 44, infamously known as the forest of death. You will be sent in from different gates with a scroll in hand. There will be a total of two types of scrolls distributed among all the teams. Your objective is to collect both the types of scrolls and reach the tower in the center of the forest. It will be a five-day long task. You are not allowed to open your scrolls. Apart from that, everything goes in there. She concluded. Now sign these forms so we cannot be blamed for your deaths and go to collect your scrolls. I think Naruto should keep it. His chains will protect the scroll, if nothing else. Shikamaru said. Team 10 had gotten the earth scroll. They were currently five minutes in, inside the forest. Shikamaru had suggested that they should go straight towards the tower, because everyone will think that everyone was doing that, and due to this, no smart team will actually use the strategy. Therefore, the teams that actually follow the strategy were more likely to be the overconfident ones who could be taken advantage of. Yeah, Naruto and Ino really did not understand how Shikamaru thought. But, they trusted him enough to follow his strategy blindly. Come on, Sasuke-kun. Show me that you are worth my time. Till now, you are but a disappointment. When Itachi was your age, he had made it into the Anbu, and here you are, a measly genin. Is this what the Ichiha name has been reduced to? How pathetic. A slippery voice echoed. Don't you dare speak ill of the Ichiha. Show yourself and I will show you how worthy I am. He replied, frustrated. Team 7 did not have a very good dynamic. None of them were willing to work in a team. Till now, they had not taken a single mission higher than a simple C rank delivery mission till the outskirts of Kanoha. So only the sage knew why Kakashi recommended his team for the Chunin exams. They had gotten the Earth Scroll. The three of them were arguing about who should get to keep a scroll when a gust of wind separated Choji from the team. Then, an Odo Genin had utterly dominated Sakura and Sasuke. And now, the same Genin was mocking him, and somehow he knew of Itachi too. Fire style. Fireball Jutsu. Sasuke exhaled a large ball of fire towards a tree. You missed again, I am afraid. The disgusting voice had come from behind him. But. 
Behind him was. Sakura, wasn't she? True to what he had feared, the Odo Genin was holding Sakura by her neck. You. Leave her alone. He shouted as he tried to blitz the Odo Nin. The Odo Ninja just backflipped while still holding the girl. Shall I snap her neck? Or maybe torture her a bit? He said. How about I slit her neck just enough to make her choke to death? Odo Nin questioned himself. Feeling the rush of chakra towards his eyes, he blitzed towards the ninja again. And, to his surprise, he punched him straight on the face. Making sure that Sakura was safe, he shouted fire style. Phoenix fire jutsu. As several small fireballs surrounded the Odo Nin and burned him. Realizing that he had actually won, he reached for a kunai. And yes, finally. He exclaimed. In the reflection of the kunai, red eyes were blazing. One with one tomo and the other with two. So, you do have the ability to possess them. Sasuke stiffened. The hairs on the back of his neck stood up. But, before he could turn or retreat, he felt teeth sinking into his shoulder. And then, pain. We don't want to waste our time, just tell us what scroll you have. We do not need to fight if we have the same scrolls. Shikamaru said. You speak as if you can beat us. One of the aim ninjas said. We are the strongest team here, and your scroll will be the one which will let us pass the exams. So, you better be grateful and hand the scroll over to us. Yeah yeah. Naruto murmured as two chains erupted from the ground below the aim ninja. The chains wrapped around his waist and legs and brought the captured ninja towards Team 10. Hand over the scroller he dies. Ino said, putting a kunai to his throat. As if you leaf weaklings could actually kill. The girl of the team scoffed. Before she could think of another taunt to buy some time, blood erupted from the captured ninja's neck and his body went limp. W what? Why you killed him? You killed him. The girl shouted and rushed towards Naruto blindly, only to impale herself on the now sharp chain and falling down lifelessly. Will you give us your scroll now? Shikamaru sighed out. Why yes, please take the scroll and let me go. He said, on the verge of tears. He passed them the scroll, and luckily for Team 10, it was the scroll they needed. Hello, Naruto-kun. A voice echoed in the forest around them. Hmm? Naruto questioned, looking towards where he could sense the person. Whoever told you my name, mister? He added another question. The sensor then. The voice hissed as the owner came out of the shadows of the tree. You are quite strong from what I know. He said. The three genin had straightened up and prepared for a fight. Tell me, Naruto-kun, what is the point of trying to protect the village who spat on your existence? They laughed at your misery, did they not? Are you, perhaps, naive enough to believe that they will come to recognize you as a human as time passes? The village protects me as much as I protect the village. Becoming a missing ninja with the powers of a is a fool's errand. What is your point? He said. I am Orochimaru of the Legendary Three, join me. I will make you strong, I will keep you safe, and I only ask for your loyalty in exchange. He said. The one who ran with his tail between his legs. I will pass. Naruto said. Quite a mouth you have. You will soon come to realize the futility of your denial. You think you will be trained properly here. The last two of the Kaiubi were not allowed to leave the village. The same will happen to you when you outgrew your usefulness. Your sensei is Asuma, is he not? Arachimaru finally asked. Do you think he was selected for this job like the others were? He is the son of the, he was there to judge your loyalties and identify your weaknesses to strike you down if your loyalties were to come into question. He jabbed. I know that, of course. But, I am free as things stand. So, no thank you. He said. You're free, you say. Quite an optimistic approach you have. Try saying you are free to yourself in the mirror. Regardless, when you seek power, I will welcome you with open arms. He said and dissolved into mud. What was that about, Naruto? Ino questioned. I am just as clueless as you are. Naruto replied. You were talking to him without any hesitation, do you, perhaps, know him? Shikamaru questioned. Don't question my loyalties, Shikamaru. He struck a nerve, that's all. Let's move towards the tower now. Naruto said. Heading towards the tower, Team 10 had stumbled upon him. An interesting sight. Choji and Sakura were trying to fight three Odo Genin, while Sasuke was seemingly unconscious in a cave behind them. And from the looks of it, they were not really doing a good job. One of the Genin had his leg on Choji's face and was aiming his arm towards Choji's stomach, while the female Genin of the team was holding Sakura by her hair. Both Choji and Sakura were bleeding a lot and from the looks of it, needed instant first aid. So, you want to help them? They are your friends after all. Naruto asked. Yeah. Shikamaru said. Chapter 11, yeah. Shikamaru said as he released a thread of shadow to stop the bandaged guy from stomping Chouji. At the same time, mind transfer jutsu. Ino is said to take over the body of the female genin of their team. But, both the Odo Nin recognized the danger they were in and flipped back to dodge the attacks. As soon as there was a distance made between the Odo Nin and Choji and Sakura, Ino and Shikamaru ran towards them to provide first aid. 
Seeing that the two new ninja were just focusing on healing the down genin, she said. Why oh you think you can ignore us? As she threw kunai towards them, behind which a bell was attached. Before the kunai could land on her target, a purple chain deflected the kunai. Landing from the tree above, Naruto became the wall between the Odo Nin and Team 7. I will take care of them. Naruto said, prompting Shikamaru and Ino to take care of their injured friends. The two obliged and attended to their friends. You think you can take the three of us alone? Quite cocky, aren't we? The half-mummy mocked. Ignoring the taunts, Naruto started to set the pace of the fight as he expelled a wind blast from his mouth. The three jumped in different directions and tried to encircle him. Earth style. Mud bullet. Naruto exclaimed, shooting bullets towards the non-bandaged guy. And, surprisingly enough, he only raised his hands towards the bullets and an air force cut the bullet down. The girl on the team was trying to use him. So, Naruto supposed she was a support type ninja. Identifying the weak point of the team, Naruto rushed towards the girl and engaged her in a tojutsu battle. True to what he had thought, the other two were vigorously trying to disengage their tojutsu match. Take this. The non-bandaged guy exclaimed as he shot a burst towards Naruto's back. Just as he said that, a couple of chains erupted from Naruto's back, took a solid hold of the girl he was battling, and flipped her in between the air shot and himself. Unable to move, she could do nothing but get the wind knocked out of herself and pass out. Just as he disengaged from the tojutsu match and flipped back to get some distance between himself and the other two, he fell down on his knees as a screeching sound invaded his eardrums. Looking backwards, he realized that it was the mummified ninja who was pointing his hands towards him. So, the mummy guy uses sound waves, and the other one uses air or wind, Naruto analyzed. Thinking that Naruto was vulnerable, the non-bandaged guy ran towards Naruto with a kunai, intending to stab him. Only to be picked up and tossed aside by a pair of purple chains. Apparently realizing that their master was in danger, the chains quickly softened at the top and snuggled into Naruto's ears, effectively blocking out all the sound. Now that his opponent's sound was useless, he charged up a pseudo-powered punch and knocked the mummified ninja out. The throne genin, now realizing that he is the only one who is not knocked out, quickly scrambled to his knees and bowed down in front of Naruto. Be please, don't kill me. Take the scroll and you will not see us again. He said. Ein, hand over your scroll and get lost, if you or your team try anything funny, it will be your head. Naruto said. So, how did it go? Ino questioned. They are taken care of. Naruto replied. Ed? Shikamaru questioned. Nope, they exchanged their scroll for their lives. He said, showing them the earth scroll. We don't really need the scroll though. Ino said. Maybe Team 7 does. Shikamaru said. Naruto had not collected the scroll for Team 7, but he did not really mind giving it to them. Talking about Team 7, they were all passed out in a nearby cave. So, Ino and Shikamaru had decided to stay over for the night to look over them. If they woke up tomorrow, they would leave or maybe team up. If they do not, they will just carry them to the tower. You can go to sleep, I will take the guard. Naruto said. Nah, you should sleep. You have just started sleeping after all. Shikamaru said, but the tiredness was visible in his eyes. Well, not only his, even Ino's for that matter. You look sleepy, and you are not used to staying up at night anyways. Naruto said, going out of the cave to set up a fire. Don't worry, I got this. He said before leaving the cave. But the native birds as his scouts and his unnatural energy, taking guard at night was an easy errand. It was the next morning, and Sakura had woken up. She was currently fussing over how a crazy ninja had bitten Sasuke and how she could do nothing against a freaky ninja. Eventually, when Sasuke woke up. He had a dark purple aura leaking out of him and black flame-like patterns covering half of his face. He had started to attack Shikamaru, who was sitting next to him. Realizing that there was chakra leaking out of him, Naruto wrapped him in his chakra chains to punch him into unconsciousness. But, to his surprise, his chains had started to absorb that chakra. As soon as the chains had realized that the chakra that was being absorbed was dangerous for their master, one more chain had shot out of his back and dug itself into the ground to form a mechanism to drain that chakra without letting it enter Naruto's chakra system. So, one of the chains was absorbing chakra from Sasuke while the other was draining it into the ground. Sasuke had fallen unconscious after being drained out of the chakra. Since Team 7 had a heaven scroll and Naruto had an earth to spare, they decided to head to the tower together. Sasuke was still wrapped in Naruto's chains, just in case. Sasuke Ichiha vs Yoroi Akadu. Walking into the stadium, Sasuke was confident. He had awakened the Sharingan, and in the two days he had gotten to rest, Kakashi had finally been useful for once and properly sealed that curse seal to the point that it would activate, only if he really wanted it to activate. Fight. The proctor said. As soon as he heard the proctor, his eyes blazed red. Noticing the chakra suction near his opponent's hand, he maintained his distance, inhaled a deep breath and said, fire style. Phoenix fire jutsu. As several balls of flame smashed on the ground to create a lot of smoke. 
But, since his opponent's chakra suction technique was still activated, he could see where he was. Deciding to blitz his opponent and gain an early victory, Sasuke charged in, using the move he had copied from Lee before the start of the exams, and finished the match off. Winner. Sasuke Cha. The proctor said. Zaku of Yumi vs Kiba in Yuzuka. Why don't you give up before humiliating yourself? Zaku taunted. Ah. As if. I am totally gonna beat your ass. Kiba exclaimed. Begin. The proctor said. Hang over fang. Kiba exclaimed and turned into a tornado, trying to blitz his opponent. Zaku raised his hands and released a blast of wind to turn Kiba off his target. Realizing that he had struck gold and his attack had landed straight on Kiba's head, he released one more strong wind blow to finish the match. As soon as he released his attack, a whirling tornado captured him from behind. So, the wind attack knocked Kiba out, and Kiba's dog, Akamaru, knocked Zaku out. Seeing as both the participants are unconscious, this match is a double knockout and has no winner. The proctor said. This Yumi Tsurugi vs Kankuro of the Sand. It was an easy win for Kankuro. Miss Yumi had some sort of flexibility powers, she had wrapped herself around Kankuro and threatened to kill him. But, it was a puppet and she ended up being poisoned. Ino Yamanaka vs Sakura Hirono. Ino had taken this easily enough. For some reason, at the beginning of the match, Sakura had deemed it fit to say that. The winner of this match shall become Sasuke Kun's love interest. I will show you. Ya, she could not complete her sentence. Why? Because Ino had taken over her body mid rant and made Sakura give up. It seemed like Sakura had not learned anything after the academy. Winner. Yamanaka Ino. Uzumaki Naruto vs Aburam Shino. Shino, apparently, was a bug user. He had tried to use his bugs to drain Naruto out of chakra by absorbing his chakra through his bugs. Well, it did work to an extent, but after some time, the bugs turned into stone and fell off his body. Naruto supposed he would have to learn more about his chakra. Realizing that most of his bugs were either out of commission or turned into stones, Shino had given up. Winner. Yuzumaki Naruto. Tenten vs Tamari was again a brutal defeat for Tenten. She had ended up on the flat of Tamari's fan. Her spine was probably severely damaged. Shikamaru vs Kintsuchi was a battle of wits in which Shikamaru had proclaimed the victory over the Odo Ninja. Hayuga Hinata vs Hayuga Niji seemed like a personal fight rather than a professional one. As brave as Hinata had been for standing up again and again, she had to be rescued by four or she would have been dead. Ara vs Rock Lee was again a very brutal fight. Lee had opened five of the eight celestial gates to compensate for his lack of ninjutsu and. Regardless, half of his body had fallen prey to Gara's sand. Dosu vs Akamichi Chaoji was also a rather one-sided fight in Dosu's favor. Alright, so the candidates for the finals are. Ichiha Sasuke, Kankuro of the Sand, Yamanaka Ino, Yuzumaki Naruto, Tamari of the Sand, Nara Shikamaru, Hayuga Niji, Gara of the Sand and Dosu of the Hidden Sound. The proctor said. All of you will draw a number now, which will decide your opponent for the finals. The finals will take place a month later. He concluded. Alright. The Hokage said. According to the numbers drawn by the participants the matches, in sequence, are as follows. Ichiha Sasuke vs Hayuga Niji. Nara Shikamaru vs Tamari of the Sand. Kankuro of the Sand vs Yamanaka Ino. Yuzumaki Naruto vs Gara of the Sand. According to the numbers drawn, Dosu of the Hidden Sound will get a pass in the first round of the finals. He said. Now, you all can leave. Make sure to prepare well for the exams. They said and dispersed them. Chapter 12. Well, this is truly a dilemma. Asuma said. I really did not think that the three of you would make it to the finals. Yeah, thanks for the vote of confidence. Ino huffed. Don't get me wrong, you are certainly very strong. Perhaps, the strongest team of your generation. But making it to the finals of the exams in your first attempt is quite an achievement. He replied. Team 10 was currently gathered at their allotted training ground, discussing their training schedule. Training the three of you together will be unfair to all of you, since you may end up fighting each other later in the exams. Asuma exclaimed. I will be off, training with my summons. So, you don't need to worry about me. Naruto said. Dad will be training me for the month in our clan techniques, so you don't need to worry about me too. Ino said. I see. Well, what about you, Shikamaru? Asuma questioned. Dad won't be training me, that's for sure. He is too busy with his duties as the commander. Shikamaru sighed out. Well, that's that I suppose. I will be overseeing your training for the month. He said. You two can, of course, come to me if you need anything at any time. Yes. Ino and Naruto chorused. Stone, you say? Fukuru asked. Yeah, they drained my chakra and turned it into stone. What's up with that? Naruto questioned. As I told you before, the owls have never produced a sage. But, I believe that if someone is unable to balance chakra within their body, they turn into stone. Fukuru said. 
Well, speculations aside, I finally have a whole month to train and I want to master the sage mode. Naruto said. That's quite a goal you have. I have already taught you all I could, now it is you to master the powers within you. Fukuru said. Yeah yeah. Naruto murmured. Walking towards the waterfall where he meditated, Naruto mused about what he knew about his opponent for the finals. Gara of the Sand was a, just like him. He could not be a hundred percent sure, but his chakra just screamed Jinchuriki. Apart from that, he had complete control over sand and was a bit unnerving. Sitting under the waterfall, Naruto began to meditate in hopes of learning to understand his chakra better. Ah, hello there. It's been quite a while since you let me in here. Naruto said. Keep your greetings to yourself. I am only allowing you to sleep so that you may train more efficiently. Do not disappoint me. Kaiubi growled. Not that I am ungrateful, but what changed your mind? Naruto questioned. Your heartfelt confession did, of course. I was pretty sure that if you were in here for a minute more, back then, you would have surely started to cry, like the pathetic excuse for a shinobi you are. Kaiubi was mocked. Ah, I am being respectful, am I not? Did your parents not teach you how to behave, or perhaps, you never had them? Naruto jabbed. You are one to crack parents' jokes, haha. I, at least, have met mine. Unlike you, born an orphan. Kaiubi retorted. Ouch. Naruto winced. So, why allow me in here now? Naruto questioned, abandoning his playful front. Boredom is a whip that commands beings like me too. Kaiubi said. I have training to do, you know. I can't go around entertaining you the whole day. Naruto said. Your body has grown quite well. Kaiubi said, disregarding Naruto's previous statement. Sorry, but I am not into it. Well, foxes. Naruto said with a straight face. Your chakra system, I mean. It is developed enough to handle a full transformation. Perhaps you can let me free in an empty area for a while, and I will tell you about chakra. You need that information, do you not? Kaiubi questioned. Sorry, no can do. I do not trust you enough to let you free, as you say. Naruto said. Your chakra is always brawling with mine. To use it to its full potential, you will have to calm your chakra down. And, you will not be able to do that if I do not allow my chakra to retreat. Kaiubi said. Throw in the information of my parents, and we have a deal. Naruto said. The deal it is, then. Yes, a completely isolated space where no one goes. Naruto said. There is, indeed, such a place here. But, why do you ask about such a place, young Naruto? Fukuru questioned. Oh, this and that, you know. Naruto said. Hein, I will not force you. But, don't do anything stupid. Fukuru said. A few kilometers down south, there is a large clearing where, due to an abrupt efficiency of natural chakra, no owl goes. You can go there to do whatever you want to try. Fukuru said. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Naruto said and ran towards the instructive direction. So, how does this go? Naruto questioned. That chain of yours, it absorbs chakra. Use it to drain the seal of its chakra. Kaiubi instructed, pointing towards the seal. Doing what he was told to do, Naruto felt a flood of chakra filling his chakra system, and to compensate for the sudden rush of chakra, nature chakra also entered his body to balance itself. Now, let me take over. They said, fine. Naruto huffed. And suddenly, a layer of red chakra formed over Naruto and a cloak grew around his body. Nine Magatama marks adorned his back, and his eyes had gone red with a slit for pupils. Then, large amounts of chakra gathered around his body, and a holographic imitation of the Kaiubi surrounded his body. Um. I did not know this would happen in the Jinchuriki combination state. A deep voice thought aloud. They had thought that in the state, he would revert back into his furry form, just like he had seen other transformations through the eyes of his previous. But, this was not half bad. And he had a full day to enjoy. Whoa. What was that power? Naruto questioned, now back in control of his body. That was the full extent of my powers. A voice growled. W what? Who is that? Naruto questioned, not seeing anyone around him. Meditate and come to your mind. The same voice said. Yeah, he could not joke around here anymore. Why? Because the cage that separated him from the Kaiubi was missing. Where did it go? Naruto questioned. You unlocked it, genius. Now, shut up and let me finish my part of the deal. Kaiubi said. Hein, tell me. How should I master my sage mode? Naruto questioned, excited to finally get his head off the puzzle. Balance. Kaiubi said. You didn't just scam me, did you? Naruto questioned, irritated. You interrupt me once more, and my nail will be through your stomach. Kaiubi growled. What you have been doing is balancing, maintaining and enhancing the chakra that already exists in your body. As opposed to that, what you are supposed to do is balance, maintain and enhance the chakra that you absorb from nature. So, first flood your chakra coils with nature chakra, and then balance the nature chakra according to your own chakra, not the other way around. I see. 
Naruto said and looked up at Kairubi expectantly. What now? Kairubi growled, now irritated by his presence. You were going to tell me about my parents. Naruto said, children like curiosity showing up for the first time. I suppose I did say that. Kairubi sighed. I do not know much about them. Your mother's seal was way too tight to let me be aware of the things going on outside. I do know their names, though. Your mother was Yuzumaki Kishina, my previous, and your father, Namikaze Minato. They said, Chapter 13, Kishina. Naruto questioned, trying the sound of the voice. It sounded good. And warm. He hoped his mother loved him more than she did the village, because his father, Namikaze Minato, clearly did not. So, what happened to her? Naruto questioned. And why should I answer that? Kaiubi questioned. Our deal was information of my parents and not names of my parents. Naruto said. Perhaps. I killed her with this nail. Kaiubi said, raising his paw and pointing the accused nail towards him. She likes to brag about how I was caged in the seal. But, ultimately, she was a puny little thing in front of my wrath. He continued, trying to rile up Naruto. I see. Naruto sighed out. So, no angry outbursts? Kaiubi asked, mockingly. Oh, believe me, I am angry. But, there is no point in crying over someone I have never met. Naruto said and vanished from his mind. Two days after the preliminaries. So, sensei. Where is he? I think it is about time I take over his training. A white-haired man asked. He was dressed rather uniquely. He had waist-length spiky white hair that he tied back into a ponytail, with two shoulder-length bangs framing his face. There were red lines under his eyes which extended further down his face, going all the way to the bottom. Gureya, it has been quite a while since you have shown your face around here. The third said, you know how it is, duty calls. You did not answer me, though. Now named Jureya said, young Naruto is doing quite well for himself. He recently passed the preliminaries of the exams. But, I am afraid you will not be able to meet him. Hiruzen said, and, why is that? Jureya asked, narrowing his eyes. Hmm. Of what I remember, he has gone to the plane of his summons to train for the month. He replied. Summons? He was supposed to be a toad summoner, just like his father. Why would you let him sign any other contract? Jiraiya questioned, raising his voice. Do not raise your voice in front of me, Jiraiya. Perhaps, if you wanted him to be a toad summoner, you should have been here to inform him of that. And, I did not offer him any contracts. He used the summoning without a contract and ended up becoming a summoner. Hiruzen said. You know I was busy outside the village. Jiraiya exclaimed. It has been 13 years, almost 14. Have you not thought of a better excuse? Hiruzen asked. Gureya did not see any worth in staying there any longer and disappeared in a puff of smoke. Even in the blazing heat from the sun, the crowd did not lack enthusiasm. Chunin exams were like festivals. Shinobi and civilians alike enjoyed watching the show that was presented. And, of course, today was no exception. The ground of exams was filled to the brim. Simply speaking, the vibes of excitement were overflowing. The Chiha Sasuke and Hayuga Niji, present yourselves in the stadium. The proctor said. Both the genin appeared in the stadium and a swirl of leaves. The red eyes indicate the Sharingan and the veins represent the. A battle to see whose eyes were superior. Both the genin were given very auspicious titles. The prodigy of the Hayuga and the last loyal Achiha meant a lot to the people of Konoha. The rules are the same as the preliminaries. Anything goes once the match starts. But, I have the power to intervene and stop the match as I see fit. Understand? The proctor asked. Yes. Both of them said, all right then. Here we go again. He murmured. Welcome, the citizens and visitors alike. We, the people of Konoha, are honored to host the exams. I hope our accommodations were up to your liking. With that said, I do not wish to delay the event of the day anymore. So, shall we start? The proctor questioned and the crowd roared. Begin. He exclaimed and jumped back. Contrary to what the crowd believed, the participants did not just rush into the fight. It seemed like some verbal assaults were in order. I thought you would not show yourself. After all, you have a habit of hiding from tragedies, don't you? Niji said. You speak a lot for a slave, how about you go and serve your masters? Sasuke replied. At least I have a clan to speak of. Niji retorted. You think you are a part of the Hayuga? The only Hayuga are the main branches. You, my friend, are just a slave to be used and discarded. With that said, Sasuke jumped back to create some distance. Because, as confident as he was, even he would not challenge a Hayuga in a Tejutsu match. Higher style. Phoenix Flower Jutsu. He exclaimed. Niji rolled out from the trajectory of the attack and rushed Sasuke to engage in a Tejutsu fight. Stuck in midair, Sasuke had no option but to bend to the Tejutsu fight. As good as the form which he had copied was, he was not a master at it. So, without any doubt, Sasuke got two of the points on his hand shut in the brief Tejutsu battle they had. Why is that sharp mouth of yours not running anymore? 
Niji asked. Higher style. Fireball Jutsu. Sasuke exclaimed. The fireball was not that big. But it did not need to be, as it was only a distraction for the shuriken behind it. Niji dodged both of them. And, through his eyes, he saw the strings attached to the shuriken and was able to dodge the recalled shuriken too. These cheap tricks of yours will not work on me. These eyes of mine see beyond what you can imagine. Niji mocked. You throw big words around but you haven't actually hurt me yet. Sasuke replied with a smirk. Not yet, I have not. But you are already within my field of divination. Niji said as he bent down and a yin-yang symbol formed around him. Eight trigrams. Two palms. Four palms. Eight palms. Sixteen palms. Thirty-two palms. Sixty-four palms. Niji exclaimed as he hailed a barrage of pokes on Sasuke. With as close as Sasuke was to Niji, he could not do anything but get hit by the annoying pokes. As his attack ended, Sasuke fell on the ground. Call the match, Proctor. He is not standing up again. Niji said, arrogantly. But, before he could say anything else, a dark purple chakra erupted from Sasuke's body, and black markings started to cover his body. With three hands signs, lightning exploded from his hands. But, before he could move, a chop to the neck knocked him out. Ah, my apologies. It seems my student lost control. Please continue the event, I will tend to him. A white-haired jonin said. Due to external intervention, the winner is Hayuganiji. The proctor said. After five minutes, we will start with our next match. Nara Shikamaru and Tamari of the Sand, be prepared for your match. Contrary to the flashy entrance that Tamari had presented by gliding down to the ground on her fan, Shikamaru was perfectly content in taking the stairs. You know of the rules, yes? The proctor asked. Yeah. Tamari said and Shikamaru nodded his head. Well then, without any further ado, let's start. The proctor said and started the match. You will not fall asleep, will you? Tamari questioned, looking at his sleepy face. Troublesome woman, why don't you start with the fight already? Shikamaru said and retreated to the safety of trees. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Shikamaru said and exhaled a ball of fire. It was not very big, but it did the work it was supposed to do. Yeah, I can't use any fire style. Shikamaru murmured to himself. Why? You ask. Because true to what he had suspected, Tamari was primarily a wind user, and wind was stronger against fire. Tamari had opened her fan enough to show one of the moons on it. Wind style. Wind wave. She exclaimed and waved her fan in Shikamaru's direction. Earth style. Hiding like a mole jutsu. Shikamaru said and went into the ground. Feeling a pair of hands below her, Tamari quickly opened her fan fully and flew off to avoid being plunged into the ground. Troublesome. Shikamaru murmured. From up in the air, Tamari waved her fully open fan toward Shikamaru, creating a deadly gust of wind and launched it toward Shikamaru. Earth style. Mud wall. Shikamaru said, creating a wall of earth between the attack and himself. For a while, the same thing was happening. Tamari would release a gust of wind and Shikamaru would either go underground or create a wall of earth to defend himself. But, once Tamari looked tired, Shikamaru created a wall of earth behind her to create a large shadow over her. Missing accuracy, are we? Tamari said, mocking his supposedly misplaced. Hardly. He scoffed. Shadow possession jutsu. He said. Since Tamari was engulfed in a large shadow, she had nowhere to go and ended up stuck in his. Once she was under his control, he started moving backwards and, of course, Tamari followed. But, the thing was, while there was nothing behind Shikamaru, there was a wall of earth behind Tamari. Bib up or I'll bash your head in the wall. Shikamaru threatened. Fine. I give up. Tamari said. Winner. Nara Shikamaru. Chapter 14. Ankuro of the Sand vs. Yamanaka Ino. Begin. The proctor said. Water style. Water wave. Ino exclaimed, not wasting any time. Ankuro flipped back to avoid getting hit and willed his puppet to shoot a barrage of towards the Kinoichi. Earth style. Earth wall. Ino raised a wall to prevent getting hit from the. Just as the wall rose, a puppet smashed into it. The puppet did not smash the wall. But, it managed to create a hole in the wall. Kankuro willed his puppet to throw a smoke bomb through the hole towards Ino. Quickly realizing that the smoke was poisonous, Ino held her breath and flipped backwards, away from the smoke. Taking advantage of the situation, Kankuro released a dozen kunai towards Ino. Water style. Water wave. Ino released a wave of water to deflect the kunai and released a few kunai of her own encounter. Kankuro got his puppet between the approaching kunai and himself to save himself, only to realize that they had an exploding tag attached to them. Boom. As the smoke cleared, Kankuro seemed fine, but the puppet was smashed into pieces. Quickly realizing that his puppet had been smashed, he tried to reach for another scroll to release another puppet, but before he could, a kunai appeared on his neck. Surrender or you will never move again. Ino, who had sunshine behind him, said. I give up. He said, accepting the defeat. Winner. 
Yamanaka Ino. The proctor said. The quality of your genin is still as good as ever Hokage Dono. The Kazakiage said. Yours aren't bad either, Kazakiage Dono. They fought valiantly. The Hokage replied. Perhaps they did. But, ultimately, they lost. Regardless, the strongest that Tsuna has to offer is yet to fight. The Kazakiage said. Your youngest, is he not? The Hokage questioned. Indeed. Kazakiage answered. Bar of the Sand versus Yuzumaki Naruto. The proctor said, prompting the aforementioned genin to enter into the stadium. Both the genin appeared in a swirl of sand and leaves, respectively. You both know of the rules. The proctor questioned. Yes. The two said. Well then. Begin. He said and flickered out of the stadium. You know of me, do you not? The redhead questioned. I do, indeed. Since you are from Suna, I will take a wild guess and say it is Shukaku that resides in your seal. Naruto said. Indeed. But, I am not aware of Konoha having any tailed beasts, which one is yours? Gar questioned. It's the nine-tailed fox, Kaiubi. Naruto said. Gara seemed like a really chill guy, perhaps the both of them could be fried dot. Very well then, I suppose I will kill you now to enjoy your blood. Gara said. Yeah, no. No friendship for sure. But that said, Gara released a bullet of sand towards Naruto. Naruto did not need to move, two chains formed from his chest and began rotating to split the sand bullet before it could touch him. Gara did not know what to do. Usually, when he fought anyone, they tried to attack him so that his sand could rip them. But, Naruto was just standing there. With his hands folded. Just like him. Was he mocking him? Yes he is mocking you s, let's kill him. A voice inside his mind said, why yes mother. Gara murmured. Willing his sand to take the form of hundreds of shuriken, Gara initiated the attack. Standing there and letting his chains deflect the shuriken, Naruto started to form hand signs to test the extent of Gara's defense. Wind style. Gale palm. He exclaimed, using his go-to to test his opponent's defense. Just as the concentrated wind reached Gara, a blob of sand rose up and defended its master. So, the defense was sturdy and fast. Well, it really did not matter. Finally moving to dodge another barrage of sand shuriken, Naruto rushed towards Gara. Seeing this, Gara willed a sand clone into existence to prevent Naruto from reaching him. Unlike how Gara had foreseen things to go, the clone got speed blitzed by Naruto, and Gara got punched straight into his face. Just when Naruto thought that he had drawn first blood, he saw sand falling off of his opponent's face. Some sort of armor. He murmured to himself. He don't, worry mother. W we will get his blood. Gara said, now sounding psychotic. He caged himself in a cocoon of sand and left an eye made of sand to scout things for him. Taking cautious steps, Naruto headed towards the sand cocoon and tried to punch it. But, before he could, spikes started to grow from the sand. Realizing that this was an opportunity to be creative, Naruto willed three chakra chains to wrap around his arm and extend beyond his fingers. The sharp tips of the chains met at one point to create a drill-like formation and started rotating. Testing his balance with his newly invented attack, he ran towards the sand cocoon. Dodging several sand spikes, he finally reached the cocoon and repped it with his drill. Now exposed, Gara had transformed into some sort of half raccoon. Half of his face and one of his hands was made of sand, and he had grown a sand-made tail. Now, hardly in control of his movement, Gara rushed at Naruto, relying solely on his instincts. Flipping backwards, Naruto analyzed his situation. If the match had to be stopped, it would have been stopped by now. So, apparently, what Gara was doing was legal. He supposed he will, too, have to take it up a notch. Actively absorbing the nature chakra, Naruto tapped into his partial sage transformation. His eyelines grew bolder, his eyes shined brighter, and his chains turned into a darker shade of purple. Launching himself towards Gara, he wrapped his chain around Gara's transformed hand and started absorbing chakra through it. True to what he had thought, the sand on Gara's hand fell down, and in the movement of confusion, Naruto punched Gara straight on his face. Very hard. Or. The Hokage said as an Anbu appeared in front of him. Begin with Protocol 5. He commanded, and the Anbu formed hand signs to inform others. The Anbus all around the stadium started dispelling what was just beginning to take its toll. So, Orochimaru, would you surrender or do you want to settle this with a fight? The Hokage questioned. You knew all along, didn't you, Sensei? The Kazakiage questioned. I have a spy for a student, what else did you expect? The Hokage retorted. Very clever. But, it is very bold of you to assume that you can beat me alone. The Kazakiage said. Whoever told you that I will be fighting you alone? Just as the Hokage said that, Jiraiya grew out from the floor below. Naruto had knocked out Gara. that had to be the end of it, right? No. Apparently, knocking him out results in the sand spirit taking over, and well, here he was. He was sure he could take the Shukaku out with minimal damage, but for that, he had to tap into the mastered sage mode, but to tap into it, he needed to stay still for a while. 
Well, he supposed he only had one option left. Sage Arts. Summoning Jutsu. He shouted, pouring a shit ton of chakra in it. A large poof of smoke happened and an equally large owl came out from it. The owl tilted its head curiously. I am sorry, there is no time for pleasantries. Please lead Shukaku towards an isolated area while I prepare to tap into the sage mode. Naruto said. As you command, master. It shall be done. The owl said. With that said, it flew towards the sand beast and began to poke it around. Sitting down and meditating, a bright purple glow began to surround him. His eye shadows began to constrict themselves. Once the transformation was completed, there was a bright purple aura surrounding Naruto, and his eye shadows had reverted back to their normal state. I cannot hold this for a long time. Naruto told himself and rushed towards the sand monster. You may leave, I will take it from here. Naruto was told to summon. Please summon me again if you need me, master. The owl replied and dispelled itself. Sage art. Vacuum bullet. Naruto set and released a wind bullet towards Shukaku and gained its attention. Forming the drill he had just invented, he launched towards the tailed beast and hit it square in the chest. For a moment it seemed that its chest had been blown away, but it regenerated just as fast. And this is what kept happening for a while. Naruto was trying to find anything that he could exploit, but the damned beast just kept regenerating and throwing around gigantic wind bullets. Roaming his eyes around to spot a weakness, he spotted a red head at the top of Shukaku. Ah, if there is no, there will be no tailed beast. Naruto decided. Now aware of the weak spot, Naruto summoned his chakra chains and willed them to wrap around the hand of Shukaku for extra balance and started running towards the top. Apparently realizing Naruto's intentions, Shukaku started to thrash around, trying to get Naruto off of him. But, since Naruto had his chains wrapped around his arm, he didn't budge. Reaching at the top, Naruto pulled his kunai out. Nuo. Shukaku growled as Naruto separated Gara's head from his body. A large massive chakra exploded towards the sky. And there was no sign of the one-tailed beast anymore. W what is he? Sasuke questioned. Sasuke, Sakura, Ino and Shikamaru had just defeated Tamari and Kankuro and had come to provide backup to Naruto, but it seemed like he didn't need any. That's Naruto for you. Ino said. Now that he was off his adrenaline boost, Naruto sensed a unique thing. Another Senjutsu user. Chapter 15. As opposed to just this morning, the mood of the village had grown sour. Kanoha did not face many losses, but there were a few casualties. Regardless, the seed of hatred was sown deep into the people of Kanoha. Naruto was currently in the Hokage office with the head of Gara. The Hokage looked beaten up, his black body armor was hanging on a shelf, bathed in red. But, Naruto's focus was not on him. His focus was on the white-haired man who had two toads popping out of either of his shoulders. As the toads dispelled, the thickened red lines on his face started to recede, just like his purple markings were receding. You're a sage. Naruto questioned. Why of course I am. I am the one and only great toad sage of Mount Mayaboku. Jiraiya said, forming an obnoxious pose. What a retard. Naruto murmured to himself. So, Naruto, is that the head of the, the third question? Yes Hokage-sama. Naruto replied. I heard that he had transformed into Shukaku, how did you manage to defeat him? He asked again. I had to tap into my sage mode to even stand a chance. Naruto replied, not seeing any benefit in lying. Sage mode? Jiraiya and Hiruzen questioned. Yes. Naruto replied. And for a second, silence reigned. The Hokage and Hiruzen thought that Naruto would further explain, and Naruto thought that he had said enough. And just where did you learn of the sage mode? Jiraiya questioned, breaking the silence. Why should I tell you anything? Naruto countered. I am the most trusted confidant of the Hokage. Jiraiya replied. Naruto looked towards the Hokage, and when he nodded, Naruto started. Apparently, my chakra system is pre-exposed to sage chakra. These eye markings are actually a representation of my unconscious age mode. Naruto said, pointing towards his eyes. Is that so? Perhaps, I can teach you how to master your sage mode. Jiraiya said. You haven't mastered the sage mode yourself, what will you teach me? Actually, I am better safe than you. Naruto said, brushing Jiraiya's offer off. As if. Jiraiya scoffed, trying to rile up Naruto so that he would show him his sage mode without Jiraiya having to ask. Naruto ignored him and turned to the Hokage. Why was I called here Hokage-sama? Keeping that aside, why did you not inform me of your prowess? Hiruzen asked. It was pretty clear that you did not appreciate meeting me. So, I never bothered showing up without any reason. Naruto said. Jiraiya's eyes narrowed at this. Whatever made you think that? Hiruzen questioned. I am a sensor, I can feel your feelings, if that makes sense. Naruto said. It indeed does, it is a known trait of the previous of the Kaiubi. Regardless, I hope you understand that my hatred is for the Kaiubi. Hiruzen said. I really don't care. You are just another one to me Hokage-sama. Naruto replied. I see. 
please leave that head here. Since he had a bounty, the money will be sent to you. Thank you for your service to the village. Hiruzen said, sighing. Of course, it was an honor. Naruto said and sunshined away. What was that about, sensei? Had you not promised Kashina that you will take care of him? Jiraiya said, scowling. Scowl at me all you want Jiraiya. But, I lost my wife to the Kaiubi attack, can you blame me for not getting over it? Hiruzen said. Oh, so you can let Orochimaru run away and give him another chance, but cannot give him a single chance. Jiraiya said, deceptively calm. Don't compare those situations, Jiraiya. Hiruzen said. Of course, there is no comparison. What a crime Naruto did by becoming the Jinchuriki to save the village and losing his parents. How can a crime of this caliber be compared to the measly human experiments that Orochimaru did? Right. What was that, Naruto? Ino exclaimed. What was what? Naruto questioned. That purple chakra thing you did. That was awesome. Can you teach it to me? Purple is awesome, you know. Ino said, over-enthusiastic. No Ino. It is not something that can be taught. Naruto said. Yeah, of course it can't be taught. Ino said, pouting. Why can't you stay quiet for a while? Shikamaru murmured. Team 10 was currently a training ground 10. Shikamaru was laying down, Naruto was eating an apple, and Ino was, as always, gossiping. Asuma had called them there two hours ago, but he wasn't here yet. They hoped he was not spending a lot of time with the sensei of Team 7. Before any bickering could start, Asuma appeared in a swirl of leaves. What's up? He said casually, pretending he was not two hours late. Team 10, synonymously deciding that their sensei could be forgiven for once, decided to push for why they were called there. So, why did you call us here? Ino questioned. Well, I just wanted to congratulate you on the performance you put forward during the exams. Though things didn't go as planned with the invasion and all, it is still possible that some or all of you may be promoted to. Asuma said. Well, we can still work as a team, right? Ino questioned. Of course we can. Asuma replied. Ding. This was the first time someone had ringed his bell. Sure, after the rumors about his fight with the Shukaku had gotten out, the harsh glances had reduced to almost negligible, but the fact remained that no one had ringed his bell till now. He supposed it was more to do with where he lived. His teammates' parents would not allow them to roam in the red light area, and a famous name like Asuma Suratobi would not be caught dead in such an area. Humming. Naruto shouted, moving towards the door. Yes. Naruto questioned. It was the same guy he had met in the Hokage office. So, did you think about my generous offer? Jiraiya questioned. Did I not tell you that you have nothing to teach me? Naruto replied. Maybe not, but I have plenty of things to pass down. If you don't know, I was the Firth Okage's teacher too. Jiraiya said with an obnoxious grin. Father Sensei? Naruto questioned. So you know about that, who told it to you? Jiraiya questioned, his grin falling. As I said, I don't need to tell you anything. Naruto replied. This is a S-rank secret we are talking about. Jiraiya said. Just like the S-rank secret of me being a Naruto countered. Listen, Naruto, I thought you were well taken care of. Jiraiya said. And why exactly do you care? Naruto asked. As I said, I was your fath dot. I really do not care what you were to him. Naruto cut Jiraiya off. Well, regardless. You and I have an A rank mission to take. Jiraiya said, changing the topic. What exactly is the mission? Naruto questioned. We have to retrieve the next Okage. Jiraiya said, grinning, returning full force. Denon can't take A rank missions. Naruto countered. Whoever said you are a genin? Jiraiya said, summoning a vest and handing it to Naruto. Naruto just raised his eyebrows. The ceremony is yet to be conducted, but due to our special circumstances, you are given some leeway. Jiraiya said. I see. Naruto said, taking the vest and shutting the door in his face. Yeah, the vest looked ugly over his kimono. Perhaps, it was time for a wardrobe change. Maybe something subtle. Eh? He was not asked to leave the clothes shop. That was new. Oh, the owner was not scowling at him too, that was definitely new. So, what are you looking for? The shopkeeper asked. Yeah, he was definitely dreaming. Hello? Are you there? The shopkeeper asked. Oh, yeah, sorry. I was looking for the standard shinobi outfit. Naruto said. Chapter 16. Now dressed in a blue standard Kanoha uniform and his flak jacket over it, Naruto looked more shinobi-like than ever. He was currently waiting for Jiraiya at the gates of Kanoha. The standard shinobi uniform was oddly comfortable, the material was not hard, but it was sturdy. Unlike his kimono which provided no protection whatsoever, the flak jacket could actually repel a kunai. Ah, here on time. I see. A voice came from behind him. Unlike you, yes. Naruto replied. Hey, lighten up a bit. This will be a long mission, we do not need to hurry. Jiraiya said. Would you tell me, who exactly are we trying to find? Naruto questioned. The next Hoka dot. I know that, I am asking for their name. 
Naruto said, cutting off Jiraiya. Stop cutting me off, brat. Jiraiya exclaimed. Will you answer me? Naruto sighed out. It was going to be a tough mission with this childish old man. Tsunade send you, of course. Jiraiya said. Huh? Is Kanoha short on Hokage candidates? Naruto questioned. Why do you say that? Jiraiya countered. She has not been into the village for almost 20 years now. She is as good as a rogue. He said. Well, it is not like your thoughts, or mine in fact, has any weight. We are doing what we are asked to do. Jiraiya said. Ordered to. Naruto corrected me. Yeah yeah, ordered to. Regardless, she will be perfect. Jiraiya said. And why do you say so? Naruto questioned. She is the granddaughter of the first and grandniece of the second. Jiraiya explained. So? I was not aware that the position of the was hereditary. Naruto said. Yeah, brats your age usually shut up after hearing of her heritage, I have not prepared the speech any further. Jiraiya half sighed. So, do you want to learn a technique? Jiraiya asked. What type of technique? Naruto questioned. Jiraiya just raised his hand as a blue sphere of chakra formed in his hands. This is the, it drills into whatever it touches. Jiraiya said. Hmm, I actually have a similar technique, I created it during my fight with Gara. Naruto said, forming his chain drill. Well, just from the first glance, it is already a superior technique. Jiraiya said. How so? Naruto questioned. It is instantaneous, easy to hold on to, and can be released in a second. He said, the vanishing. Fine then, teach me. Naruto said. Now we are talking. Jiraiya said, summoning an air balloon and handing it to Naruto. You have to burst this balloon with your chakra alone. He said. Don't worry if you cannot do it right away, it took me an upwards of three months to master the first step too. Jiraiya said. Hop. Um, it was all about power. Then I suppose the next step will be about direction. Naruto questioned, throwing away the busted balloon. H hey, how did you do that? Jiraiya asked, indignant. Do you think my Jinchuriki's chakra lacks the density to pop a balloon? Naruto questioned. Yeah yeah, smart ass kids. Here, take this one. Jiraiya said, passing him a water balloon. Yeah, why don't you go to the hotel, Naruto? I will guide this lovely lady around. Jiraiya said, leering at the woman who had approached them. You will guide a local in her own village. So, you are as retarded as you are perverted. Naruto said. Well, whatever, do what you like. He finished and headed towards the hotel, using his chain to snatch Jiraiya's wallet. What? He was not gonna spend his own money on this. Currently, Naruto was the third step of the. He had completed the second step in a few hours, but it had taken a week to find the rubber balloon. So, sitting alone in the room was the only time he could practice. He was already tired of Jiraiya's constant bickering. Bing. Sensing the visitor's chakra, he could tell that none of them was Jiraiya. Calling a bird from his window, he asked it to get Jiraiya there somehow. Walking towards the door, he suppressed his chains that were popping out due to the vicious chakra of one of the men. Opening the door, there were two men in front of him. They had distinct defining features. One of them was shorter and had stress lines on his face. The other one was, well, huge and blue. The pair of them were wearing a black cloak with red clouds on it. What do you want? Naruto questioned. We want you. The shorter one replied. I am not into men. Naruto said and shut the door on their faces. He did not have much time to dodge the sword that broke through the door, but he was successful nonetheless. As I said, you will be coming with us whether you like it or not. The shorter one said again. And why would you need me, you weird old man? Naruto questioned again. We need the beast inside of you. The taller one said. And, I will have you know, I am only 18. The shorter one said. Sorry, no can do. He is attached to me. Naruto replied, and a dozen chakra chains erupted towards them. Staying true to their S rank title, the two of them were able to dodge the chains easily enough, only to realize that they were not the actual target. The chains had attached to the door behind them, using the door and chains as a catapult, he launched himself towards the corridor. The sparrow had landed on the lady's shoulder and poked into her neck, enough to draw blood. The feeling of pain, in turn, released her from the she was in. As soon as Jurei realized what was going on, he sunshined towards their hotel. Toad mouth jutsu. A voice came out as soon as the duo came to the corridor, and the whole area transformed into the innards of a toad. Jurei of the legendary three. The shorter one said, his eyes turning red. Itachi Ichiha. Jiraiya said. Looking dead into his eyes. We cannot take Kissum, run. The now named Itachi Ichiha said. Fine. Kissum huffed. I am sorry for bursting your pretty little bubble. Jiraiya said. But, you are not getting out of here. He concluded. Heedless of his warning, Itachi and Kissum ran towards a dead end. Just when it seemed like they would have to stop, black flames erupted from Itachi's eyes and created a hole for them to jump off of. Flame ceiling. Kai. Jiraiya said, sealing the black flames for further research. So, who were they? Naruto questioned. The Akatsuki. 
Jiraiya said. As far as I know, they are an organization of S-rank rogue ninjas who freelance. But recently they have shown a major interest in the tailed beasts. He explained. Wow, great. Now I have this to deal with too. Naruto sighed out. Hey, don't worry. You have plenty of time to prepare. Jiraiya said. Yes yeah, sure. Naruto murmured. This surely seems like Sanadi's doing. Jiraiya said. Naruto and Jiraiya were currently at a restricted site where the temple had fallen from an earthquake. Jiraiya was looking for any clue that would lead them to Tsunade, while Naruto was maintaining a purple ball of chakra in his hand. Um, nothing. She probably sunshined away from here. Jiraiya said. And you trace her chakra signature in your sage mode? Naruto questioned. I could if there was any chakra to trace. Her chakra control is so impeccable that she wastes not a single drop of chakra while using any. Jiraiya replied. Hein then, do you have a photo of her? Naruto questioned. Yes, I actually do. Jiraiya said, summoning a photo of Tsunade and him in a bar. Calling all the nearby birds towards him, he asked them to find the lady in the village. Let's go, we will know of her location in a while. Naruto said, prompting Jiraiya to head towards their new hotel. What was that? Jiraiya questioned. My information network. Well, sort of. Naruto said. I can talk to birds. He finished. That's quite a skill you have. Jiraiya said. While walking towards their hotel, a bird came to sit on Naruto's shoulder. Found her. Naruto said. Chapter 17. Heading towards the direction they were informed of, Naruto took in the side of the village. Unlike Konoha, the village was not full of trees. Its infrastructure was really good. It had a lot of bars, though. Too much alcohol for his taste. Well, it was not like he had had alcohol before. Ah, why was the bird on his shoulder looking towards a bar? Ouch. Naruto said. Why? Because the bird had poked him when they went past a bar. There. Naruto questioned. The bird chirped. There. Naruto told Jiraiya, pointing towards a bar. Seems like a place she would be at, yes. Jiraiya said, heading towards the accused bar. As soon as the smell of the bar reached his nose, Naruto's nose wrinkled. He already did not like being here. But, he supposed he would have to get used to it. Tsunade. Jiraiya exclaimed. Jiraiya. Tsunade questioned, her eyes squinted, trying to make sure that he is who she thinks he is. Hi as always. Jiraiya sighed out. You can leave if you are here to rant about my drinking habits. Tsunade said, sitting comfortably. Of course not, I come here as an official of Konoha. Jiraiya replied. Tsunade raised her eyebrow while using her chakra to drain down her tipsiness caused by the alcohol she was consuming. And, what message do you have? She asked. You know of the invasion, yes? Jiraiya asked. The Arachimaru fiasco? She questioned. Even Iwa knows of that, and they are on the other side of the map. She scoffed. So you do. The Hokage has asked you to come back to the village. He wants you to become the next Okage, Jiraiya said. You know how it is, Jiraiya. I am not coming back. She said. Come on, Tsunade. You are just wasting your life away. There are people in the village that need your help. Jiraiya said, trying to convince her. Don't tell me what I need to do, Jiraiya. I have done enough for the village, I am not going back. She said. All this conversation was going on, Naruto was aiming the pig across from him. Who, in turn, was aiming Naruto. Oink. It said, looking indignant. I not understand you, sorry bud. Naruto replied. He really wished he could understand other animals too. Oink. The pig said, its tone questioning. Huh? Naruto questioned. Apparently losing interest in the conversation, the pig popped out of its owner's hands, jumped into Naruto's arms and got comfortable in there. Now realizing that, no, the pig was not floating and was in the hands of someone, he looked up to meet the curious black eyes of an equally black-haired woman. Ah, sorry. I get intrigued by animals. And, well, there are not many pigs in Kanoha. Naruto said, embarrassed. Sorry about Tonton. She seems to like you. And, it is quite alright. The lady said, and offered her hand for a handshake. My name is Shizun and this is Tonton. She said. Naruto, too, offered a similar courtesy and shook her hand. I am Yuzumaki Naruto. And, I don't really mind her being here he said, looking at the comfortably sleeping pig. Realizing how childish they were acting compared to the actual children around them, they both stopped their bickering. So, who is the brat? Tsunade asked. He is Naruto Uzumaki, my new student. Jiraiya said. I am not your student. Naruto said. I am here just for the mission. He concluded. Uzumaki, huh? Tsunade asked. Yes Uzumaki. Naruto said, now interested in the conversation. This was the first time that someone was interested in his surname. Well, whatever. She said, brushing him off. If that is all you came for, you can now leave. She continued, looking towards Jiraiya. Ah, about that. This is my first official air rank mission, and I am not very keen on failing it. So, you will have to at least report to the 
I don't really care about the other stuff. Naruto said, butting in the conversation. I did not know the village was handing high-ranked missions to green brats. Tsunade scoffed. Perhaps your age has caught up to your eyesight, can you not see my best? Naruto counter scoffed. What did you just say? Tsunade hissed. Ah, so you have hearing issues too. Naruto said, are you sure she is to be the next Okage? She seems like a hag to me. He asked Jiraiya. Oh yeah? You wanna throw some hands, little brat? Let's have a little spar, if you win, I will go back to the village. Tsunade spat out. Imagine challenging someone a hundred years younger than you to a fight. Naruto retorted. Well, it's a mission, so bring it on. He said. Tsunade's eyes twitched. But, she refrained from attacking. She was gonna teach him a lesson soon enough anyways. Hijutsu only. Isn't that like your specialty? Are you so scared that you will limit me to your specialty? Naruto Ma questions. You speak a lot for a little brat. Fine, use whatever you want to. I will not need anything more than a finger to defeat you. Sanadi said. Is that the bet? If I beat you while you are only using a finger, I win, right? Naruto asked. Yes. Sanadi scoffed. If I win, you come back to the village, and if I lose? Naruto questioned. Then, you give up on being a shinobi. Sanadi said. Acceptable. Naruto said, without any hesitation. The only way she could ensure he would not be a shinobi was by becoming the Hokage. And, banning them to be shinobi is just the epitome of stupidity. And well, if push came to shove, he could just go around. Hearing that, Tsunade went straight to a fence. Charging her finger with chakra, she thrusted it on Naruto, only for him to disappear in the sunshine. Following his movements, Tsunade turned to block a chakra chain with her finger. The chakra chains? Tsunade questioned herself. She had last seen those coming from the back of Kishina and her grandmother, Nido. Wine style. Deal palm. Naruto said, releasing a gust of wind towards her. She dodged them easily enough. But, when she tried to speak to mock him, a pair of chains erupted from the ground and shoved her into the ground. Earth style. Hiding like a mole jutsu. Naruto said, smirking. Seeing the opportunity to win, Naruto formed a purple ball of chakra in his hands and started to walk towards the now undergrounded Tsunade. Will you give up now? Naruto questioned. Tsunade disappeared in a puff of smoke and was replaced by a piece of wood. This brought a smirk to Naruto's face. Why are you smirking? You realize I broke out of your technique, right? Tsunade questioned, now behind him. I know, but you used the substitution. Which is an ninjutsu. And, as I remember, you were limited to tojutsu only. So, I win. Naruto declared. Realizing her mistake, she scowled. Well, whatever, she did not need to keep her promise anyways. I hope the granddaughter of the has enough honor left to keep her promise, or maybe you really are neck deep into gambling that you have entered the territory of road bandits and the like. Naruto said, trying to make Tsunade keep her promise. I am not leaving this village for at least a week, there is a gambling contest going on. Maybe I will come with you then, or maybe I won't. Tsunade said and disappeared. Yeah, Jiraiya had been stupid enough to get drugged by Tsunade. And Tsunade had gone to sign a deal with the devil, Orochimaru, himself. You think an injection of sage chakra will quicken your recovery? Naruto questioned. It sure will, but I cannot summon Ma and Toad as things are. Jiraiya sighed out. Concentrating a bit, Naruto's eye lines thickened as he tapped into his partial sage mode. Moving towards Jiraiya, a chain erupted from his back and wrapped around Jiraiya's wrist and started injecting nature chakra into Jiraiya. Feeling the natural chakra entering his system, Jiraiya started to balance it and felt the poisoning washing away. Now somewhat healed and realizing that he will need his sage mode to fight Orochimaru, he started the hand signs to summon the toad couple to tap into the sage mode. At the same time, Naruto sat down in the room and started to meditate. As a purple shimmer of chakra surrounded him, he started sensing Tsunade in a clearing a bit away from the village. While all this was going on, Shizun was standing there, just standing and gaping. Well, her and Tauntan. I can sense her. Naruto said. The perfect sage. Shima questioned. Later about that. Jiraiya said to the toad on his shoulder. Lead the way. He said, looking towards Naruto. And, the three of them, with Tauntan, leaped out of the window. Tsunade had thought she could take on Orochimaru without drawing any blood. Oh, how naive she was. Now, she had blood splattered all over her face, and her body was not responding. That Kabuto guy was coming towards her, slowly, smirking, feeling proud of himself. He had a chakra scalpel in his hands. She was going to die, wasn't she? Is this all her life had come down to? Was she really just wasting her life away? Did it really matter now? Yeah, his hand was raised, she was surely going to die. Rasengan. A sharp voice came, a purple blur tackling Kabuto. And then, there was blood. This was the first time Naruto had used this on a person. And with the sage mode enhancing it, it was ever so deadly. He was currently drilling into Kabuto's stomach. He was surely dead. 
I cannot maintain this state for a very long time, I will finish this guy off, you engage the other one till then. Naruto said to Jiraiya. Yeah sure. But be careful, that guy has some crazy healing powers. Jiraiya replied. With that said, Jiraiya blitzed towards Orochimaru. Ah, Naruto-kun. I was not expecting you here. Kabuto said. The guy had healed from his injuries during the brief conversation that Jiraiya and Naruto had. But, he was visibly depleted of chakra and was panting harshly. Well, surprise, I suppose. Naruto said. Since, you know, I don't have much time to spare, I am gonna kill you now. He concluded and rushed towards Kabuto. Already depleted of chakra, Kabuto could do nothing but take the vicious beating he was handed. Being thrown back from a punch gave him enough time to prepare a chakra scalpel before his next, inevitable, tojutsu battle. As he had thought, Naruto rushed towards him. And again, as he had expected, he was not fast enough to counter the purple blur. Taking a punch to his stomach, he could do nothing but wait for the next to kill him off. And of course, Naruto did not hesitate in obliging him. Ah, Jiraiya. I was not expecting to see you so soon again. Aren't you being a bit too cocky with confronting me alone and all? Hirachimaru mocked. For someone hiding behind dead bodies, you consider yourself a bit too brave. Jiraiya countered. It is just another Jiraiya. Just like your sage mode. Hirachimaru said. Well, whatever. Shall we get to it? Or are you planning to run away like before? Jiraiya said. Neglecting to answer, thousands of snakes launched themselves from Orochimaru's sleeve towards Jiraiya. Jiraiya jumped back and created an earth wall to defend himself. Climbing onto his created wall, he released a flame bullet towards Orochimaru. Creating a similar wall like that of Jiraiya, Orochimaru defended himself. Summoning Jutsu. Orochimaru shouted, creating a huge poof of smoke, and from the smoke came forward an equally huge snake. Orochimaru, why have you summoned me? You are yet to provide me with my meals for the previous summoning. The large snake questioned. Now, now Manda. Everything shall come with time. I require your assistance. Perhaps, you will be happy to kill the toad that is to come. Arachimaru said. And, true to what he had said, a large toad appeared in a poof of smoke. Hello, Bunta, I need your help. Jiraiya said. Ma, Pa, you can dispel yourselves. I won't need the sage mode now. Fine. They chorused and disappeared in a puff of smoke. True to their stature, the battle that came next was majestic. There were large combinations of craters and barrages of attacks. Combination style toad oil bullet. Jiraiya exclaimed as the toad released a large glob of oil which was lit by Jiraiya to create a deadly fire. Its target, the large snake, burnt in agony and dispelled itself after a while. Roaming his eyes to look for any advantages, his eyes fell on the red-haired boy from whom a purple glow was receding and next to him, Kabuto lay dead. What a loss it was losing his most useful subordinate to such a brat. Deciding that he was not worth keeping alive, even at the cost of the wrath of Akatsuki, he blitzed towards the boy while peeking from his mouth. Tired from using his sage mode for such a long time and caught off guard from unseen speed, his chains were only able to stop the sword from getting right through him. Nonetheless, the sword made contact and the blood splattered, and that was enough for the poison of the blade to take its toll. Tsunade was not sure what was going on. First, she was going to die. And then, a purple blur protected her. The purple blur turned out to be the Uzumaki brat. He had actually defeated Kabuto. She did not know why, but she felt proud of him. And just when she was sure she could gather enough courage to move and heal the little brat, his teammate Sword, the infamous Kusanagi, managed to cut him. Rasengan. Jiraiya shouted, trying to kill Orochimaru. But, he dissolved into mud and was not seen again. As soon as Shizun realized what was happening, she ran towards Naruto to help him. Till now, she had separated the poison, but his natural healing was so fast that the wound was not staying open. Seeing Shizun run towards Naruto, a bolt of anxiousness ran over her. Suddenly gaining control of her body, she scrambled towards him. Activating her chakra scalpel on one hand and moving Shizun aside from the other, she started working on separating the poison with unrivaled skills. Chapter 18 Naruto woke up after a wonderful sleep. When he saw the sword stabbing into him, he was not expecting to wake up. But, here he was, waking up after the best sleep he had had. It was cold, but there was a strange warmness over his chest. Trying to wake up to check what was going on, he was gently put back in the sleeping position. Opening his eyes to look at what was going on, he was attacked with the harsh rays of the sun. Squinting his eyes to adjust to the light, he saw a green glow over his chest. I was not expecting you to wake up this soon. Well, for a while, I wasn't expecting you to wake up at all. A voice said. Who are you? Naruto questioned, still unable to focus due to the harsh light. Realizing the cause of his agony, the owner of the voice moved towards the window and closed the curtains. Ah, have you forgotten me already? That's quite rude of you. The voice, identifiable as a she, said. Tsunade? Naruto questioned, now able to see somewhat clearly. That's Tsunade-sama to you, brat. 
she said. And why is that? Naruto questioned. Hey, hey, I am one of the legends. She said, don't care. Naruto replied and proceeded to wake up. Nah. You are not waking up this soon. The poison of the Kusanagi is no ordinary poison, it has only started to be subdued now, if you move, it will start spreading again. So, you are here for the long game. Tsunade said. Boy, Kaiubi. Naruto said, inside his mind. No reply came. Come on, this is not the time to sleep. An eye opened. Come on, can you heal me up? The eye closed. Hey, come on, don't ignore me. I am not breaking out of your stomach, that is enough help from my side. They said, eyes still closed. Don't be like that. I opened up a seal, didn't I? You can heal me for once, come on. Naruto said he really did not want to waste his time just lying down. You did not know the seal would disappear, it was just your eager curiosity that led you to make poor decisions. Kaiubi said, raising his paws. This is only one time thing, do not count on me again. He said, his nail touching the head of Naruto. As soon as the nail made contact, wild, red chakra covered Naruto for a second, and all the poison was washed out. As the red chakra shrouded Naruto, Jiraiya appeared in a flicker, Tsunade leaped back, and Shizun took a step back. When they saw it disappear after a second, they were confused. What was that? Jiraiya questioned. The fox owed me one, so he healed me for once. Naruto replied. You talked to it? Jiraiya questioned, shocked. What else did you expect? He has been inside me for almost 14 years now. Do you know why you have been called here? The Hokage asked. Nope. Ino said. Probably for the promotions. Shikamaru said. Currently, the badge of shinobi teams dubbed as the Konoha 12 by the populace of Konoha were standing in front of the Hokage. Except for Naruto, of course. Indeed. The Hokage said, releasing a puff of smoke. I will get on to it then. He concluded. Kaiwuganiji, as well as you did in the exams, it is quite evident that you don't have the discipline necessary for becoming a. He said. Understood. Niji said. Ichiha Sasuke, you too, lack the Minsa to be considered a. He said. Understood. Sasuke said. Nara Shikamaru, you showed the ability to think on the run and powers to back up your plans. Hence, it is a pleasure for me to promote you to the rank of Chunin. He said, handing Shikamaru the best. It is an honor Hokage-sama. Shikamaru said. Yamanaka Ino, you too, showed the capacity to think out of the box and work well under pressure. Hence, again, it is a pleasure for me to promote you to the rank of Chunin. He said, handing in the vest. Thank you Hokage-sama. Ino said. Okage-sama, a question, if you do not mind. Ino asked. Ask away. He said. Where is Naruto? Why was he not called here? Ino questioned. Since he was specifically requested for a long-term mission, he was promoted before the ceremony. He is currently completing that mission. Hiruzen said. The solo mission? Shikamaru questioned. No, he is with one of my students, Jiraiya. Hiruzen said. Jiraiya of the legendary three? Ino questioned, shocked. That one, yes. Hiruzen said. Returning to Konoha was an uneventful journey. They had taken a straight route towards Konoha, through several forests. Tauntin was unwilling to leave Naruto's arms, winking harshly whenever Tsunade or Shizun tried to take her away from Naruto. Well, apart from that everything was uneventful. The gates of Konoha, now visible, made Tsunade nervous. She had not been into the village for a long while. She did not know what to feel. Your names and reason to visit? The gate guard asked, without looking up. Uzumaki Naruto and Jiraiya, returning from a retrieval mission. Naruto said. Ah, Jiraiya-sama, sorry about that, I was not looking. The gate guard said. It's quite alright. Can we go? Jiraiya questioned. Yes, of course. He replied. Uzumaki Naruto and Jiraiya, returning from the retrieval mission Hokage-sama. Naruto said. Be at ease. So you actually managed to convince her? That's quite an achievement. Hiruzen said. Well apart from that, the bounty of Gara will be delivered to your address today. You may be dismissed he said. Thank you. Naruto said and sunshine away. So, Sanadi, you actually came back, huh? I was not expecting to see you, really. Hiruzen said and took a deep puff of smoke in. He looked old. Well, older than ever. Well then, you better be grateful and stop wasting my time. Why did you call me here? Tsunade asked. Grateful I am, of course. Hiruzen said, then, his eyes became serious. I want you to become the next Okage. He declared. Huh? I am pretty sure you can squeeze in a few years more. Then, hand it over to Kakashi or Guy. Tsunade said, dismissing the idea. For a matter of fact, I cannot squeeze in a few years more, as you say. My fight with Orochimaru pushed me to my limits. I am not the god of shinobi I used to be. My powers have been depleting, Tsunade. My reign is over now. Hiruzen said. Well, whatever. Make Jiraiya the Hokage then. She said. He has an information network to take care of. Hiruzen countered. 
Bakashi, do lazy. I, strong, but naive. Fine, give me some time to think. Tsunade sighed out. Of course, take your time. Well, apart from that, I do have a request to make. Hiruzen said. What's that? Tsunade asked. The very promising genin, Rock Lee, was injured during the preliminaries of the exams. None of our medics are skilled enough to heal him. Please take a look at him and try to heal his injuries. Hiruzen said. Yes yeah, sure, I will do that. She said and flickered away. What do you think, Jiraiya? Will she agree? Hiruzen asked. She will come around. Jiraiya said, sighing. So, why did you not tell us of your promotion and the mission before? Hino huffed. Didn't see you around, then had to leave for the mission after waking up. Naruto replied. Naruto was stocking up his kunai stock in the weapon shop when he came around Ino, and well, here they were, walking towards his house and rambling. You sure you want to come? That's not a very nice place. Naruto questioned. Um, whatever. I have never seen your home before anyways. Hino replied. Well, suit yourself then. Naruto said. True to what Naruto had said, the area was not nice. Well, it was really bad. With beggars roaming around, thugs twirling and no sense of order, it looked like a civilization a century too old. Regardless, since they had their headbands on them, no one had confronted them, and they had reached Naruto's place without any problems. His house was on the second floor. The only house around that was well painted. He had probably painted it himself, since there were inconsistencies that a professional would have not left, Ino noticed. His house was not very big. Well, her living room was probably bigger than his house, but she was not judging. She knew Naruto was not as privileged as she was. But, it was clean and decent. The balcony was decent in size. It had an artificial grass mattress with a lot of bowls, full of bird food, on it. And of course, there were at least two dozen birds lazing around there. This is nice. Hino said. You don't need to sugarcoat anything. Naruto replied. No, really. This is nice. Hino insisted. Well, if you say so. Naruto said. So, what are your plans for tomorrow? Hino questioned. The ranks in the morning, training till evening and maybe a C rank, if I feel like it, the regular stuff. Naruto replied. No, I mean for celebration. Hino said, pouting. Celebration? For what? Naruto questioned. We got promoted, for that, of course. Hino said. Um, no plans, none that I can think of. Naruto said. Well, what about you? He questioned. My family with Shikamaru's and Choji's are going to Nara's forest for a day or two. It's a really great place with a farmhouse and all. Hino said. Did Choji get promoted too? Naruto questioned. No, but he is a really close family friend. And our families usually take vacations together. Hino answered. Ah, I see. Well, enjoy your vacation then. Naruto said. Just when they were about to fall into silence, a chirping noise prevented it. A bird came flying in through his window. Well, that was quite a common occurrence. But, what was not common was the envelope in its mouth. The bird sat on his shoulders and offered him the envelope. Ah, the bounty. Naruto said, remembering what the Hokage had told him. What bounty? Hino questioned. Aras. He said, putting the envelope in the drawer. Well, it seems like you have money to spare, why don't you move out of here? Hino questioned. I just purchased this house against cash, there is no point in moving out this early. Naruto said. Ah, I see, that makes sense. Hino said. Well, I will leave now, I guess. Sure, see you around. He said, escorting her towards the door. The idea of celebration had stuck with him. He had never celebrated anything before. And yeah, he felt jealous of Ino when she talked about family vacations. Well, she probably didn't understand what she was saying. It was the day after Ino's and his conversation. Well, it was not exactly a day. It was almost night now, and he had more than one excuse to justify his celebration. One, his promotion. And second, his birthday. Yeah, it was 10th of October, his 14th birthday. Till now, he had not gone out for a single birthday of his. But, he had an excuse today. And well, he was curious about alcohol now. Also, he had money to spare. So, here he was in front of a bar. It was legal for shinobi of any age to drink alcohol. Because, well, any shinobi could be asked to indulge a daimyo or a noble with a drink. It was going to be his first drink though. Entering the bar, he had taken the most isolated seat towards the corner. He had ordered a can of beer and a pastry. Yeah, the waiter had looked at him weird, but it was because of the combination he had ordered, so he would slide with it. Eating the pastry and not looking at the alcohol just yet, he was enjoying his isolation. Recently, he has had very little alone time. He had spent a month surrounded by owls, then a week with Yureya for finding Tsunade, then three days with Yureya, Tsunade, Shizune and Taunton, traveling back to Konoha. So, yeah, he was enjoying his birthday very much. Tsunade-sama, not a bar again. We have been to 30 different bars in two days. 
a familiar boy sighed out. He sighed too. Why? Because there stood Sanadi and Shizun. And they had seen him. And they were heading towards him. He wanted to sigh again, but that would be rude. So brat, I did not know you drank. Sanadi said, taking a seat on his table. I don't, this is my first time here. He said. Well, what's the occasion? She questioned. My birthday. He replied. I see, and why are you alone? She questioned again. My teammates have places to be at, and it is saving me money. He said. How about you treat me then dot? No. Naruto cut Sanadi off. Hey, come on, you can do that at least. Sanadi said, indignant. No. He replied. Fine. She huffed, I will pay for mine. Happy birthday, Naruto. Shizun said, smiling. Thank you. He said, quite awkward. Bring me the biggest bottle of sake. Sanadi shouted, looking quite drunk. Wait, where had his beer gone? Well, with Sanadi drinking, Shizun smiling awkwardly and Tauntin sleeping in his arms, he had to agree, he was enjoying his birthday. Chapter 19 Things had fallen into pace. Naruto had started taking individual missions apart from the regular team missions for some extra cash. Sanadi and him hit it off pretty quickly. Turns out, Naruto did not get drunk easily. And, well, he had sort of gotten into drinking with Sanadi. Come on, you can do the mission later. It is my last free day, brat. Sanadi said. Did I mention that Sanadi was going to become a Hokage the next day? I hope I did. I have already been assigned the mission. And, well, I will only be back after you become the Hokage. Naruto replied. I can overrule the decision, can't I? Sanadi asked no one. You can, but not before tomorrow. And, I will be gone by then. Naruto said. Come on, Sanadi-sama, you have already had enough. You have to wake up early tomorrow. Shizun said. Currently, Naruto, Sanadi and Shizun were in a bar. Naruto had to depart on a solo B-rank escort mission to the Land of Demons. Ideally, it would be a three-day journey, but escorting a civilian would make it unnecessarily long. He had offered to carry her throughout. But, well, she had denied. Let me enjoy my last free day, Shizun. Sanadi slurred out. Well, I will take my leave. Can't keep the client waiting, you know. Naruto said. Be safe. Shizun said. Sanadi murmured something, but it was not understandable. So, he let it go. Sure. He said, and disappeared in a flicker. Flickering outside of the bar and walking towards the office, Naruto could feel the difference in behavior of people around him. Following his fight with Shukaku, people's disdain towards him was reduced to the point that he was almost never glared at since then. He had never fought for anyone's attention, but his life had definitely taken a turn for the better. In fact, a few people had started to wish him passing greetings too. Reaching at the office, his client, a young girl around his age, was waiting for him. How gracious of you to arrive here. She said, mocking him. Reporting for the escort mission Hokage-sama. Naruto said, not paying any attention to the jab. Very well. You know of the mission, yes? They asked. Land of Demons. B-rank escort mission. Naruto replied, telling what he knew of the mission. Indeed. This is Arai Sora, the daughter of the Lord of the Land of Demons. Hiruzen said, introducing the girl. Now taking a proper look at her, she had long, black hair, blue eyes, and wore a black kimono with blue floral designs all over it to complement her looks. She was about a head shorter than he was. All in all, she was a typical RR girl. Arai. She said, offering her hand for a shake. Yuzumaki Naruto. He replied, accepting the handshake. Very well. Since the courtesies are done, you can proceed with your mission. Hiruzen said. Yes. He said. Suppressing his urge to flicker out of there, he took the door with his client. I am still offering to carry you on my back. Naruto said. I am still denying your offer. Arai huffed. Why is that? Naruto questioned. It is not suitable for someone of my stature. She said, her nose pointing towards the sky. You understand that your father is paying me quadruple the original amount for your demand, right? He questioned. We have plenty of money to spare. She said. Well, whatever you say. Naruto said, shrugging. A few extra days of traveling were a worthy trade-off for the money he was offered. Falling into silence, he summoned his scout owl for extra safety measures. The owl, after being summoned, tilted its head curiously. Seeing the surroundings, it understood what he was asked to do. So, it proceeded to settle itself on Naruto's shoulder and sleep. Walking for a while more, they had not met any danger. Since it was already evening, Naruto decided to set up camp in the forest they were in. Well, not camps, only a camp. Since he was the only guarding shinobi, he had to say goodbye to his sleep for the time they were traveling. The night was uneventful, in between the forest, there were no bandits lying around, and the fire he had set would scare any animals away. So, once Arai woke up, they decided to move forward. So, where are we going next? Arai asked. The sigh escaped Naruto's lips. Land of rivers. He said. That place was seriously dangerous. 
The only reason why this mission was at B-rank was because they had to travel through the land of rivers. I see. She said, falling into silence. Walking into the land of rivers was an easy task. Well, since there were no guards. The scenario inside the village was a disaster though. At least for Rai, who had never seen poverty in her life, it was the most horrendous thing she had seen. All the houses were made of brass, there were people walking around, as thin as a stick. Poor people, old and young, were carrying rock and walking towards a cave in line. Keeping them in line were shinobi. Bandits, more likely. Hitting people right and left, uncaring of their agony. Naruto was perfectly happy to ignore everything and be on their way, but when one of the bandits was about to hit a fallen old man, Arai had to become the epitome of all things good. Stop it, can't you see? He is hurt. Arai shouted. Mind your own business, girl. The bandit said. That had to be it, right? They were given a chance, so they should have left, right? No. Oh yeah, why don't you show me what my business is? She said. A sigh left Naruto's mouth. Arai, we are in the middle of enemy territory with me as the only one capable of fighting, and you are challenging them? Naruto questioned. Now realizing what she had done, she quickly hid behind Naruto. You know how civilians are, she won't speak again. We just have to walk off of here, and we can avoid any conflicts. Naruto said. That's not how things work, little boy. I was generous enough to give you a chance, was I not? The bandit said, walking towards them. Fine. Naruto sighed out as a chain passed through the heart of the aforementioned bandit. Apparently looking at his vest for the first time, the bandits realized that he was a shinobi. Call Raga-sama, we will hold him off till then. One of the bandits said. Yes. One of the other bandits said and ran away. Ah, that was a problem now. The one who ran away was probably going to call a big shot. Regardless, he had some immediate problems which needed some attention. Till now, half a dozen bandits had surrounded him. He could kill them easily enough. But, there were people around him and he also had a client to protect. Arai was still hiding behind him after all. Take this. Bandit number one shouted as he ran towards Naruto with a sickle in hand. Turning around and enveloping Arai in his arms, he jumped back to dodge the attack. Willing his chains to do his bidding, he launched it towards the aforementioned bandit. Not being fast enough to dodge it, he was swiftly taken care of. Now hesitating after seeing a one-sided slaughter of their partner, the others were hesitant in charging. Regardless, Naruto had to get this over with as soon as possible. In search of a large-scale attack, Naruto leaped into the air and from the top view, released a barrage of kunai. Wind style. Gale palm. He said, to accelerate the kunai. True to their stature of an untrained civilian, they could do nothing but get slaughtered. We have to leave quickly. He told Arai, who was holding him like her life depended on him. Well, it actually did. But, before Naruto could take a step further, a bolt of lightning fell in front of him. Flipping back while keeping the girl safe, Naruto summoned four chains to protect him from any unexpected attacks. I heard you were harassing the mercenaries I had hired. Do you, perhaps, want to have a funeral early in your life? A deep voice asked. He wore a grey hooded mantle with three red stripes, a nest strapped to his back. Under his mantle, he wore a dark brown sleeveless vest falling to his knees where the inside was purple, light brown belt, a light grey pants and, he had bandages covering most of his body, his neck down to his chest, including his arms and his shin bones. Who might you be? Naruto questioned. You come to my land and ask me this. I am Raiga Kurosuke, wielder of the Kiba blades. And I shall give you your funeral. He said. Water style. Hidden Miss Jutsu. Raiga said, as a layer of mist started to surround them. Then unleashing his kiba blades, he summoned lightning on them. Lightning style. Thunderfall. He said and launched a thunder summon from the skies towards them. Dodging the attacks by sensing them, Naruto looked around for a place to keep Arai safe. Looking around, he found a large, solid rock, behind which she could be safe. Leaping towards it, he asked her to leave him and stay there for a while. Initially, she was unwilling to leave the safety of his arms, but after a bit of prompting from Naruto, she agreed to hide there. Now not having to worry about anyone else, Naruto was ready to fight at his fullest. Lightning funeral. Raiga shouted, now standing at the top of the nearby mountain. Wind style. Wind gust. Naruto said, removing the mist and getting his sight back. Seeing the lightning strike coming towards him, he dodged it and rushed towards his target. Lightning style. Lightning ball. Raiga said, releasing several balls of lightning towards Naruto. Dodging, leaping, sliding and jumping, Naruto avoided all the attacks. Now quite close to him, Naruto released a kunai towards him. To his shock, the kunai was cut in half through his sword. Realizing that his swords could channel chakra, a plan formed in his mind. Earth style. Earth bullets. He said and released mud-made bullets to counter the lightning balls coming towards him. One of the bullets hit Raiga straight in the chest and knocked him back. Standing up and now angry, Raiga shouted, I will be hosting your funeral, and it won't be pretty. 
with that said, he raised his sword towards the sky and started to gather lightning around it. Seeing the opportunity and grabbing it, Naruto wrapped his chains around the raised sword. This was something he wanted to try. He began flooding the sword with nature chakra. And, slowly but eventually, the lightning gathered around it started to disperse, and the sword turned into stone. W what did you dot before Raiga could complete his sentence, a purple ball of chakra connected to his stomach, and he fell down off the cliff, with the Kiba sword in his hands and his nest still strapped to his back, never to be seen again. Before Naruto could exhale a sigh of relief, a black blur tackled him in a hug. Then Naruto, I am sorry. Arai said. Now, everything is fine. He said, awkwardly consoling her. The people of the land of rivers had thanked him, and the rest of his journey remained normal. He had dropped a ride to the land of demons, had stayed there for dinner, and was now wishing his goodbyes before leaving. Chapter 20 The Hidden Sand was in shambles. They had signed a deal with the devil, and they were now paying for it. With the death of the fourth Kazakiage, Rasa, and the only one who was considered strong enough to succeed him, Gara, being dead, the Hidden Sand was on the verge of ruins. Baki, the fourth's right-hand man, was given the title of the fifth Kazakiage. This was the first time that someone not the direct descendant of the first Kazakiage was awarded this position. This only goes on to show how fragile they were as things were. Sand was already the weakest of the five. And, Baki the weakest of the five cage. The first thing Baki had done after becoming the Kazakiage was demanding the head of the one who killed Gara as compensation. The third had bent down to the will of the Rakage, so he did not see any loss in trying. But, to his misfortune, the letter had been received by the fifth Okage, Tsunade Senju, and their reply was not pleasant. The fifth Okage had drilled them in every aspect, telling them how it was the sand who had attacked them, and how it will only take one more outrageous demand from the sand, which will lead them to the next war. The only reason why she was willing to work with sand again was their history as allies, and the fact that Orochimaru, a traitor from the Hidden Leaf, had been pulling the strings all along. Reporting back from the mission Hoka.A. Naruto questioned, not seeing the familiar face on the chair of the Hokage. Tsunade? He questioned again. A smirk came to her face. Now it is surely Tsunade Sama to you, Brad. She said, realizing that Tsunade must have become the while he was away, he straightened up. Of course Hokage Sama. Yuzumaki Naruto reporting from the escort mission. He said. How was the mission? She questioned. We came across a missing nin from the hidden mist. And well, I ended up breaking one of the seven swords. He replied. Go on, explain in detail. She said, and he did. Somewhere in between of the conversation, Shizune had entered the room, and of course, Tauntin had jumped off of her arms into Naruto's. Raiga. He wielded the Kiba blades of what I know. Tsunade said. Yeah, he mentioned that once. Naruto said. At this point, Naruto, Tsunade and Shizune had settled on the couch while a clone of Tsunade was signing the papers and grumbling. So, why are you making your clone sign those papers? Aren't those like, important? Naruto questioned, curious. Those are shadow clones, they pass their information on to the creator once they are dispelled. Tsunade replied, feeding his curiosity. That is pretty neat, you think you can teach it to me? Naruto questioned. That is a forbidden technique, it eats up a lot of jack. Tsunade trailed off, realizing how stupid it would sound, saying that to A. Well, it is still from the forbidden scroll. She said, recovering her lost dignity. Ah, understandable. Naruto said. I never denied teaching it to you. Tsunade said. You cannot go around passing techniques now, can you? Naruto mock questions. Before the conversation could go any further, an anbu flickered in front of them. Lady Hokage, the Kazakiage, is here for the meeting. The anbu said. I see. She said to the anbu. Turning to Naruto again, well, that's that for now. You want to meet at the same time? She questioned. Naruto's eyebrow rose. You are the Hokage now. He said. You can't go around drinking anymore. Naruto and Shizun chorused. A chuckle escaped from their mouths when they realized what had happened. On the contrary, I am Hokage now. So, I can do whatever I like. She said, same time, same place. She concluded and disappeared in a flicker. I will go now too, I always have to keep an eye on her. Shizun said. Sure, see you around. He said, and flickered away too. What do you mean here and away? Naruto questioned. Naruto, Shikamaru and Ino were currently at Shikamaru's place. Shikamaru had a plaster around his left arm. He ran off to Orochimaru. Ino said. Tsunade Sama didn't tell me that. Naruto said. Well, maybe she did not remember, she has other things to take care of too, you know. Ino replied. Yes, yeah, sure. Naruto murmured. Well, anyways, tell me about the mission. He questioned. Since all the high ranking were taking the pending missions from the time of the invasion, Ino and I were the only available for the mission. So, we formed a team consisting of Niji, Lee, Kiba, Chaoji and the two of us. Shikamaru said. 
Sasuke had a backup of a team of four from the Sound Village and an additional backup who appeared later. Chaoji had to use a forbidden jutsu to survive. Shik and I were able to run back and forth to help others, though. Lee fraught Sasuke and is in a critical condition. But all of us returned back alive and, all except for Lee, survived with minimal injuries. The five that Orochimaru sent are dead though, but Sasuke managed to run away. Ino explained. And, why did he run away? Wasn't he handed everything he wanted here? Naruto questioned. Well, who knows? But, the fact remains that he is a traitor now. Ino said. Sakura is heartbroken though. She continued. Who is Sakura? Naruto questioned. The Sai left Ino. She was our classmate, Naruto. Hmm. Naruto hummed. Yeah, he now wants to form an alliance. Tsunade said, slurring towards the end. Naruto and Tsunade were currently at the decided bar. Tsunade, drunk as always. Naruto sober as always. I am pretty sure that information is supposed to be classified, Tsunade. Naruto said. Yes, she had allowed him to call her Tsunade when they were not in the Hokage office. Eh, nothing too secretive. She said, downing another bottle. Whatever you say. Just, don't get me behind the bars for knowing sensitive information later on. Naruto sighed out. Say, Naruto. Do you want to become my student? Tsunade questioned, sounding sober all of a sudden. Huh? Where is this coming from? Naruto questioned. You know of the Akatsuki, yes? Tsunade questioned. I know what Jiraiya told me of them. Naruto replied. Igura, the Mizukage, was the host of the Three-Tailed Beast. He was slaughtered this week. It is speculated that the Three-Tailed Beast will take about three years to reincarnate. And, we are expecting that to be the same time around which the Akatsuki will start operating. Tsunade explained. And, what does that have to do with you training me? Naruto questioned. I want you to become a proper S rank before you have to face any of the Akatsuki, which you inevitably will have to. She said, concerned. I am not looking forward to becoming a medic, though. Naruto said. I have plenty of other things to teach, if you want to learn, of course. She replied. Well, it will be my honor then. He said, accepting the offer. Chapter 21 What do you mean you are going to train him? Jiraiya questioned. I was going to take him on a training trip. He stated. Well you were going to take him. But, now you are not. Tsunade said, unmoving. Hey, come on. He is a sage, there is no better teacher for him than I Jiraiya said. He is already a better sage than you, all he needs is better control over his chakra. And, I don't want him to end up a pervert like you too. She stated. Whoa there, I am no ordinary pervert. I am great Jiraiya-sama, the super pervert. He said, now out of habit. Yes, you are definitely not getting him. Tsunade said. The cloud of depression formed over Jiraiya. Why would you do this to me? He cried out. Because I feel like it. Now, get lost. And, if I see you near the hot springs again, you will be dead meat. She said, dismissing him. Fine fine, I will go. But, remember Tsunade, this is a huge responsibility. We do not know what the Akatsuki are planning to do with the Biju, but it cannot be anything good. He said, dumping his childish persona. I know that. And, I am going to prepare him for all he is going to face. I am not going to let him die too. She said, every bit as serious as Jiraiya. Well, I suppose you get what you want, princess. See you later then. He said and disappeared in a poof of smoke. Takra control is a much neglected part of training by the majority of shinobi. No matter how many you know of, no matter how many S-rank techniques you have stuffed in your mind, if you lack the chakra control to perform them, you will either not be able to perform the technique or die due to sudden loss of chakra. Tsunade explained. It is a common misconception that people with large reserves of chakra cannot have better control. I hail from two clans which are known for their chakra vitality and large reserves. The Senju and the Yuzumaki. And, I have control over my chakra to such an extent that I do not waste a single drop of chakra while performing any technique. And, as my student, that is what is expected of you. She said, understood, Sanadi sama I will do my best. Naruto replied. That is what I expect from you. Now, tell me what all chakra control exercises do you know of? Sanadi ordered. I started off with a leaf balance exercise, followed by tree walking and water walking. And, I don't know if this counts as a chakra control exercise, but I have mastered this too. Naruto said, forming a purple ball of chakra in his hand. Yes, the. It is, indeed, considered a chakra control exercise. Well, Shizun will start you off with the advanced exercises. I will see your progress at the end of the day. She said, prompting Naruto to follow Shizun. You did exceptionally good for your first day. I was not expecting your chakra control to be this good. Shizun complimented. Ah, thanks. Naruto said, not used to the praise. Tired? Shizun questioned. Very. Naruto said, falling onto his couch. Ah, I suppose Sanadi-sama is not going easy on you. 
Shizun said. Yeah, I am inclined to believe that she is going extra hard on me. Naruto said. Well, you have a target of becoming a proper S rank in two years, don't you? She said, defining the reason why he was suffering through this hell in simple words. Indeed. But, I am gonna sleep now. You can stay over if you want. Naruto said, falling asleep instantly after. Well, that is surely an opportunity. Shizun told herself. Ah, look at you growing. Finally a jonin. You are well on your way to become one of the finest that the leaf has produced. Tsunade said, hugging him. Hey, no biggie, really. But, you are to thank for this too. I am really grateful for everything you have done for me. Naruto said. He was still not used to hugs or any sort of physical contact, really. But, that did not mean that he did not enjoy it. Hmm. Is that so? Then how about you treat me to a few drinks? Tsunade said, smirking. A sigh left Naruto's lips. Really? He said. Indeed. Tsunade replied. Well, whatever you say. Naruto said. Say, Shizun, are you free tonight? Naruto questioned. Hmm. Why do you ask? I was wondering if you want to join me for dinner tonight. Naruto questioned. Ah, are you asking me out on a date, Naruto? Shizun questioned, trying to rile him up. You can call it a date, yes. Naruto replied, not responding to the teasing. Well, I am certainly free tonight. Why not then? It is a date. Shizun said. The date it is, then. Naruto replied. So, Sasuke, how far are you willing to go to have your revenge? A slimy voice questioned. It really does not concern you. Do what you are here to do and train me. Sasuke said. Well, that is the first thing we will need to correct. After all, discipline is a very important trait for a shinobi. The same voice said. When you talk to me, you talk to me with respect. If you don't, the seal on your neck is as much a time bomb as it is a power boost. He said. Ah, Hirachimaru sama It seems like you have terrified the boy. A female voice said. Through to what she had said, Orochimaru's presence was spread thickly in the room, and Sasuke was stuck, seemingly terrified. You know how it is, Gurin-chan. I have to keep my subordinates in their place. Orochimaru said. Why of course, Orochimaru-sama. Gurin said. It has been a long time, hasn't it? Naruto questioned. In the dark recesses of his mind, a blood-red eye shot open. It has indeed been, as you say, a long time. And, I could not be any more glad. The voice growled. Now, is it that you have grown to be happy with your isolation? Naruto questioned. If your puny mind cannot understand the difference between being isolated and being caged, maybe I overestimated you. The same voice said. You know how it is, Kaiubi. I like to joke around. Naruto said. Meaningless conversation. Why are you here? The question. Just roaming around. It is my mind, you know. Naruto said. Your mind, you say. Do you, perhaps, want me to leave? You know I can do that since the seal is broken, do you not? The question. Whoa there, slow down, I am just playing around. No need to tear me down. Naruto said. Will you stop staring at me? Naruto questioned. Were you not staring at him when you killed him? Tamari questioned. Tamari had become the Suna representative in Kanoha. So, she was around a lot. But, it was the first time that Naruto was meeting her since the infamous exams. He was innocent, handed a bad hand. And you just killed him. Tamari scoffed out. Sure, Lem released the Kaiubi on Suna just because I was handed a bad hand. Would you try to keep me alive then? Naruto questioned. You speak as if you actually did something to help him. I, at least, gave him freedom from being considered a weapon. He continued drilling into her. He was not going to take such taunts from a foreign nin. Tamari did not have any reply to this. So, she just waited for the Kazakiage to arrive and drowned in her guilt, internally of course. Hey Shizun. Naruto called her. They were currently on his couch, watching a show and enjoying their meal. Um. Shizun questioned, her mouth stuffed with food. I think I love you. He said. Chapter 22. So, Shizun, how is Naruto doing? Sanadi questioned in a sly voice. And, well, Shizun went red. Apparently, Shizun was a heavy blusher, it just never came out before because, well, Shizun had never dated anyone before. Come on, it's almost been a year and you still blush when he is mentioned. Sanadi said, sighing. W well, don't mention him then. She sputtered out. Hey, come on. Don't be like that. You've got to tell me the details. She said, unmoving. Mind your own business. Shizun shouted, red from her ears to neck. Fine fine, is he done with his training? Sanadi questioned, not mocking her anymore. I suppose he is done. I am not sure, though. Shizun replied. Before the conversation could go any further, the man in question, Naruto entered the room. Hey there, Sanadi, Shizun. I am done with my workout for the day. He said, hugging Shizun from behind. His chin resting comfortably on her head. How many times have I told you to not do this here? Shizun shouted, indignant. 
Well, this is the only time I heard it properly. You always squeak out such things, so I pretend that I didn't hear anything. Naruto said. Well, what have you written today? Naruto questioned. Maybe she was thinking naughty things about you. Tsunade said, a sly smile gracing her face again. Is that so? Naruto questioned. And no, nothing like that. She said, realizing that no one could understand her, she took a deep breath and said, let me go now, I have work to do. Well, sure. You can go. Naruto said, moving from behind her. Grabbing the opportunity, Shizun stormed out of the room. Once she was gone, the conversation began again. Well, I am afraid that we are at such a point now that I don't have anything else to teach you, Naruto. You've come so far from the puny little you were before. And, I could not have been any more proud. Tsunade said, affection dripping from her voice. You have done enough, Tsunade sama I am very thankful for what you have done for me. I could not be more grateful if I tried. He said. A brilliant smile graced Tsunade's face, and Naruto knew what was gonna come next. Surely, this is as divine as places get in the elemental nations. Tsunade said, a bottle of sake in her hand. You say that in every bar we go. Naruto replied, now used to her antics. Eh, maybe I do, maybe I don't. But, this is great. She said, raising the bottle in her hand. There is no maybe. I know it for a fact that you do. Naruto replied, raising his bottle to acknowledge the cheers. Well, anyways, what have you thought about the Akatsuki? Tsunade questioned. What is there to think? They are out to kill me, so I am out to kill them all in kind. Naruto replied. Of course you are out to kill them. But, you cannot go barging in to fight the whole of the Akatsuki alone. Tsunade said, sighing. Well, we know for a fact that they will have to start with a one-tailed beast. And, of what I know, it was reincarnated in the deserts of Suna, like, a year ago. Naruto said. Indeed. Suna has not been able to produce someone who can bear the full might of the Shukaku. Tsunade said. Well then, why not ask Suna Shinobi to keep guard on the area? If they notice any suspicious happenings, they can instantly send a messenger bird to inform us. Naruto offered. That is a feasible idea. I will see what I can do. Well, regardless, we will be heading to Suna tomorrow anyways. I have to make some trade deals official with the new Kazakiage. Tsunade said. And indeed, Naruto, as Tsunade's student, had been with Tsunade on every political shenanigans. Along with Shizun, of course. She being there was not the reason though. It was not. The new Kazakiage? Naruto questioned. The position of the Kazakiage, unlike any other, has been hereditary in Suna. Baki becoming the Kazakiage was not a rule, but an exception. Since Tamari is now deemed strong enough to become the Kazakiage, Baki will be stepping down now. Tsunade explained. That is. Well, you know. A bit weird. A hereditary cage, I mean. There are always other deserving candidates, you know. Naruto said. It is, indeed. But, we cannot do anything about that. Well, how about we start with the drinks now? Tsunade said, ordering more drinks out of Naruto's pocket. You haven't been around lately. Mom has been asking about you, you know. It has almost been two years since you last met her. Ino said. You know how it is, Ino. More often than not, I end up sleeping in the training ground itself. But, since my training has been marked as completed, I am sure I can be around more often. He said. Well, that's good. How about tomorrow then? Ino questioned. Sorry, but I have to leave for sooner early tomorrow. Naruto said. Ah, I see. Later then, I guess. Ino said. Walking towards Suna, Naruto was already feeling bored. While walking in a desert, precision was really necessary. And it was really hot in the afternoon. And he could not even talk unless he wanted sand in his mouth, as there was a sandstorm ongoing. He really hates the sandstorm right now. Well, regardless of the quiet, hot and sandstorm-filled journey, the trip remained uneventful. They had made it to Suna in a day. Since there were no Anbu accompanying them, Naruto would just carry Shizun when she got tired, and Naruto and Tsunade had enough stamina to get to Suna and go back to Konoha without stopping. So, there was no need for stopping anywhere. And well, they were at the gates of Suna in record time. Hello Hokage Dono. The newly minted Kazakiage said. Greetings, Kazakiage Dono. Tsunade said, in kind. I hope the journey went without any issues. Tamari said. Indeed. We reached here without any problems. Tsunade said. That is great to hear. These shinobi will lead you to your rooms. We will let you know of the timings of our meeting. I hope you enjoy our hospitality. Tamari said, prompting her to bow. Of course, we will be in your care. Tsunade said. Are you going to bring up the one-tailed beast in the meeting with the Kazakiage? Naruto questioned. Yes, we don't have any time to spare now. Tsunade said. The three of them with Tauntin were currently in a large room provided for them. It was a luxurious room with three full-size beds. Tsunade was rechecking the papers she had brought for the meeting, while Naruto was resting on Shizun's lap with Tauntin on his stomach. 
Shizun was combing through Naruto's red locks, trying to give it another style. And, you think they will let us interfere with such an internal matter? Naruto questioned. I am pretty sure they will. And, if they don't, we will engage the Akatsuki on our own accord. She said, I see. Naruto said and everyone fell into silence. It was dark. A dark cave. Well, that's the best guess one could make. In between the cave stood nine holographic figures, each dressed in a similar attire. Black cloaks and red clouds over them. It is about time we begin with our operations. A heavy voice said. The speaker had deep purple eyes, orange hair and piercings all over his face. We still do not have a proper partner for me. Zetsu is not a fighter and cannot support me in any way. Another voice said. Yes, Zetsu was your partner only in words. For your missions, Toby will be your partner from now on. The initial voice said. Woohoo. Toby would love to work with Kakuzu Senpai. Toby squealed. He is hardly any better than Zetsu. Kakuzu said. There is a reason why he is here. He will carry his own weight. The initial voice stated. Well, I will take your word for it, then. Kakuzu said. As I was saying, it has been confirmed by Zetsu that the one and the three-tailed beasts have been reformed. Dadara, Sasori, the pair of you will depart to capture the one-tailed beast. The purple-eyed man said. Un, the one-tailed beast. Sure. Dadara said. Yes. Sasori stated. Ah, forgive my man Sasori. He is not much of a speaker. Dadara said to everyone. I can speak for myself, Dadara. Sasori stated, his voice heavy as ever. Well, Un, if you say so. Dadara said, chuckling. I hope you enjoyed our hospitality Hokage-sama. They said, of course. We are honored to receive such a warm welcome. The Hokage replied. The meeting room of the Sunagakur was very soon alike. It looked like it was themed after a desert. The walls were dirt brown, the table was oak brown, and the glasses on the table followed the theme too. The honor is all ours Hokage Dono. Tamari said. Well then, shall we get to the business in hand? Sanadi questioned. Of course. Tamari replied, prompting Sanadi to begin. Hmm. First off, we are yet to finalize our trade route through the wave. We hope we can keep our relations very active. Tamari said. Indeed. It would be a waste to let everything go after making such crucial decisions. Tsunadi replied. Well, will that be all Hokage Dono? Tamari questioned. Actually, no. I have another issue to talk about. Tsunadi said. And what might that be? Tamari questioned. You know of the Akatsuki, yes? Tsunadi questioned in kind. I do, yes. They are after me if I am not wrong. Tamari said. Indeed. Since they are our common enemies, Kanoha would formally like to offer her shinobi to help protect the one-tailed beast. Tsunadi offered. The Akatsuki is, indeed, a common enemy. Even though Suna has set up guard camps near Shukaku, if 2S ranks want to do it, they would kill them all. So, Suna will graciously accept your most generous offer. Tamari said. Well, that went better than expected. Shizun said. Yeah, it went smoothly enough. Tsunadi replied. Well, it was not like we were expecting any problems. It is not like Suna has allies in bulk. Naruto said. That is true too. But, having the title of one of the five great villages can fuel a lot of ego. Tsunadi said. Just like having the title of one of the legendary three, right? Naruto mock questioned, smirking. Yeah, you just wait. I am going to have you do a thousand d rank missions now. Tsunadi said, just shy of bursting into laughter. That is not half bad. That would be a great vacation. Naruto said, adopting a thinking pose. Before they could talk any further, a San Shinobi came rushing in, reporting to the Kazakiage who was still in the meeting room. But, he was loud enough to be heard by the whole of the populace. Lady Kazakiage. We have spotted the red clouds. He exclaimed. Well, Naruto, I suppose it is time to check how far you have come in these three years. Tsunadi said, smirking. Chapter 23. Na, Sasori, do we have a plan? Or are we going to blast the whole desert, un? Dadara questioned. And, well, are you sure we are going in the right direction? He asked again. The Akatsuki duo was currently heading towards where the one-tailed beast was suspected to be, traveling on a large white bird. We do have a plan, yes. You will use the seal I will give you to make the beast unconscious and use your birds to carry it away. I will be taking care of the guard dogs. I will hold my position for a while to make sure that no one is following us, till then, you will already be at a safe distance from the fighting scene. Sasori said, explaining the plan. Eh? Why do you get to have all the fun? Dadara questioned. I am letting you fight the one-tailed beast alone, is that not enough? Sasori said, handing him the seal in question. Well, when you say that, you make me sound greedy, un. I suppose I will do it, then. Dadara said. Land here. Sasori ordered. At this point, the gigantic figure of the one-tailed beast was visible. It was just moving around, causing havoc with its movement alone. 
It almost looked like a child, running around aimlessly. Once the bird was landed, Sasori threw a rock towards a bush to distract the nearby Suna Shinobi. As the Suna Shinobi entered the isolation of the sand dunes and bushes, a went through his neck. Quickly attaching strings to the dead Shinobi's body, Sasori cleaned the blood and used the dead body as a puppet. Hey, Hoki, what was there? Another Shinobi questioned. Hello? He tried again. But to his dismay, no answer came. Are you L. Before the sentence could be completed, there was a passing through his neck in a rather familiar fashion. All the other guards surrounding the beast were given similar deaths. Get to your work, Didara. Sasori stated. Hi hi. Didara said and took into the air. Holding a lot of clay structures, he threw them all down on Shukaku. Curious about this new substance falling on him, the one-tailed beast tilted his gigantic head. What is this? He questioned in a deep voice, trying to take hold of the substance falling on him. Art is an explosion. Didara said, causing all the clay to blast. The knockback effect of the clay at such close proximity caused even the one-tailed beast to fall on its rear. Seeing the opportunity and grabbing the chance, Didara jumped down from his bird, straight towards the downed beast, seal in hand. Wind style. Wind bullet. The tailed beast exclaimed, sensing the danger. As the large wind bullets were launched at Didara, he had to change his trajectory. Summoning his clay bird again, he took into the air once more. Now, fully aware of the danger, Shukaku summoned a large blob of sand to do his bidding. The sand shot off towards Didara, capturing him fully. Sand coffin. Shukaku said, willing the sand to squeeze him to death. It squeezed, but no blood came out. Regardless, a large explosion did come out. Looking around for his enemy, the one-tailed beast was not expecting someone to fall on his head. So, when Didara did, he was caught off guard. Slapping the seal on the beast's head, Didara took a breath of relief. Now, he could just carry it off. I am off, my man Sasori. Didara said, cheerfully. The one-tailed beast being dragged by two clay birds. But, before Sasori could reply, he had to dodge a purple blur. Back up. Sasori questioned, flipping back to a comfortable distance. Um, maybe. Who knows. Naruto said. Well, conversations apart, I have a tailed beast to rescue. So, can you let me be? Naruto questioned. No can do. You are Naruto Uzumaki, of the nine-tailed beast, are you not? Sasori questioned. Maybe, who knows? Naruto replied. Well then, it looks like we are getting two in one day. Sasori said, flipping backwards and hunching forward in an awkward stance. Wanting to test his opponent's speed, Naruto released a barrage of kunai towards the awkwardly hunched shinobi. To his astonishment, Sasori did not dodge. The kunai graced his cloak and tore through it, causing it to fall off of his body. And well, now Sasori's posture made sense. He was crouching on all fours, a metal tail waving behind him, compartments visible on his face and body. You're one ugly human. Naruto said. At this point, I am hardly a human. Sasori replied. As he said that, his mouth opened to impossible proportions, and a barrage launched through it. Dodging the pointy weapons, Naruto caught one between his fingers. Analyzing the substance on top of the while simultaneously dodging the Naruto, concluded that they were coated in cobra venom. And yes, they were very deadly for the chakra system. Deciding that he shall not grace his body, Naruto flipped back and willed four chains from his back, rotating them to form a temporary shield to deflect all the Concluding that smashing him was the only viable option, Naruto flickered towards his opponent. With chakra concentrated in the center point of his palm, he made contact with his opponent. And. Boom. A large crater formed on the ground, shattering the body into millions of pieces. But, contrary to what he had thought, the match was not over yet. Through the shattered body, another body came out, dressed in a pitch black cloak, blue strings visible from his fingertips. Am, who are you now? Naruto questioned. I am the master, what you destroyed was just a puppet. Sasori said, dramatically pulling the cloak from his body. And well, the dramaticness was worth it, because, out came a young man, probably Naruto's age, with red hair and brown eyes. Well, since you have pushed me this far, I will show you a piece of my art that gave me actual struggle while collecting it. He said, unscrolling the scroll in his hand. Once the content of the scroll was released, there stood a tall man, he had blue hair, yellow eyes and was dressed in a brown rag. The third Kazakiage, is he not? Naruto questioned. He was the third, yes. But now, he is just an art in my collection. Sasori said, launching the puppet towards Naruto. Seeing the puppet transform its arms into blades, Naruto flipped back to avoid getting poisoned. Only when Sasori thought that he was having an advantage and he could win the fight using the iron sand release of the Kazakiage, purple glowing chains burst out from the ground around the puppet of the Kazakiage. And, before he could react, a purple ball of chakra formed over each chain in an instant and drilled into the body of the Kazakiage. Once the smoke was settled, all that remained of the puppet Kazakiage was dust. This angered Sasori a lot. 
And, if his stoic face could express any emotions, it would have been scowling right now. Do you understand what you have done? My flawless art which took years upon years to construct, and you destroyed it. Sasori said, unable to provide justice to his emotions due to his permanently stitched face. Did you expect cherry blossoms in a fight? Naruto countered. Well, regardless, your body will be a worthy replacement for the loss you have caused. Sasori said. But that said, Sasori started to remove his cloak. Slowly but surely revealing the horrendous things he had done to his body. The most visible were the segments on his chest, just like a puppet. The left side of his chest had a cylindrical structure embedded in it, his stomach was open, through which a metal wire had come out. From his back, two metal rods were peeking out, which further divided into blades. Naruto could instantly feel the abundance of chakra in the cylindrical structure and the lack of chakra in his rest of the body. So, he had his target. Without wasting any time, Sasori raised his hands, out of which two pipes peeked out. And, from them, fire started to spray. Earth style. Earth wall. Naruto said, defending himself from the flames. Seizing the opportunity, Sasori sent the poison clad wire of his towards the earth wall to pierce through it. Sensing the wire approaching, he let it stab through the wall. Jumping over the wall, he grabbed the wire from one hand and pulled Sasori towards him. On his other hand, a small purple sphere of chakra formed, a tenth of the size of his original. But, its eyes was not its only uniqueness. From the small sphere, four, shuriken-like blades, were protruding, generating a whistling sound. As soon as Sasori reached him, he slammed the ball of chakra into the left side of Sasori's chest and separated his head from his body at the same time, using his chains, of course. Wind style. Mini Rasen Shuriken. He said as he jumped back. And, as soon as he landed back, the small ball of chakra enlarged and engulfed the whole body of his enemy. Breaking him from every possible angle, never to be seen again. Informing that there were no more tricks and tired of using his sage mode to such an extent, he willed his purple chakra to sink down, tapping into his usual state. And, as soon as he was done with transforming back, Sanadi, followed by the Kazakiyaj and her Anbu battalion arrived there. What happened? Sanadi questioned. Sasori of the Red Sand engaged me in a fight, I managed to kill him. He said, raising the head he had separated to full view. But, his partner managed to drag Shikaku away. He concluded. Well then, we need to follow him. The Kazakiyaj butted in. Of course. He went down south. Naruto said. Sasori is no longer in possession of the ring. An authoritative voice said. Is he dead then, Pain-sama? Zetsu questioned. What happened, Dadara? Pain questioned. Un, I don't know. He looked fine to me last I saw him. Dadara replied. Regardless, since you are the only one physically present there, you will escape now. We cannot afford to lose two of our ranks in just one day. Pain ordered. Whatever you say. I am off then, un. Dadara said, preparing to leave. The rest of us will begin to extract the one-tailed beast's chakra. Itachi, kiss him, the two of you will use the shape-shifting technique to delay the rescue team. Pain ordered. Yeah. Kiss him said and Itachi just nodded. Chapter 24 Running towards the large pathway created by the body of Shukaku being dragged, the team consisting of Naruto, Sanadi, Tamari and her Anbu platoon, Naruto was pretty confident of their victory. But, that was only until he saw a pair of two standing in their way. One was a short black-haired man with stress lines running on his face, and the other was a tall, well-built man who was blue in color. Itachi Uchiha, the big bad bujiman of the elemental nations, and Hashigaki Kisum, the tailless tailed beast. Naruto could recognize them from their appearance, but not from their chakra. The last time he saw them, the blue guy had so much chakra that he could at least rival the one-tailed beast in the sheer amount of it. And, as insignificant as Itachi's chakra amount felt in front of him, it was nothing to scoff at. But, right now, it felt like they barely had any chakra compared to their past selves. From the amount of chakra you possess, it looks like you are on the verge of dying. Naruto said, as the rescue squad stopped in front of the Akatsuki duo. What sort of is this? Naruto questioned again. I don't think we will share any sort of information with you. Itachi said, pointing his fingers towards Naruto, his eyes blazing red. Sorry, but these elementary tricks are a bit too old school now. Naruto said, his native sage chakra not letting Itachi's take effect. Maybe not on you. But, the people behind you are not like you. Itachi said. And, true to his words, the Kazakiyaj and her squad collapsed in a thud. It is a 2v2 then Hokage-sama. Naruto said, falling into his fighting stance. Hmm. I suppose. I will take the blue one. Sanadi said, and rushed to engage the said blue guy. Not wanting to exert his body anymore by overusing his sage mode, Naruto stayed in his base form. If push came to shove, he would just tap into his partial transformation to preserve his body for the next inevitable fights. Regardless, with the amount of chakra this Itachi had, he probably would not be a big threat. Not as big as Asori had been, at least. Higher style. 
Phoenix Flower Jutsu. Itachi said, releasing a bunch of small fireballs. Earth style. Earth Dragon Jutsu. Naruto exclaimed, forming a dragon made of earth who protected him from all the attacks and proceeded towards Itachi. Fire style. Fireball Jutsu. Itachi said, blowing up the dragon's head. In response to this, Naruto concentrated his chakra in his hand and punched the ground, causing the ground below to ripple and form earth spikes towards Itachi. Trying to dodge the attack, Itachi leaped into the air. And, as soon as he did that, two chains erupted from the ground and bound his legs. Now, bound and stuck in mid-air, he could do nothing against what Naruto had thrusted into his stomach. Just when Naruto thought that fight was over, the Itachi he had struck dissolved into crows. You have certainly improved. Itachi said from behind him, a kunai on his neck. But not good enough. Itachi was cut off when the body in front of him glowed white and exploded. Exploding shadow clone. Naruto said, rising from the ground. Yeah, now he was sure that this was not actually Itachi. No S rank would fall for this. And, well, the body that remained was not of Itachi. So, how was it? Naruto questioned. He was not actually Kissim. He was using someone else's body to channel a tiny amount of his powers through it. Sanadi said. Same with Itachi. Naruto said. Well, regardless, let's wake them up now. Naruto continued, looking towards the down Suna Shinobi. Hi. Naruto and Sanadi said simultaneously, touching the down shinobi and wavering their chakra. W what happened? Tamari questioned, instantly waking up. You fell into eight Sanadi said. And what of the Akatsuki? Tamari questioned. They were using some technique to project themselves into another's body. We defeated them quickly enough since they lacked the original's full power. Sanadi said. Well, regardless. She continued, we must keep moving. Sanadi concluded. Yes, we should. Tamari said, preparing to leap. Hold it, we can fly from now on. Naruto said, biting his thumb. The summon. Why didn't you use it before? Tamari questioned. You wouldn't want to crash land because my summon got dust in its eyes, would you? Naruto said, slamming his hands down on the land. As the poof of smoke cleared, a large owl became visible. Please, carry us through this trail. Naruto said, pointing towards the large track formed by the one-tailed beast. As you order. Please get on my back. The owl said, getting as low as it could. A seal. Sanadi said. Naruto along with the others were standing in front of a cave. The cave's entrance was covered with diagonal seals. The formation of the seals formed an X pattern with a circle in its center. It is a four-point safety seal. All the four keys of the seal will have to be deactivated at the same time for this to open. Sanadi explained, analyzing the seal. I doubt we have enough time for that. Tamari said. Don't worry. Every seal needs chakra to function. I will just absorb all the chakra from the seal. Naruto said, a chain erupting from his back. Touching the seal with the tip of his chain, Naruto began to drain the chakra from the seal. There was a lot of it, but eventually, the seal array shattered away. We are ready to go. Naruto said and Sanadi launched a punch which shattered the opening of the cave. Entering the cave, it looked massive. In the center of the cave, lay the one-tailed beast, visibly shorter than before. And, surrounding it, were seven holographic figures. Realizing that the Akatsuki was trying to seal away Shikaku's chakra, Naruto lunged towards the seal array to destroy it. And, as the seal array was broken, the sealing consequently stopped. Naruto Uzumaki. A voice said. Meeting the purple gaze of the voice with his own golden ones, a certain heaviness settled in the cave. You won this time. But soon, I will be coming for you. And, mark my words, you will meet your end when the time comes. He said and the holographic figures dissolved into nothingness. The cave had fallen into silence only for a second, after which a growl came out from Shukaku's throat. As small as the tailed beast had gotten, it was still terrifyingly bigger than the humans around it. Only on his survival instincts, a bunch of chains shot from Naruto's back and wrapped around the tailed beast, suppressing its chakra. Calm down. We are here to protect you. Naruto said, trying to calm the giant raccoon down. Naruto. A voice said in his head. Yes. Naruto asked. Then turn to your mindscape. The voice said. I am currently busy, if you cannot see for yourself. Naruto replied. Just do as I said. The voice growled. Fine. Naruto huffed, closing his eyes and taking a cross-legged stance. Just as Naruto fell into a state of meditation, the raccoon calmed down too. I swear, if anything goes wrong out there, you are dead meat, Kaiubi. Naruto said. If you stop shouting like a mindless ape and look around you, you will realize what happened. Kaiubi said. Following what the Kaiubi had said, he looked beside him. And promptly fell on his rear. Why, you ask? Because there was a one-tailed beast beside him. And, it was looking quite pissed. You did not seal me inside of you, did you? Shukaku growled. He did not. As things are, he is bound to me. Kaiubi said. Kurama? Shukaku questioned. Ahahaha. 
the beast fell into hysterical laughter. It is so great to see the great nine-tailed beast in the clutches of a human. Shukaku said, chuckling. Stop laughing like a lunatic. For your knowledge, I can break out of here at any time. But, I chose to be here. Kaiubi said. And, why would that be? Shukaku questioned, not believing the Kaiubi. He is a sage, a perfect one. Not seen since the first and then, Hashirama. I am interested in seeing what he does firsthand. Kaiubi said. A sage, you say? Shukaku asked. Yes. He actually used to fight your previous jailer. Kaiubi said. Um, so this is the same brat who shortened my entertainment time back then. Shukaku said, narrowing his eyes. Shut up. Kaiubi growled. You know what to do, don't you? Kaiubi said. How do you know he is the one? Shukaku questioned. I do not. On the contrary, I am pretty sure that he is not the one that the sage had idealized. You have to accept that he was too optimistic. The last one, the first Okage, used his powers to suppress us. He was too idealistic, and his personality led to three wars and a century of us being prisoners. As things are, we lack time. Someone has discovered a way to seal us in the, and he is probably the only one who I can trust with those powers. Kaiubi said. I see. The one-tailed beast said, looking at Naruto in a scrutinizing manner. Naruto, on the other hand, was completely out of the loop. He did not understand what the two beasts were talking about. And, apparently, the Kaiubi had a name. Kurama. Naruto asked. You never told me you had a name. Naruto said. You never asked for it. Regardless, that is not what we are here for. Kurama said. Then, why are we here? Naruto questioned. Shukaku. Kurama said. Fine, fine. Shukaku huffed, raising his paw and making a fist of it. Realizing the gesture, Naruto bumped his fist with the giant raccoon. It was quite an awkward scenario. Six humans traveling on foot, followed by a giant raccoon, who was constantly growing in size. Shukaku had accepted to stay in the territory of Suna, provided that he would not be caged. And well, the Kazakiage was not against it. So, here they were. Traveling with a walking calamity. So, Kazakiage sama how much do I get out of this? Naruto asked, summoning the head of Sasori in one hand and a bingo book in the other. 150,000, eh? That's a lot of money. Naruto said. Indeed. Tamari said. Since you are associated with Konoha, the amount will be transferred to Konoha, and you will be able to collect your money from there. Tamari replied. Acceptable, Kazuki Ajisama. Naruto said, bowing. Chapter 25. So, what was all that about? Naruto questioned. Did you notice those purple eyes of his? Kurama questioned. The one who stared at me? Naruto asked. Yes. His eyes are very special. Kurama said. Is it special? Naruto questioned once again. Those eyes, if in possession of the right man, are the pinnacle of power. They were first wielded by the Sage of Six Paths, who used them to defeat the Ten Tails. Kurama explained. The Sage of Six Paths. The Ten Tails. I thought they were just a myth. Naruto said, flabbergasted. He is, or was, very real. Well, that is not the point. If you noticed, the Akatsuki was not sealing Shukaku away. They were sealing his chakra in a bigger husk. The or, when completed with chakra of all the nine-tailed beasts, the ten tails. The husk of the can only be summoned by one who wields the. I don't know about the others, but I do not wish to be contained inside of it. Kurama said. That is an ambitious dream you have. If those eyes are as strong as you say they are, how do you expect me to defeat him? Naruto questioned. Rinnegan is only a half of the sage's power. The other half of his immense powers existed due to his mastery of the sage mode. Kurama said. The sage mode? Like mine? Naruto asked. Yes, you are the perfect rival for a bearer of the. The yin and the yang, if you want to imagine it. But, your sage mode is not like the sage's was. His sage mode had unrivaled strength. But, I do not know the origin of those powers. The only possible way I can think of is his being the of all the. Hence, I want you to collect a sliver of chakra from all the other beasts. If what I think is true, your body will be able to regenerate and balance that chakra to give you an enhanced sage mode. The orange fox explained. And, you think the others will cooperate? Naruto questioned. He was questioning a lot today, he ideally noticed. They certainly will not. Some of them may still believe in the idol man that Sage had imagined to save them all. Shukaku only gave it to you because he is afraid of me, and honestly, dumb. But, you will have to take it with force if necessary, not only for my survival, but for yours too. Kurama said. I do not feel any different after absorbing Shukaku's chakra, though. Naruto said. I am not here to give away powers. I am the mediator between his powers and your chakra system. You will still have to prove your powers to me. Prove your worthiness. I will only release it in your chakra system when I deem you to be strong enough without it. Kurama said. The sigh left Naruto's lips. Yes, all this did sound a bit too sweet to be free. 
that is quite rare to see you around nowadays. Sanadi said. Ah, you just need to think of me and I will be here in a blink. Jiraiya replied. Shut it, you pervert. Why are you here anyways? Sanadi asked. I have news about Arachimaru's whereabouts. Jiraiya said, serious all of a sudden. And? Sanadi questioned. I am planning to deal with him once and for all. But, it is very likely that he would not be alone there. It is possible that he has already replaced his right-hand man, and it is possible that even the Achiha is with him. I don't know how strong the pair of them have gotten in these three years. So, I need a solid team for this mission. Jiraiya said. The Achiha? Sanadi questioned, recalling the boy. His teammate, Sakura if I am not wrong, has been appealing to release a search squad for him. Maybe she will be a good help for the mission. Her and the rest of Team 7 may be good help. Kakashi has certainly grown strong, at least. Sanadi said. I am not taking Jeninar on this. This will at least be S rank. I was thinking more along the lines of Naruto. Jiraiya said. Naruto has recently asked to be sent on a diplomatic mission to Kumo to convince them to form an alliance against the Akatsuki. So, I am afraid that he will not be available. Sanadi said. That is certainly disappointing. Regardless, I want to see how much stronger he has gotten. Can I meet him after our discussion is over? Jiraiya asked. Sure, he has moved really close to my place. More often than not, he is at my place. Sanadi said. Um, why is that? Why has he moved in so close, I mean? Jiraiya asked. Well, his reason for moving was convenient training. But, it has become a really handy place for him and Shizun to meet since they are dating. Sanadi explained. He is dating Shizun. Isn't she like 10 or so years older than him? Jiraiya questioned. Sanadi raised a delicate eyebrow. You leer at girls who can be considered your granddaughters. She said, her voice deadpan. Well, I suppose I have no room to speak. Regardless, let us get back to the topic. I will need a team, no doubt. Jiraiya said, drifting back to the topic. Um, how about Kakashi and Yamato? Sanadi questioned. Yamato? Jiraiya asked. The one with the wood release. Sanadi replied. Was he not called Tenzo before? Jiraiya questioned. He has been given several names. The current one is Yamato. Sanadi replied. I suppose that would be a solid team. Jiraiya said. Knock. Jiraiya was currently in front of Naruto's apartment, knocking for the fifth time. But, to his dismay, no one would open the door. Before he could tap on the door once more, a voice came from inside. Yes. Yes. I am coming. Stop knocking. What do you want? Naruto said while opening the door, looking irritated. Looking at the one standing in front of him, his mood did not turn any brighter. Naruto was looking disheveled. His red hair, messy. His t-shirt, missing. And his mood, sour. Ooh, did I interrupt something? Jiraiya questioned, a grin splitting his face. Yes. You did. What do you want? Naruto questioned, getting angry now. Well, I wanted to fight why dot the door was shut in his face before he could complete the sentence. Young impatient brats not respecting their elders. Jiraiya grumbled, walking away from the apartment. He had to peep, research, now anyways. Are you sure that you don't need anyone else? Sanadi questioned. Yes, we are not expecting any danger to begin with. And if push came to shove, I am sure that I can at least escape with Shizun. Naruto said. Boink. And Tauntin, of course. Naruto said, a sweat drop appearing on his face. Well, if you say so. Be careful. Sanadi said. Of course. Boink. Naruto, Shizun and Tauntin chorused. Walking towards the Iron Country, Naruto felt like he was on a vacation rather than a mission. There was a very lenient time limit for the mission. So, Naruto and Shizun were just walking in silence, holding hands and enjoying their time in general. It was a perfect scenario, and everything would have continued to be perfect if it wasn't for. Boink. Hungry? Shizun asked, caressing the pig's head in Naruto's arms. Boink. It said, opening its mouth wide. Shall we set the camp then? Shizun asked, looking around for a nice place to stay. I suppose. Naruto said. Well, it was almost night anyways, so they might as well take some rest. Naruto created four shadow clones to set up the camp and look over Tauntin and Shizun while he himself went to search for food. Ideally, he would not leave himself, but there was something he wanted to check for himself. Come out now, will you? Naruto said, seemingly to nobody. So, you can sense me? A deep voice said, from right behind Naruto. On instinct, four chains shot out from his back, right into the man's stomach. But, to his astonishment, no blood rushed out. Looking behind him, the chain had gone through the man's stomach, but it was looking like it had phased through it. Looking upwards, the man was dressed in the Akatsuki cloak and had an orange mask covering his face. Seeing the Akatsuki cloak, Naruto flipped backwards, creating some distance. Don't worry. I am not here to catch you. Yet. The man said. So, why are you here then? Naruto questioned, still cautious. 
I just wanted to see how well you have grown. And, from the looks of it, you have grown pretty well. The man said. Why thank you. Killing the likes of you has been my only motivation through and through. Naruto said. Do not misunderstand. You are hardly a match for me as things are. I am here to warn you, I know what you are trying to do. Stay away from our goal, and you will be the last one to die. Get in our way, and I will finish you. The masked man said. Pretty big words you have there. Care to back it up? Naruto said. Not yet, no. As things are, you are necessary alive. But, remember, if you get in our way, I will show no mercy. With that said, the masked man disappeared in a swirl emerging from his soul eye. Chapter 26, State Your Reason for Visiting. The guards on the gate chorused. Probably had the most number of gate guards that Naruto had seen. Two visible, and nine hiding nearby. They had hidden well. Out of sight, at least. But, Naruto could just sense them. He supposed being able to sense emotions on top of being a sensor type was sort of cheating. We represent Konoha. We have a meeting scheduled with Reikage Sama. Naruto said. Uzumaki Naruto and Kato Shizun? The guard questioned, looking at his book. Yes. Naruto said. Well then, please enter the village. These people will guide you to your room. As he said that, two Kumo Shinobi flickered in front of them. We will let you know of the timings for your meeting. He concluded. Very well. We will be in your care. Naruto said, following the Kumo Shinobi. Kumagakur, as a village, was more modern than the others. Not technology-wise, but infrastructure-wise. There were several sky-high buildings connected by bridges, tall buildings and all in all a well-thought-out infrastructure. Please, do not leave the room unless you are asked to. Security reasons, I hope you understand. Their guide Shinobi said as they reached the building they were supposed to stay in, bowing. Of course, we understand. Thank you for the hospitality. Naruto said, mirroring the bow. What do you mean we cannot join, Kakashi-sensei? Sakura asked, furious. It is a S-rank mission. No one but elite and high-ranking Anbus are allowed to take those sort of missions. Kakashi explained. He understood how she felt. But, really, he could not do anything to justify Sakura and Chaoji being on the mission. As strong as his students had gotten, they were nowhere strong enough to stand in front of the likes of Arachimaru. But this is what we have been training for. I am sure I can make him understand that what he is doing is wrong. Sakura exclaimed, unbelieving of the atrocity that Kakashi was spouting. I know that. But, I am not the Hokage, Sakura. There is no way for me to justify your presence in a S-rank mission. Kakashi said, trying to not hurt her even more. Well then, I will talk to the Hokage. Sakura said, explaining her simple solution. Really, you should be just grateful that he has not ordered us to kill him. Don't go and make things worse, Sakura. Kakashi said. Why would she want to kill him? He is a ninja of the hidden leaf. Sakura shouted, flabbergasted. At this Kakashi's eyes narrowed. Get this out of your head, Sakura. He is not a shinobi of the hidden leaf anymore. He is currently working under, perhaps, the worst criminal produced by the Hidden Leaf. Do not make things any more difficult for him and yourself. I will try my best to get him back. But, if he is hell-bent on remaining a traitor, I will do what I must. Bakashi said, ending the conversation and flickering away. So, Jurei sama are you prepared? Kakashi asked, his ever-present book open. Yes. But, this is going to be hard regardless of how prepared we are. Jurei said. Indeed. Where is Yamato, though? Kakashi asked, looking towards a tree suspiciously. True to his suspicion, from the tree, emerged a man. I was here on time, unlike the pair of you. Yamato said. My, my. You need to calm down, Yamato. We have a lot of time for this. Kakashi said. Time is something we hardly have. That snake changes his dens as often as we change our clothes. Yamato scoffed. My, we don't want to start this mission on a bad note, do we? Kakashi said. Well, if the pair of you are quite done with your bickering, shall we start with our journey? Jiraiya asked. Of course, Jiraiya sama We will follow your lead. Yamato said. Fine then, here goes nothing. Jiraiya said, leaping towards the trees nearby. So, Shizun, when do you think we will be called for the meeting? Naruto questioned. Knock. Ah, here we go, Naruto. Shizun said, waking up from their bed. Naruto and Shizun had almost rested for a day now, and since there was someone knocking on their door, the meeting was probably going to begin in a while now. Yes. Naruto asked, opening the door. Lord Rakage has summoned you. The shinobi on their door informed them. Sure, lead the way. Naruto said, stepping out of the room with Shizun. A very good evening to you, Rakage sama Naruto said, him and Shizun bowing. A good evening to you too. Have a seat. The Rakage said. Once they were settled, the Rakage started again. So, I hear you wanted to make some sort of alliance. Rakage asked. Indeed. Are you aware of the organization named the Akatsuki Naruto questioned? Yes, a bunch of S-rank freelancers if I am not wrong. The Rakage replied. 
correct to a certain extent. They used to be freelancers. But now, they have adopted a goal. They are trying to capture all the. For what cause, I am not aware of. But, they are too dangerous to be left unwatched. Hence, I want to extend a formal offer as the representative of Kanahagakur to form an alliance to deal with the Akatsuki. Naruto said. As dangerous as a group of S ranks can be, I have complete trust in the powers of my village. They have gained complete control over their tailed beasts and stand beyond any S ranks. I do not think the Kanoha will be of any help to us in such an alliance. The Rakage said. Ujido Nai, the Jinchuriki of the two-tailed cat, was pretty confident in her abilities to fight off any opponent. But, when she was returning from a, yet another, completed S-rank mission, she came across this duo dressed in black cloaks with red clouds over them. And, well, her confidence was broken. One was a black-haired man who could use all five chakra natures and just would not die, while the other was just flying around, dropping bombs on her whenever he felt like it. The pair of them were just playing with her. Even with the full might of the Nibi, there was nothing she could do. How she wished she had some summons who could work as messengers. You seem pretty confident regarding your rakage sama Naruto said, one eyebrow raising. I am. They are the strongest that Kumo has produced till date. The rakage said, proudly. I am the Jinchuriki of Kaiubi. With that title, comes the powers of sensing emotions. And on top of that, I am a sensor. Do you know what I can sense right now, rakage sama Naruto questioned, relaxing on his seat. What might that be? The rakage questioned. I can sense the chakra of Nibi being exerted, almost to the point of exhaustion now. The source of Nibi's chakra is feeling exhausted and afraid, and, from the rate at which the Jinchuriki's chakra is dropping, they are probably going to die soon. Naruto said, relaxing further, folding his hands and closing his eyes. Bam. Where is she? The rakage questioned, smashing the desk in front of them. I am not obliged to share anything with someone who is not our ally, rakage sama If that is all, we will take our leave. Naruto said, standing from his chair. The rakage's eyes narrowed. Call B. He said to his assistant and turned towards Naruto. You will tell me where she is right now. He said, electricity erupting from his body, his Anbu guards making their presence known. You seem to be misunderstanding your position, rakage sama He said, coming between the rakage and Shizun, purple chakra started to leak out of his body. Your, perhaps your village's biggest asset, is in danger right now, and I am your only way to her. He continued. If you want her location, you can officially enter into the treaty by signing this paper. He said, tossing the paper towards the rakage. Or else, we can leave. He concluded, finally releasing the full might of his sage chakra, dwarfing that of the rakage. At this, the sparks from the rakage's body vanished. Fine. He growled. Get me the ink. He shouted and one of his anbu scrambled to get the ink. Signing on the paper by taking support of a wall, because, well, there was no table for the support, he handed the paper to Naruto. Now, tell me, where is she? The rakage questioned, impatient. Thinking that the sign of the rakage was official and there was no game being played, Naruto said, 25 kilometers, down south. Pointing towards the said direction. And, in a second, both the window of the office and the rakage were missing. Picking up Shizun in his arms, princess style, Naruto also flickered towards the fighting scene for his personal agenda. Reaching on the fighting scene along with the rakage, both of them analyzed the scenery in a second. A guy with black hair was about to punch a blonde girl who was covered in blue chakra. Probably a knockout hit from what it looked like. In a split second, the rakage's fist connected to the black-haired man's face and Naruto's chains wrapped around the girl's waist, pulling her out of harm's way. Finally putting Shizun down, he laid the Jinchuriki of the two-tailed cat down, who fell unconscious as soon as she hit the ground. Of course, no one noticed Naruto's chain covered in the Nibi's chakra returning to his back. Once the chakra was secured, his hand started to glow green, healing the visible wounds on the girl's body. Shizun, please take over. I will have to join the fight. Naruto said, asking Shizun to take over the healing procedure. Of course. Shizun said, her hand starting to glow green too. Stretching his body, Naruto enters the battlefield. I suppose this will be our first fight against the Akatsuki as allies, Eirekage sama Naruto said, a small smirk visible on his face. Yeah, yeah. Just get on with it. The rakage said, grumbling. Before the fight could start, a man jumped down on the make to arena. He had dark skin and a muscular build, as well as white hair and a goatee. He wore oval-shaped sunglasses and a white-colored forehead protector. He also had his village's standard one-strap over one-shoulder flak jacket and a long, red rope belt tied around his waist, the standard kumo hand and shin guards, shinobi sandals, and a white scarf around his neck. Strangely enough, he also had seven swords strapped to his back. Yo. Say. Ho. You know my name, you know my fame, don't be lame. Eight tails, that's me, da, killer B. He said, rhyming his words for some reason. Ah, his other target. 
Naruto thought, sensing the pool of chakra within the tall man. Stop it, B. There is a serious confrontation going on here. The Rakage said, scowling. Three Jinchuriki at one place, un. I suppose we have dug a gold mine, Kakuzu. Dadara said, jumping down from his bird. I suppose. Kakuzu said. But that said, a heavy atmosphere settled into the battlefield as the fight was about to begin. Chapter 27 Deciding that revealing all his skills was really not necessary in front of possible enemies, Naruto decided to conceive his stamina and flipped back, letting the Rakage and the Jinchuriki have the stage to fight. Just waiting for B to release the Eight Tails Chakra. Double Ariad. Was the first shout of the battle, emerging from the mouths of the aforementioned duo. The pair rushed towards Dadara from different sides, their biceps trapping Dadara's neck from the front and the back. Unfortunately for them, the Dadara they had struck dissolved into clay and exploded. Having speed as his forte, the Rakage was able to flicker out of the blast area, while B was able to tank the explosion without any problem. Un, Kakuzu. Shall we retreat? This is looking dangerous. Dadara said, flying on his clay bird, realizing the mess they were in now. This is a golden opportunity. Three and four bounties. This is not the time to retreat. He said, black threats erupting from his joints. You sound greedy, Un. We don't even need the eight tails and the nine tails right now. He said, trying to convince Kakuzu. Shut up and fight. Kakuzu growled, his threads rushing towards B. True to his stature of being the best from the village of Kumagakur, B was able to dodge all the threads easily enough. Earth style. Earth grudge armor. Kakuzu said, forming an invisible armor over his body. Now certain of his defensive capabilities, he rushed towards B himself. Following Kakuzu's movements, B released the seven swords from his back and took a strange stance with them. As weird as the stance looked, it was effective. B was able to counter everything that Kakuzu threw at him and damaged him in return. Deciding to end the fight, B uses his superior strength to overpower Kakuzu and pass his sword through Kakuzu's heart. My fight is done, yo. Do you need some help with yours, bro? B questioned, shouting. But, before he could go assist his brother, the body of Kakuzu twitched and proceeded to wake up. Eh? I killed your body and saw the blood pool. How are you alive? Fool, you fool. B questioned. Not deeming the question worthy of his attention, Kakuzu started concentrating. In a split second, four monster-like structures erupted from his back. They were made up of the threads that he was using, each with a different mask on their face. Just as the four masks erupted out, one of them fell down in a husk. You took away my earth's heart. Now, you will compensate for it. Kakuzu said. Fire style. Fireball. Wind style. Wind bullet. He said, forming an artificial combination attack. Water style. Water wall. B said, forming a wall of water to protect himself. Jumping over the wall he had made, he released one of his swords towards one of the monsters. The sword passed straight through its mask, causing it to fall as a husk, just like its dead brethren. Wind style. Wind blades. Kakuzu shouted, one of the creatures releasing the said attack. Earth style. Earth wall. Naruto said, building an earth wall between the attack and B. Lightning style. Electromagnetic wave. Kakuzu shouted, releasing the said attack himself. But, before he could do anything further, a purple ball of chakra connected to his heart, destroying the third one. Realizing that its master was in danger, the wind mask settled into Kakuzu's chest, giving him one more life. Deciding to take the fight seriously now, B started to get shrouded in a red layer of chakra, tapping into his version 1 transformation. As an extension of his limbs, his sword started to glow in red chakra too. Rushing towards his target without wasting any time, B engaged Kakuzu with his swords. Cutting where he could, stabbing where he could, he managed to get Kakuzu down to one heart. Now, with his final heart in his chest, Kakuzu was regretting getting into this fight. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Kakuzu shouted, making a desperate attempt to survive. Naruto knew that B could dodge the attack easily enough, but this looked like the only time when he could have his chain absorb the Jayuki's chakra. So, he released a chain to wrap around B under the pretense of saving him from the fire attack and shoved a chakra-empowered punch straight onto Kakuzu's last heart, ending yet another Akatsuki member. The Rakage was furious. His strengths were to jutsu and ground-based speed. So, he could do nothing against a flying opponent. So, he engaged the Akatsuki member with a few ranged attacks he knew in the hopes that B, who knew many ranged attacks, would finish off the other member quickly and get this one too. But, when Dadara saw Kakuzu's last heart being destroyed, he flew away, untouched. At least Yujito was safe, that was something to be happy about. What took you so long, B? The Rakage asked, furious. The fool won't lay down. So, I had to make him stay down. Man had five hearts, he just wouldn't die, T was so hard. B said, explaining the fight with his rap. The other one escaped. The Rakage growled. You should be happy that you are safe, Rakage-sama. Naruto butted in. 
Shizun is probably done healing her. He explained. Where is she? The rakage asked, calming down. Back in the woods. Naruto said. Let us get there. He concluded and started to move, the rakage and B following him. Is she fine, Shizun? Naruto questioned, walking towards her. Yes. Most of her injuries were healed by those within her. I treated her superficial injuries. Shizun explained. That is good. Is she stable, though? Naruto questioned. Mostly. She is suffering from severe chakra exhaustion. She will be fine, but will probably need to rest for a week. Shizun said. Parry her, B. The rakage said. I must thank the pair of you for the help you provided. He said to Naruto and Shizun. It is our pleasure to help our allies. Naruto replied. Yes yes. Don't remind me of that. The rakage scowled. Kukuku, Jiraiya. Now, you can either retreat and save little Yamato, or try to fight me and cause his death. Arachimaru said. Jiraiya really wanted to finish off Arachimaru right now. But, Sasuke had managed to hurt Yamato severely, while Kakashi was distracted by Arachimaru's summons. That was not to say that Yamato was the only one with injuries. All the five men in the clearing were bleeding profusely. But as things were, he could now order Kakashi to leave with Yamato, but that would lead to Sasuke either trying to catch up to them or join forces with Orochimaru to kill him. He was sure that he could take on Orochimaru, but a sliver of help could change the tides. Fine. Jiraiya growled. Kakashi, carry Yamato. He said, looking at Kakashi. Do not think that this is the end, Orochimaru. We will meet again, and the next time, it will only be you and me. He said, turning back to Orochimaru. Of course, Jiraiya Kun. I will be waiting for you to catch up. Like always. He said and disappeared in a puff of smoke with Sasuke. Come on. We need to give him instant medical attention. Jiraiya said. Yes, Jiraiya-sama. Kakashi replied. So, have you read all the conditions of the agreement again? Naruto questioned. Yes. I have. The rakage said. As per the agreement, we will send all the data we have on any of the Akatsuki's members, against the same courtesy from Konoha. He said. Yes. I am already carrying all the information we have. Naruto said, offering a scroll to the rakage. I see. I will try to have the data gathered by this afternoon. You can rest in your hotel till that time. The rakage said. Thank you for your compliance and hospitality, rakage-sama. Naruto said, standing up. Don't sweat it. The rakage replied, dismissing them. Do you think that Tsunade sama will agree with how you made him sign the agreement? Shizun asked as they moved out of the rakage's office. She will probably laugh it off. Naruto replied, not much concerned about the consequences. He had already gained a lot from this mission. Firstly, he had gotten to know about an Akatsuki member who could go intangible. Secondly, he had gotten the chakra of two more Biju, causing the count to go up to four out of nine. And thirdly, he had got much time to spend with Shizun. I don't think so. Shizun said, her elbow hitting his stomach playfully. But, it was definitely cool. She concluded. Do you think so? Naruto questioned, grinning. No. I was only kidding. She replied, trying to control her laughter. Well then, Miss Funny. Shall we head to our room? Naruto questioned, exaggerating his actions. Hmm. I suppose we can. She said, just as playful. That makes four now. Naruto said. Four indeed. But, do you think that you will be able to get to the others before the Akatsuki does? Karama questioned. You know that for a fact that you being here at just the right time was only a coincidence. He said. Well, I can only try my best. Naruto said. I am going to request to be present on every Biju-related mission though. He concluded. That would certainly be helpful. Karama said. Do you think that I will have to go rogue if the Hokage finds out what I am doing? Naruto questioned. Humans have very thin margins regarding the good and the bad. What you are doing will look like you wanting to take over the village or maybe the elemental nations. Karama replied. I see. He sighed out and disappeared from his mindscape. But the enthusiasm you showed before the mission, I was expecting Orochimaru's head on my table. Tsunade said. We don't have his, but we could save Yamato's. Is that not enough? Jiraiya said. Don't make me sound like the villain. I did not even issue the mission. Well, regardless, what of the Acha? Tsunade questioned. He is somewhat of a rival to Kakashi in strength now. Jiraiya replied. I don't think he can defeat him just yet. But, he has certainly grown from the scrawny little genin he was. He concluded. That is another headache now. Tsunade sighed out, massaging her head. Everything will come around as it should, eventually. Jiraiya said, ever so optimistic. You would think that, wouldn't you? How about you try sitting on this chair then, huh? Tsunade questioned, her gaze piercing. Now. We can talk like mature people, can't we? Jiraiya said, forcing a smile on his face. Well, it turns out that Tsunade did not want to talk like a mature lady, so she punched him out of his office. Chapter 28 You actually managed to get him to sign the treaty? 
I was not expecting that. Tsunade said, her eyebrow raising. To her, the fourth rakage was the most childish of all the cage. The only way to convince him about anything was to prove that you are very strong, and according to him, if you are strong, you are right. His approach was. Unique. But, it worked nonetheless. Shizun said. Unique, how? Tsunade questioned. He blackmailed the rakage into signing the treaty. Shizun said. On this, Tsunade's eyebrow rose. Blackmail is a heavy term. I gave him an offer that he could not refuse. Naruto said. And what might that offer be? Tsunade questioned, still sounding skeptical. I offered to tell him the location of his dying in exchange for him signing the treaty. It sounds fair to me. Naruto explained. Sounds fair to me too, yes. Tsunade said and Shizun groaned. Well, anyway. Tsunade continued. The mist has requested our help in sealing the three-tailed turtle inside of a lake. She said. And do we have a team ready? Naruto questioned. No, there is just no one who can suppress a tailed beast's chakra like you. I wanted to send you and Jiraiya on the mission, but Jiraiya is unavailable currently. She sighed. You can just give me a proper team with a preset ceiling array. I think we will be able to do it with or without Jiraiya. Naruto said. At this point, Shizun had already gone back to her duties of being Tsunade's assistant. That is, indeed, what I was thinking. But, I had to make sure of it. Tsunade said. And now that you have confirmed it, I can be assured. She concluded. What will be my team, and when do we leave? Naruto questioned. I do not know yet. I will have the team ready soon enough and let you know. Till then, you can have some rest. Tsunade said. Whatever you say. I will take my leave then. He said, flickering away. We are facing severe losses, Nagato. Toby said. How many times have I told you to not refer to me with that name? Payne said. That is of no concern, Payne. We have bigger issues to deal with. We do not have the possession of a single-tailed beast till now. Toby said. Yes. I will have Itachi and Kissam retrieve the one-tailed beast, you and Dadara go for the three tails, and I will go to Kumo for the two tails and the eight tails. Payne said. I suppose that will put us on pace. The nine tails has been a big thorn in our way though. Toby said. Indeed. I don't think anyone in our ranks other than you or I can capture him. Payne said. Yes, that is why you will capture him personally. Toby said, disappearing in a swirl emerging from his eye. Do you trust him, Nagato? A blue-haired lady asked, emerging from a swirl of papers. I do not. But, he is helping us further our goal. And, till he is helping us, we do not need to end him. Payne replied. I am just worried that he is playing a bigger game. The lady said. Don't worry, Conan. If push came to shove, I would kill him myself. Payne said. I suppose. She said, still skeptical. There is nothing more that you can teach me, Arachimaru. Sasuke said, his extended lightning blade piercing Arachimaru's hands. For the weakest of the Achihas, you speak a bit too boldly. Arachimaru hissed. Look at you, you call yourself legendary. You are nothing without your borrowed power. Sasuke said. You will never defeat Itachi without my help. Arachimaru replied, disregarding the taunt. I am stronger than you now. He said, the flames of the curse mark forming on his face. You came after me because you could not get Itachi, didn't it? He asked. You wanted an Achiha body so that you can extend your pathetic life, did you not? He continued. Well, as an Achiha, when I see you, all I see is an untalented worm clinging to its pathetic existence. He said, stabbing his sword in Arachimaru's neck. But, before the sword could make contact, Arachimaru's body turned into a giant snake, covered with smaller snakes. Give me your body. Arachimaru shouted, lunging toward Sasuke. Trying to switch bodies, trying to survive against all odds, knowing full well that the way of nature itself is opposing your desires. He said, slicing the snakes attacking him and pulling down the cloth covering his torso. I am going to have your body, Sasuke. He shouted again, just as wings erupted from Sasuke's back and his whole body turned darker. Sasuke proceeded to expertly dodge all the attacks drawn towards him. Dodging, slashing and attacking as the opportunity presented itself. There is no that comes close to killing a perfect being like myself. Arachimaru said, as the pair of them entered into a dark area, surrounded with darkness. Where am I? Sasuke questioned. This is where the transference ritual will take place. Arachimaru replied, forming out of thin air. Those eyes of yours will belong to me now. He said, as a slimy substance started to cover Sasuke's body. Sorry, but these tricks of yours will not work on me. Sasuke said. The atmosphere in the Hokage office was blatantly serious. Team 7, Niji and Genma along with Naruto, were given the task to seal the three-tailed beast, Isobu, for the Hidden Mist village. Niji will be your scout, Team 7 the frontline attackers, and Genma and Naruto will do the sealing. You will be under the leadership of Kakashi, followed by Genma and Naruto if things go wrong. Tsunade explained. Understood Hokage-sama. When do we leave? Kakashi asked. 
be leave by this afternoon. Since the Three Tails has not been seen till now, you have a time frame of five days to reach your destination. Make sure to not overexert yourselves while traveling, because the chances of things going wrong while the ceiling is very high. Tsunade said. Who will be the vessel Hokage-sama? Naruto questioned. I told you before, your task is to seal the beast inside of the lake it is emerged in, so that the Akatsuki cannot take it away, and the mist get some time to choose the perfect host. Tsunade said. And, we will be using the four-point sealing array. Genma intervened. I will leave the technicalities to you. Naruto said to Genma. Well then, we will depart for the mission Hokage-sama. Kakashi said. Turning to the team, he continued. Do all of you have your stuff ready with you? The chorus yes was heard, and everybody disappeared in a flicker. Deciding that it was not worth it to use his chakra to summon multiple owls to carry everyone on a mission that had a lenient time schedule, Naruto decided to stay quiet and follow the formation that Kakashi had asked them to follow. The journey towards the mist was quiet and awkward. Niji just wanted some isolation, Sakura was not an extrovert bird, Chaoji was content in eating his food, Genma was chewing his in a daze, Kakashi was in his happy happy world with his book, and Naruto was perfectly happy in his position at the rear. So, no one was having any conversation, and no one was daring to start one in such an awkward silence. So. Kakashi said, stopping, and consequently stopping everyone. We can take a good rest now. He said and turned towards Chaoji. Set the camps up with Sakura. Genma, set up the traps with Niji. Naruto and I will go get some food. He concluded. Hi. Chaoji saluted, preparing to set up the camps with Sakura. Yes. Genma and Niji said, leaving in different directions. Sure. Naruto said, prompting Kakashi to take the lead. Shall we catch some fishes? Naruto questioned. I don't have any rods and I am not in the mood of getting wet in such cold temperatures. Kakashi replied. Just as he said that, a chain came out of Naruto's back, its face towards Kakashi. Almost staring him in the eyes and asking him are you stupid? It is too blunt to catch a fish. Kakashi said, and just as he said that, the chain's top became pointed, the apex of the point still looking into Kakashi's old eye, and asking the same question again. A sweat drop formed on Kakashi's face. I suppose you are doing most of the work then. Kakashi said. Hmm. Naruto hummed, moving on the bank of the river in front of them. Just when they reached there, several chains erupted from Naruto's back and started doing their work. Okajsama recently told me about your parents. Kakashi said, out of nowhere. Why would she trust you with such information? Naruto questioned, not missing a beat. The fourth was my sensei. Your parentage was kept a secret because of the risks that came with being the son of the yellow flash. Kakashi said. And, why are you telling me that? Naruto questioned. I was told that their son had died. I was really angry at the third when I was told the truth. If things were ideal, I would have probably raised you. Kakashi said. Well, things are not ideal. They hardly are. There is nothing we can do to change that. Naruto replied. Indeed. But, thinking of the ideal scenario is a pleasing activity. Kakashi said. I have to disagree on that. On the contrary, thinking of the ideal scenario will make you lose your grasp on reality. Naruto said. Do this, Kakashi straightened. There had been nobody who had told him that his way of thinking was incorrect. Because, well, everyone strived to achieve their ideal life. Care to explain these thoughts of yours? Kakashi questioned, trying not to sound way too interested. I could think of endless good scenarios regarding my hypothetical life, but that will lead me to try to implement those philosophies in the real unfiltered world. And, I think that would be a disaster. Narita replied, explaining his outlook. Why do you say that? Kakashi questioned, curious about his outlook. Let us say, the fourth had survived and convinced the village that I was supposed to be this hero who is holding back the nine-tailed beast for them, and I get all the love and respect I ever wanted, that will make me want to become strong for their safety, and not my goals. Well that would be an honorary decision in my ideal life, if I consciously or subconsciously use the same motivation in this real world, that would be letting people walk all over me. Naruto said, giving words to his thoughts. That surprisingly makes a lot of sense. But, learning to differentiate between the ideal world and the real world is a very basic thing. Kakashi said, still defending his outlook. That is for someone who has a slow-paced life. For someone who is assured that he will wake up the next day. People like us, who may die at any moment, tend to strive towards perfection as soon as possible, since there is no certainty for tomorrow. And, in such a hurry, the lines of reality and fiction blur. Or maybe I am just stupid and do not understand the standard outlook. Naruto said. Maybe you are right, maybe you are not. But, you should not change your outlook for a general belief. Kakashi said. I haven't and I want. Naruto said. Till this time, there were several fishes and crabs out of the water for a hearty dinner. Chapter 29. Um, Dadara-senpai. Toby questioned. Dadara-senpai. He questioned again. 
Wait, is Dadara Senpai dead? He shouted and began to shake him violently. When will you shut up? Dadara shouted, bunking Toby on the head. The newly formed Akatsuki duo was flying towards the large lake in which the three-tailed beast resided. Their motive, to capture it. Dadara was really happy to work with the senior members of the Akatsuki, but now he was stuck with this childish brat. The but senpai, there are people ahead. Toby said, pointing towards their target area. I see, un. Dadara said, taking a thinking pose. What is the plan, senpai? Toby questioned, his voice, high-pitched. I will do the fighting, you will do the scouting. Dadara said. Woohoo. I will cheer on Dadara senpai. Toby said, summoning cheering pom-poms out of nowhere. Dadara could only groan at this. The tides are high, be prepared, the turtle can come out at any time. Kakashi shouted, prompting everyone to take their positions. It had taken the team from Kanoha three days to reach the mist village and an additional day to reach the site in question. Now, they were standing in front of a large water body in which the three-tailed beast resided. How are we going to do this? Naruto questioned Kurama. I am sure we can talk it out with Asobu. Just touch him and I will pull him inside of the mindscape. Kurama said. If you say so. Naruto replied and prepared for the confrontation. I will rush forward to calm it down before things go bad. Naruto shouted, rushing towards the now visible shell of the turtle. All right. The others, be prepared for any sort of failure. Kakashi shouted in response. Just as the shell of the turtle became visible, Naruto lunged to touch it, and Kurama pulled the both of them in their mindscape. Am I jailed already? The gigantic turtle sighed out. You are not. Not yet, at least. A voice came from behind the turtle. Kurama. The turtle questioned, turning around. Indeed. There is something I need to talk to you about. Kurama said. And what might that be? Isobu questioned. The Jido Mezo has been summoned again, and the one who has summoned it has the eyes of father. Kurama said. Is he that man, then? Isobu questioned, wondering if the prophesied man had appeared. No. The man is trying to recreate the Jubi by sealing our chakra into the husk. Kurama explained. Well then, it would not take very long for the prophesied man to show himself now. Isobu said, ever so hopeful. Have you not waited enough now? Accepted. Father is dead, and no one will look out for us now. I have chosen my Jinchuriki as the one worthy of the sage's powers. I hope you remember what your contribution will be in that. Kurama said. I would rather not. I am perfectly content in waiting for a bit longer for the man that father had idealized. Isobu replied. I do not care if you are content or not. I am not willing to get absorbed and become a mindless tool of destruction just because you are willing to wait. Either you depart from your chakra willingly or we force it out of you. Kurama growled. Calm down, now. That sliver of chakra has no value to me, I will regenerate it in a matter of seconds. But, I want to see the one you are talking about first. Isobu said, trying to calm Kurama down. Just as he said that, Naruto came forward from behind Kurama's paw. Hello, I am Yuzumaki Naruto. He introduced himself, bound. I am Isobu, the three-tailed turtle. Isobu said, laying down to Naruto's eye level. Tell me, what is your goal, human? Isobu questioned. As things are, survival. Naruto said, truthfully. Survival. Why is that? Is your life in any danger? Isobu questioned. Indeed it is. As Kurama said, the one who wields the has been seen, and he is actively trying to seal the tailed beasts into the Jido Mezo. If he comes for Kurama, and I am not strong enough, I will certainly die during the extraction. Naruto explained. I see. Isobu said. Fine then, I will entrust him with my chakra if you insist on him being our savior. The turtle said to Kurama. I never said that he is our savior. In fact, the only reason we are working together is because our goals of surviving align. But, he is the only one I can entrust with these powers. Kurama said. Very well then. He said, raising his large paw to form a fist. Before we go forward with this, I want you to know that we are going to confine you to this lake so that the Akatsuki cannot capture you. Naruto said. Akatsuki? Isobu questioned. The organization which is run by the man with the... Naruto explained. I see. That is acceptable then. Isobu said, still offering his fist. Aware of what the fist meant, Naruto did what he was supposed to do. Art is an explosion. Dadara shouted, scattering and blasting many clay birds in the lake below. We are being attacked, take cover. Kakashi shouted, prompting the team to get cover of the trees. In the ongoing chaos, Naruto's eyes met the empty gaze of the orange masked man. The same guy who could turn intangible at will. But, Naruto was not the only one who met his eyes. Niji, the scout of the team, did too. Where Naruto was able to negate the casted by him, Niji was not able to do so. So, with that deadly glance, Niji fell down in a heap. Now fully concentrating on Naruto, Toby tilted his head, as if inviting him in a fight. And, well, Naruto had no issues in obliging him. I will go after the other one. 
Naruto said. You will need backup. Kakashi said. No, securing the tailed beast is more important right now. Naruto replied and rushed towards Tobi. Tobi was only dodging when Naruto was coming too close, almost baiting him to follow him, taking him inside of the deep forest, away from the fight. Human tank bullet. Chaoji exclaimed, turning into a human boulder and launching himself into the air using the earth wall that Kakashi had created. Water style. Water bullet. Sakura said, releasing water bullets in the sky. Relying on his art to dodge all the attacks, Didara continued to create more small birds out of his clay and kept launching them towards his enemies. Lightning style. Lightning stream. Kakashi said, adding his to Sakura's, making it even deadlier. Caught off guard by the sudden increase in speed of the water bullets, the large bird was unable to dodge the combination attack and exploded on contact. However, this was not enough to get Dadara on the ground because, as soon as the bird exploded, he was ready with another one to keep flying. Unable to see any way to get Dadara down, Kakashi unleashed his Sharingan. I need cover, Genma. Kakashi shouted and started to concentrate on his Sharingan eye. Got you. Gemma said, slashing off any clay structure approaching them. It took Kakashi a few seconds, but when he opened his eyes, it had evolved from the standard three Tomo to a unique three-pointed shuriken. Prepare to attack, Genma. Kakashi said, his hand shutting his normal eye close to focus properly. And check your Sharingan. Kamui. Kakashi said, the strain on his eye almost audible from his voice. Just as he said that, a vortex formed around Dadara's arm. What is this? Dadara murmured, very confused. Oh. Kakashi shouted, and Genma launched into the air. The vortex that had presented itself had sucked Adara's arm away, and the loss of his arm distracted him enough for Genma to cover the distance without any problems. As soon as Dadara saw Genma releasing the fireball, he jumped off the clay bird. Genma, on the other hand, landed on the bird, thinking it was safe. A smirk came on Dadara's face. Kai. He said, causing the clay bird to explode. Kakashi sensei are you alright? Sakura asked, seeing Kakashi spread on the ground. I exhausted my chakra. Kakashi said. I will do what I can. She said, Chaoji, please carry him in the woods, I will get Niji. Yes. Chaoji said and started to pick Kakashi up, while Sakura rushed to get Niji to safety. Done, I suppose you are the last one left now. Dadara said, looking towards the tailed beast. You came to intervene in my task again, didn't you? Toby questioned. At this point, Naruto and Toby had gotten into a very isolated part of the forest surrounding the lake. You just laid down your conditions, I never said that I would follow them. Naruto replied. Were you born this mischievous, or did the lack of a parental figure cause this? Toby questioned, mocking him. For someone who is too insecure to show his face, you speak with way too much confidence. Naruto countered. Toby, Dadara has done his work. A voice came from the tree behind Toby, and from the tree a half-white and half-black creature grew out. That is pleasing to hear. Toby said to the creature. Well then, I will take my leave. Remember this, Yuzumaki, the only reason you are alive is because you are last in the queue. Rest assured, your time will soon come too. He said, turning towards Naruto. Running away like a coward again? Naruto said, trying to get more information out of him. Toby did not see any merit in replying and disappeared in a swirl. What happened? Naruto questioned, entering the fight scene. That blonde guy managed to hurt Genma, and Kakashi-sensei exhausted himself. He dragged away the three-tailed beast too. Sakura said. That is a victory in the Akatsuki's favor. Naruto murmured. Genma is seriously hurt, I cannot heal him, I only know the basics of medicine. Sakura said. Where is he? Naruto asked, his hands glowing green. Chapter 30. The mission was a failure Hokage-sama. The three-tailed beast was taken away by the Akatsuki, and Genma was hurt severely. Kakashi reported. Which team did you engage? Tsunade questioned. Naruto engaged a guy named Tobi, while the rest of us were fighting Dadara of Iwa. Kakashi said. The Sai escaped Tsunade. In a swift move, the Akatsuki managed to capture four of the nine beasts. She said, four? Naruto questioned, confused. Itachi and Kisum invaded the hidden sand to capture the one tail, then the Isobu fiasco. And, the two tails and the eight tails are missing from Kumo. The wreckage has called for the summit. Tsunade explained. That is. Concerning. Kakashi said. We do not even know about Iwa and Taki. And, the Jinchuriki of Six Tails had gone rogue from the mist, so we do not have any idea about him either. Tsunade said. Naruto did not much care about the Bijuu whose chakra he had already received, but the ones whose chakra he had not received were of concern to him. For a while, at least. Has the Gokage Summit been agreed upon by all the cage? Naruto questioned. It has been, yes. Tsunade said. And, the two of you will be my guards for the summit. She informed Kakashi and Naruto. When will we be leaving then? Kakashi questioned. By this afternoon. The pair of you can go and prepare your stuff now. 
Sanadi said. I cannot have a break, can I? Narita groaned. You can have all the breaks you want once the Akatsuki is dealt with. Sanadi said, prompting Naruto to leave her office. Walking in the dark hideout of Orochimaru without Orochimaru was a different feeling. Without any guide, you could get lost at every turn. But, Sasuke was used to these hideouts. He knew each turn, each corner, and each hidden tunnel. And, he knew where his potential team member was. He was in front of him, stuck in a glass chamber full of water. Splash. The water flew out with a slash of his sword. Sajetsu, are you not? Sasuke questioned. Yes. He said, his body forming out of water. I have killed Orochimaru and freed you. Now, you can either come with me or go on your way. Sasuke said, extending an offer to join his team. Well, I would sound ungrateful if I refused your offer now. Sajetsu said. Regardless, why do you need me anyways? He questioned. I am going to kill my brother, but he always works in pairs of two. I want my team to hold off the other one while I fight my brother. Sasuke explained. Well, I want to collect the seven swords of the mist. So, maybe I will join you for a while. He said. Very well. Sasuke said and started to move forward. Whoa there. Sajetsu said, getting behind Sasuke. You are not the boss here. I am not gonna take any orders from you. He said, pointing his fingers on the back of Sasuke's head. When Sasuke stared at him unflinching, Sajetsu stepped back. Yeah, it seems like you killing Orochimaru was no bluff. He monologues. I suppose I will follow your lead till I can get my hands on the seven swords. He concluded. Since all the five cage have arrived, I, Mifune of the Land of Iron, would like to welcome all the cages formerly. Hoe Kage Dono, Kazuki Dono, Mizukij Dono, Suchikij Dono and Reikij Dono, I would like to welcome you all to the Land of Iron. It is a pleasure. Sanadi said. Get on with it. The Reikij said. A wonderful welcome. Mizukij said, a hand on her lips. We are honored. The Tsuchikij said. We appreciate your welcome. The Kazakiyaj said. Well then, we should start with the topic of the summit. Since Reikij Dono had called the summit, we would request him to announce the content of concern. Mifun said. Something must be done about the Akatsuki. The Reikij stood up. Both my village and Chiriki have been kidnapped in a single day. He shouted. That sounds like an internal affair to me. The Tsuchikij scoffed. We are willing to provide any resources according to our treaty. The Hokage said. Then we know how many Jinchuriki have been captured already? The Mizukij questioned. Shukaku was taken away by the Akatsuki yesterday. The Kazakiyaj said. The Three Tails was taken by the Akatsuki, we are still looking for the Six Tails. The Mizukij said. The Nine Tails are safe and sound. Sanadi said. We are locating Han and Rashi, our Jinchuriki. The Tsuchikij said. The Kigakur had sent a report stating that the Seven Tails are safe. Mifune said. Both our Jinchuriki are missing. The Reikage said. The losses look severe as of now. The Mizukage said. As I have said before, you are your internal concerns. The Gokage summit should not have been called for a private village matter. The Tsuchikage scoffed. Are you, perhaps, trying to defend the Akatsuki? You have had previous relations with them, haven't you? The Kazakiyaj said. We had strictly professional relationships with the organization. And, if anything, the most suspicious party here is the Hidden Leaf. Their Jinchuriki is the only one who is safe, and it is quite clear that the strength of the leaf is wavering. The Tsuchikage said, pointing towards Tsunadi. Our shinobi are the ones who have killed most of the Akatsuki members. And, you should not be one to speak about strength when our single shinobi was able to kill your whole army. Tsunadi said, raising her voice to defend her village. That blasted forth of yours was a monster. And, with his death, your village has grown weak. It looks like you are the one capturing the tailed beasts for your own benefits. The Tsuchikage scoffed. We are the only ones who have done something against the Akatsuki. Well you are the only ones who have worked with the Akatsuki. So, mind your tongue and position while talking about my village. Tsunadi said. Em. Mifune scoffed. Let's not divert from the subject of concern. He said. Before anything more could be said, a black vortex opened in the room and out came a familiar masked man. In a split second, all the guards of all the cages were on the table, in front of their respective cages. You are still alive, little Anoki. The masked man questioned. Who might you be? The aforementioned cage questioned, still relaxed on his seat. It is saddening to think that you have forgotten me. I did not believe myself to be a relic of the past just yet. He said. Indulge us then, tell us who you are. Enoki said. I am. Ichiha Madara. The masked man announced, and silence ruled the room. In an instant, all the cages were standing, in their fighting position. It is great to see that my name still brings fear. Regardless, we meet again, Yuzumaki Naruto. He said, a red glow suddenly coming out from the hole of the mask. Indeed. Have you come to finally fight me now? Naruto questioned, his chains shivering in excitement. Me? No. I am just an observer. 
your fight will be with someone else. The masked man said and stepped back, just in time to avoid an orange blur colliding with him. Almighty push. The said orange blur shouted, his hands together, and a great force of gravity originated from him as the focal point, destroying the building and sending everyone in the proximity flying back. In the split second he got, Naruto wrapped a chain around Sanadi and Kakashi's waist and implanted one in the ground to keep themselves stable. Well then, Yuzumaki. The next time we meet, you will be chained and your biju will be extracted from you. Until next time. He said and disappeared in a swirl. Before anyone could try to follow the Achiha, five more orange-haired shinobi landed on the ground, each flashing a pair of eyes. Chapter 31, Summoning Jutsu. The orange-haired lady shouted, summoning a large three-headed dog to engage the guards of the cages. Lightning style. Lightning cable. Kakashi shouted, forming a lightning cable with his clone and splitting the summon in two. But, to his horror, both the halves of the summon regenerated and now there were two dogs instead of one. Article style. Atomic dismantling jutsu. The Tsuchikid shouted, trapping the dogs into transparent cages and disintegrating them. Catching the opportunity, Kakashi tried to speed blitz the summoning path using his Jidori, but he had to flip back to avoid the missile launched by the Asura path. It seemed like the six orange-haired shinobi could see everywhere. No matter from which direction you attack, they would dodge it like you were attacking them up front. Where is my brother? The Raikid shouted and attacked the Naraka path, but before his lightning-cloaked body could touch the Naraka path, the pre-top path intercepted the Raikage and started absorbing his chakra. Realizing that his chakra was getting absorbed, the Raikage got himself free from the grasp of the pre-top path and flipped backwards, summoning Jutsu. Another cry came out on the field, and after a large poof of smoke, a gigantic rhino was seen. The Raikage, with electricity surrounding his body once more, rushed head first into the battle once again, throwing hands with the pre-top path, who was constantly absorbing his lightning cloak every time they made contact. The rhino, on the other hand, was causing havoc in general and protecting its summoner as it was necessary. Lava style. Lava stream. The Mizukage said, releasing a rush of hot lava from her mouth, bathing the rhino in lava. The rhino thrashed and turned, but ultimately dispelled after killing several samurai by slamming its large body on them. My, my. These summons are quite dangerous. Chijiro, dear, would you mind swinging your sword here a bit? The Mizukage said. Why yes, ma'am. As you say. The Mizukage's guard stuttered out, unleashing his legendary sword. Wind style. Wind gust. Tamari shouted, releasing a gust of wind towards the pre-top path. But, like before, they were absorbed like every other one before. Tell me where the eight tails is. The human path questioned. You were the one who took him. C replied. Tell me now, or I will rip your soul out of your body. The human path warned. You were the one who took him away. C shouted, terrified from the threat. Not liking the answer he got, the human path stayed true to his threat and snatched his soul out of his body to investigate the truth. What did you do to him? Derry shouted, swinging his large sword towards the orange-haired man. But, like before, the path managed to dodge the attack without actually seeing it. In a split second, Sanadi landed an earth-shattering punch on the ground, and well, it shattered the ground and disbalanced the human path in front of them. Ceasing the opportunity, Derui swung his black lightning-covered sword towards the human path. Even when being able to see it, the human path was unable to dodge due to being disbalanced, so it ended up in two. Standing in front of the diva path, with a newly arrived Naraka path, Naruto could feel the staggering amount of chakra they possessed. Realizing that he would not be able to deal with this foe in his base form, he willed his sage chakra to take over. Yuzumaki Naruto, surrender yourself and you will not suffer any pain. The diva path said. I was thinking more along the lines of ripping you apart. Naruto said, his body getting surrounded in purple. There is nothing you can do in front of the power of a god. The diva path replied. You think of yourself as a god. Naruto questioned, his eyebrow raising. I wield the eyes of the samsara, the eyes of the sage of six paths himself. What lesser being can I be? The diva path questioned. Well, I suppose I will become a god slayer, then. Naruto replied. Your goals are ambitious, but the reality is that you will be captured today. The orange-haired man said. Before anything else could be said, a silent universal pull. Came out from the diva path's mouth, and Naruto was pulled towards the outstretched hand of the diva path. Summoning four chains and planting them into the ground to prevent his neck from getting in the path's hand, Naruto formed hand seals for his go-to. Sage art. Gale palm. He said, launching a deadly gust of wind towards the leader of the Akatsuki. Almighty push. He said, deflecting the wind attack and sending Naruto staggering back. Charging a small on the tip of his chain, Naruto launched it towards the diva path, hoping that his instant kill technique would deal with the man. But, out of nowhere, the pre-top path came in between the attack and the diva path and absorbed the Rasen Shuriken. Just as the absorption was done, he disappeared in a flicker. 
Gerudo supposed that he would have to get up and personal if he did not want any other of the orange-haired people to get in the fight. So, rushing forwards to live up to his thoughts, Naruto's chakra erupted even brighter as he charged it up for his fight with the Diva Path. As ninjutsu-oriented as the Diva Path seemed due to his gravity, he was no slouch into jutsu too. For every punch Naruto delivered, he got one in return, and his punches were strong enough to hurt even his enhanced body. Forming on his hand, Naruto lunged forwards again, only to be repelled by his opponent's almighty push again. Forming a plan in his mind quickly, Naruto summoned two shadow clones, who instantly scattered in different directions. Forming a triangle formation around the orange-haired man, each of the Naruto created a full-fledged and threw it towards their target. As expected, their foe dodged the attack, but rather than calling the attack off, each Naruto summoned a chain to catch the attack coming towards them and threw it towards the diva path with increased speed. Eventually, with the constantly increasing speed of the attacks, one of them connected and demolished the path's body into pieces. Thinking that his fight was over, Naruto started to look around for his next prey, but, to his astonishment, the Naraka path summoned some sort of demon-like thing, which absorbed the destroyed body of the diva path and regenerated it to one piece. I told you before, did I not? There is no competing with a god. The resurrected path panted out. After such heavy attacks and extensive use of his sage mode, Naruto's chakra was wavering. That was not to say that the diva path of the pain was fine. Even though his body was in one piece, he was profusely bleeding, his Akatsuki cloak torn apart and looking like he could fall over at any time. You don't look too good yourself. Naruto said. Do not always believe what you see. The diva said, flying up in the air. Joining both his hands together as a small black ball became visible in the air and started to attract everything towards it. The summoning path had summoned several gigantic summons who had been devastating the samurai and the shinobi alike. But, in absence of the Naraka path, it had been captured and stored away to prevent it from being resurrected. All the fodder shinobi were already dead and the Tsuchikage and his guards were currently fighting the Asura path with the Naraka path as his backup. Lava style. Quicklime jutsu. Kuritsuchi shouted, trying to trap the Asura path, exhaustion audible in her voice. The Asura path jumped over the quicklime, but before he could do anything, he got trapped in a transparent cage. Article style. Atomic dismantling jutsu. The Tsuchikid shouted and disintegrated the Asura path. Before they could start to celebrate, a large black ball became visible in the air and it started to attract everything towards it. Planetary devastation. The Diva path murmured. Chapter 32. Planetary devastation. The Diva path murmured. Looking at the constantly growing black ball of devastation, the brilliant mind of the Rakage decided that he could just punch it into pieces. So, charging his lightning cloak, the Rakage jumped high, enhanced by the gravitational pull of the moon replica, he was all but flying towards the black ball. Um, Rakage-sama. I don't think that's a very good idea. Derry murmured, but to no avail, as the Rakage had already launched himself. That has to be the stupidest way in which a cage has ever died. May said to herself. Naruto. Tsunade shouted, seeing the limp body of the red head getting pulled towards the artificial moon. Being at the core of the place from which the attack was launched, there was nothing that Naruto could do to avoid getting trapped in the small moon. His chains and chakra both were failing him at such a crucial moment. He had been using his sage mode for a long time and now his body was wavering. And his chains were just not strong enough to counter such strong gravitational pull. So, Naruto could only close his eyes and have a conversation with his tenant before things went south. That's something to hold on to. The Tsuchikid shouted, and as if his shout was an alarm, everyone ran to hold on to something. As expected from a fight of this magnitude, the meeting building and the surrounding area was in shambles. Without the assistance of the Diva Path, the cages had deduced the tricks of the five paths of pain and were able to take them down eventually. But, the casualties were high. See, the right-hand man of Rakage was dead. Ow, the guard of the Mizukage, had lost an arm. Most of the samurai guards were stomped upon by the gigantic summons, and the fourth rakage had probably committed suicide by rushing towards the miniature moon. Now, in the presence of the black ball of devastation, the panic was on the highest pedestal. Boy, Kurama. I hope I have proved myself enough, because if I haven't, we are probably going to die. Naruto said. Silence. This is really not the time to ignore me, you know. Naruto said again. Silence. Hello. Naruto tried once more. In this rough shape, your body will not be able to handle my chakra. A deep voice growled. Are you afraid? Naruto questioned. I am not, but charging your body up with my chakra will be a suicide move anyways. One needs practice to even stay conscious in presence of the full might of my chakra. Kurama said. I will pull through it. Naruto shrugged. Apart from that, I would rather die trying. He said. Very well then. Kurama said, and pain coursed through Naruto's body. Did Naruto get trapped in that? Tsunade questioned herself, her eyes wide. It seems like that. The Tsuchikage said. 
On the announcement of Sanadi's words, a chaotic sound of thousands of birds screeching erupted in the room, originating from blue lightning that was covering Kakashi's arm, his eyes in the three-pointed wheel pattern again. I will get him. Kakashi said, charging towards the now large ball made from the surrounding terrain. But, before he could reach there, a golden glow erupted from the artificial moon, making a large hole in it. This power is amazing. I can sense everything going on around here. Naruto said, looking at his glowing hands. Don't get carried away, you hardly have five minutes in this form before your body gives out. Kurama said. True to what everyone had seen, Naruto was glowing gold, a high-collared cloak surrounding his body, and nine Magatama marks adorning his back. I see. Naruto said, blitzing towards the last standing path of pain, holding him from his neck. Now close to the diva path for the first time without any instant time restrictions, Naruto could sense no emotions coming from the body. In an instant, a black rod formed on the diva path's hand which he tried to stab into Naruto's stomach. With reactions quicker than light itself, Naruto broke the path's hand and took the black rod in his own hands. There is some chakra flowing through this rod. Kurama said. Yes, I can feel it too. Naruto said, casually snapping the diva path's neck. So, you are just a puppet? Naruto asked, stabbing the rod into his own stomach. Yes, there is surely some chakra flowing through this. Follow it to its core. Kurama said. That will be the original body that was controlling the others. He concluded. And, in an instant, there stood no one where Naruto once stood. Run away, Conan. He is coming for me. Nagato said. No way am I running away. I will fight him if I must. Conan replied. He is too strong to handle Conan. He will surely kill me. But, I do not want you to become a casualty too. Nagato explained. Before they could argue any more, a tear appeared in the paper tree they were hiding in. Here you come, Yuzumaki. Nagato said. A bit too crippled for a god, aren't you? Naruto said, looking at the skinny body of the wielder, stuck to the machine like his life depended on it. You have come for revenge, haven't you? Just like every other man. Nagato said. You were expecting me to not have revenge in my mind when I come for you. Naruto countered. That is why you are a human, and I, a god. You will never know the meaning of letting go, unless someone forces it upon you. Nagato said. Is that so? Are you above feeling hatred and anger? Naruto questioned. I am. Nagato said, and in a split second, Conan was not behind him anymore. Conan was in front of him, with the tip of a kunai on her neck and chains covering her body, restricting the flow of her chakra. Will you not seek revenge if I kill her now? He said, applying just enough pressure on her neck to draw a drop of blood. Leave her out of this. Nagato shouted, thrashing around in his machine, trying to move. Hypocritical, no. You want me to leave her out of this, but you also want to kill them for their Naruto asked. All I do is for peace, someone like you, who is obsessed with revenge, will never be able to sacrifice everything for the betterment of the world. Nagato said, releasing a wooden arrow from his machine towards Naruto, aiming it carefully to not hurt Conan. I suppose I am selfish. If you come for what is mine, you will end up losing all you have. Naruto said, bringing Conan between him and the arrow, the arrow passing right through her heart. Before Nagato could throw a tantrum over her death, Naruto launched a kunai towards Nagato's heart. Being as exhausted as he was after performing the planetary devastation, Nagato was unable to muster up chakra for an almighty push and could do nothing but join Yahiko and Conan in the afterlife. What should I do with his eyes? Naruto questioned. Use it to summon the Jito Meizo, once you extract the chakra of the other tailed beasts, destroy the eyes. Kurama said. Should I not keep them for myself? Naruto questioned, curious. No, those eyes are not meant to be in this plane of existence. The world is better off without them. Kurama said. Well, whatever you say. Naruto said, the golden chakra fading, and his hands glowing green. Abido. Zetsu shouted. Aichi destroyed the Rinnegan. He said, frustration leaking from his voice. What? Did pain actually lose? Abido shouted in kind. Yes, and now it is gone. Everything we had done till now, gone, because of a brat. Zetsu said, calming down to think properly. Have you finally come to confront your judgment, Itachi? Chapter 33. What happened back then? Tsunade questioned. Nothing. Naruto replied, caressing the bird on his shoulder. Lies, she could feel the heaviness in Naruto's chakra. What was that golden form? She questioned once more. Ayubi had taken over. He replied. Lies, she knew he was in control. You look different. She stated. I don't know what you are talking about. He said. Lies, she could clearly see that his purple eye shadows were missing, and as far as she knew, they were there since his birth. Are you fine? She questioned once more. Yes. Was his prompt answer. Once again, she noticed his lie due to the heaviness in his steps and tiredness in his eyes, but she did not mention it. Take your time. She said, letting him sort out the mess he was going through. I am here for you. She said and started moving in silence. 
Tsunade, Naruto and Kakashi were heading back to Konoha after the Cage Summit fiasco. There was no conclusion of the summit, but Konoha both gained and lost something from it. Killing off the leader of the Akatsuki was surely a gain, and losing the treaty with Kumagakur after the death of the fourth Rakage was a loss. But, all in all, Konoha was in a better position than before. Naruto wanted to tell Tsunade of what the Golden Cloak was, of what he had done with those eyes, and how he had absorbed a power that would disbalance the hierarchy of the elemental nations. She was one of the very few that he liked or maybe even loved, but she was the foremost. Before, he would have straight up left Konoha, but with Shizune and Tsunade, he had found a home in Konoha. He had to sort out his powers and emotions before he could spill anything out. He would have to sit and think about this first. What do we do now, Abito? Zetsu questioned. But the Tachi and Pain gone, we lack manpower. And without them, we cannot even revive Madara. Abito said. How about you get Sasuke and his team into Akatsuki, that would solve our manpower issue for a while. And, if he's anything like Itachi, he will be very strong with his Manjekyo. Zetsu said. He would be, but he has not awakened the Manjekyo till now. Abito said. Indeed, but maybe telling him the truth about his brother would change things. Zetsu said. I suppose I will talk to him. Abito said, warping out of reality. Waking up in a dark cave, covered in bandages, was the last thing that Sasuke had expected after his fight with Itachi. But, it was happening. Trying to find the satisfaction of his victory after achieving his lifelong goal, there was nothing he could feel. No happiness. No excitement. No outrageous feeling of joy. So, he decided to look around with his onyx eyes to find a way out of the place he was at. So, you actually won. A voice said, and a man dressed in black spandex and orange mask whirled into existence. To the man's amusement, not a sliver of emotion flickered on Sasuke's face. His face was blank, his dark eyes looking straight into the hole of the mask. You are not interested at all, I see. Is it that you are thinking about your brother? He asked, but no reply came. Maybe this will bring you back to your senses. He said, his eyes shining red and forming a three-pointed shuriken. I am also a survivor of the Ichiha clan. Through this, Sasuke's left eye evolved into that of Itachi's and released onyx flames of Amaterasu on the man in front of him. On being burned by the hottest flames in existence, the masked man howled and thrashed and eventually disappeared in a swirl. What was that? Sasuke questioned. His eye returned back to its normal state as blood leaked out of it. The Amaterasu, which Itachi implanted inside you. An unexpected reply came, as the same masked man whirled out of nowhere. What do you mean by that? Sasuke questioned. Itachi probably temporarily implanted his ocular powers inside of you. The masked man said. Why would he do something like that? Sasuke questioned. To protect you, of course. The man replied. Protect me? If you keep spitting bullshit like that, I will kill you. He said. I know everything there is to know about Itachi. The truths, the lies, everything. The man said. What do you mean by that? Sasuke questioned. Like how to protect his little brother, he put everything on the line. How he denied everything he stood for, just to keep his precious brother alive. Abito said. You look off. Shizune said, standing at the door of Naruto's apartment. Like always, the apartment was full of birds flying around. Like always, it was unacceptably neat. Unlike always, Naruto was not looking very energetic. I have not slept properly yet. Naruto said, moving aside to let Shizune in. Is that so? Shizune questioned, getting on her tiptoes to stare Naruto straight in his eyes. Looking his eyes this close, she could see something vital missing. Your eye shadows? She questioned, her eyebrow raising. They are gone. She stated, clearly expecting an answer from him. Are you going to come in or will you just stand there the whole day? Naruto questioned. Fine. But, I definitely want answers. She huffed, getting in his home. I am still figuring it out. There are revelations that are yet to be revealed, but I am still figuring it all out. Naruto said as Shizune settled down, almost talking to himself. You look awfully tired. She said, I have gotten used to sleeping, and I haven't been able to sleep lately. Naruto replied. Now, that won't do, would it? Shizune said. Let's get to bed. She said, pulling Naruto by his hand. She knew there was something that he was hiding, but she trusted him enough to give him some time to get things off his chest. Will you explain everything to me now? Naruto questioned. What is there to explain? The wielder is dead, and your next target is Ichiha Madara. Kurama said. Why is my chakra so heavy? And why are my sage markings gone when I can feel a stronger chakra flowing within me? Naruto questioned. I told you before, collecting the chakra of all will ascend you beyond a normal sage. The chakra you feel is a sliver of itself. Jubi, by nature, is an extension of everything around you. Jubi is nature, and you wield its powers now. Kurama explained. Yes, but the control I feel over my chakra is exponentially better. 
I have never been bad at controlling my chakra, but this feels like I can control every drop of it individually. Naruto said. There is no point in discussing this as of now. Just get to an isolated area for a while, and we will figure out how these new powers of yours work. Kurama said and kicked Naruto out of his mind. I suppose I will trust you, then. Naruto said, waking up and looking at Shizun who was sleeping next to him. Chapter 34 Sensing something peculiar from his heightened senses, Naruto was moving towards an isolated area inside of the hidden leaf. He had to be present in front of the as of now, but he believed that catching an intruder in the village took priority. Entering the now guard less Achiha district was an easy task. Ever since Achiha Sasuke had abandoned the village, there had been no maintenance of the district. So, walking in the empty streets, the unique presence was getting more noticeable. True to what he had thought, on the shore of the Naka River, the red clouds were visible. So you came alone? The Akatsuki questioned. He was half black and half white, with a green cactus-like thing covering his head. I was not expecting to see you alone here. He continued. Give me one reason why I should not kill you right here. Naruto said, charging his hand with chakra to perform an earth-shattering punch. I can give you three. I am not strong enough to escape from here, you can sense no killing intent from me, and I am here to talk. He said in a dual voice. What is there to talk about? Naruto questioned. There is a lot, but I don't have that much time. He said. And, I am Zetsu. Well, we are. He is white Zetsu and I am black Zetsu. The creature explained. Don't play around. State what you are here for, or die. Naruto said. Now, now. I am pretty sure you want to know what I am here to say. Zetsu placated, speak up then. Naruto ordered. Do you know of the Sage of Six Paths? Zetsu questioned. I do. Naruto answered. What do you know of him? Zetsu questioned again. More than I should. Naruto replied, not really answering him. Hein, don't tell me. The Sage of Six Paths had two sons. The older one, Indra and the younger one, Ashura. Due to some disputes, they ended up as rivals and ultimately, arch enemies. Their disputes were not solved in their lifetimes, so, as demigods, they started to reincarnate into different generations. The first and Ichiha Madara were the first of them. You, Yuzumaki, and Ichiha Sasuke are the second ones. If you come with me and combine your chakra with Sasuke's, you will be able to awaken the full powers of the Sage of Six Paths. Zetsu said. So, you came to hire me? Naruto questioned, raising his eyebrow. In short, yes. Zetsu replied. And how do you know of all this? Naruto questioned. I have been around for a long time. Zetsu answered. Will you go away if I ask you to, or do you wish to die early? Naruto questioned. Are you denying our offer? Zetsu questioned. I am. Naruto said, folding his hands. Fine then, Yuzumaki. One way or the other, you will become the sacrifice that you are destined to be. Until next time. Zetsu said, sinking into the ground. Are the white Zetsus ready? Abito questioned. Yes. They are underground as of now. But, why do we need to go to war? Zetsu questioned. Sasuke or Madara will have to be pushed to death to awaken them, now that Pain's eyes are gone. Abito said. Madara? How are you planning to revive him? The reanimation. Try to get your hands on it, Abito said. That is hard. Naruto can sense my presence now. Zetsu replied. Work around it, that is the only shot we have at reviving Madara. Abito ordered. I will try to find a loophole. Zetsu said. And what of Sasuke? Abito asked. The implants were successful. He will need a few days to get used to his eyes, though. Zetsu said. I see. Abito said, ready to warp out of reality. Where are you off to, though? Zetsu questioned. I need to see Sasuke's prowess firsthand. Abito said and disappeared in a swirl. Try to get into the sage mode. Kurama said. Naruto was still at the Naka River. After the creature from the Akatsuki had gone away, Naruto had decided that this was the most isolated place he could find within the territory of Konoha. Sure. Naruto said, willing his body to perform the natural procedure of tapping into the sage mode. Like always, he could feel his chakra getting stronger. Like always, his body was reacting well to the new chakra. Unlike always, it was very easy to tap into the sage mode now, it was almost as easy as breathing. And unlike always, the aura of this sage mode was considerably lighter than the one he was used to. I feel much stronger. Stronger than the form we had while merging our powers, in fact. Naruto said. Indeed. This is the power of the Sage of Six Paths, after all. These powers are a representation of divinity amongst shinobi. Kurama said. Can I stack your cloak over this form? Naruto questioned. You probably can, but the intensity of that chakra would probably turn this district into dust. That is something you will need to do in proper isolation. Kurama said. That is understandable, I suppose. Naruto said, forming a purple ball of chakra in his hands. Forming has become easier too. He said. Try adding the chakra into your. Kurama said. 
I will try it. Naruto said, closing his eyes and concentrating on the chakra of the One Tails to draw on it. Slowly but surely, the signature blue curse marks of the One Tails started to spread on the purple ball of devastation. Sage art. Rasengan. Naruto said, smashing them into the nearby tree. The Rasengan only did the minimal damage that the base Rasengan was supposed to do, but on top of it, blue curse markings started to appear on the tree, and in the split second, every metal that got attracted by magnets was crushing the tree to powder. It probably immobilizes the one who makes contacts with this and attracts metal towards it. Naruto murmured. I will try another one. He said, preparing to charge another, but before he could do that, his sage mode started to flicker. You have not yet recovered from the damage you took from using my chakra in the state of exhaustion. Take a break for now, we have some time till you confront Madara. Kurama said. I see. Even though Sasuke is with them now, I don't really know how strong he has gotten. Naruto said. I do not think that he will be a bigger threat than Madara. Kurama huffed out. Well, whatever you say, but for now, I am really hungry. Naruto said and flickered towards a good restaurant. The Matarasu. Sasuke said, blood rushing out from his eye as the inextinguishable black flames consumed the tree in front of him. You have certainly gotten better at this. Abito said. I still cannot control them as I want to. Sasuke huffed out. Even Itachi could not do that, you know. Perhaps, you need some rest to figure out what you are trying to do. Abito replied. I do not have any time to rest. If things continue as they are, there will be more people who will have to suffer like Itachi did. Sasuke said, preparing to activate the eyes he had gotten through the sacrifice of his brother. What is your goal then, Sasuke? Abito questioned. A revolution. It is high time that the great villages understand that they cannot sacrifice anyone they want. He said, a purple ethereal skeleton surrounding him. Quite a goal you have. A pity that it will be overshadowed by the infinite. But, rest assured, you will live in the perfect world, Sasuke. Abito said to himself, sure that Sasuke was fully immersed in his training now. Chapter 35. Ah, in the rush of everything, he had forgotten that he had to report to the Hokage. You are seven hours late, Naruto. That is breaking Kakashi's record by three hours. He was not lazy, he just had more important issues to deal with, damn it. Are you just going to stay quiet? Sanadi questioned. The circumstances were. Peculiar. Naruto said. Peculiar, how? She questioned again. It is a long story, how about you tell me why I was called here first, and then I can explain everything to you? Naruto asked. Actually, I have a topic of more importance. So, you get on with your story first, then I will start mine. Sanadi sighed out. Ah, I see. Naruto said, rubbing the back of his neck. Well, get on with it then. She urged. When I was getting to your office to report for duty, I sensed a unique chakra. So, I decided to get to the core of it quickly. After searching for a while, I ended up at the Naka River in the Ichiha district. True to what I had thought, he was an Akatsuki member. Naruto said. Akatsuki? And you are not presenting his body yet? Sanadi asked, her eyebrow raising. Actually, he came to hire me for the organization. I refused, of course, but he ran away before I could do anything. Naruto explained. Why did anyone else not sense him? She asked. I am an exceptional censor, apparently. He shrugged. Well, anyways, about what I called you here for. She said, summoning a scroll. Read it. She said, be prepared for the next great war at Chihamadara. It read. They are clearly trying to bait someone out. If they wanted to win, they would have simply attacked while no one was expecting it. And, since the intentions of this Madara guy are clear, he is trying to bait me out on the field. Naruto said. Yes. That is why I wanted your opinion on this. This scroll was found right in the middle of the Hokage office, the most secure building in the whole village. And, the scroll of seals has been tampered with. Sanadi explained. Tempered with? Naruto questioned. The scroll of seals is kept in between of a sealing array that prevents anyone from touching it. Sanadi explained. But, when we did the general inspection of the scroll today, the array was broken and the scroll, open. She said. That is surely concerning. If they can infiltrate the village like that, we need to up our game too. Naruto said. Do you think we should start an alliance with the other nations? I am sure that each nation must have received the same threat. Sanadi questioned. Well, if you think they are a big threat, you should. But, I doubt any of them will be a challenge. Naruto said. Is that arrogance that I hear in your voice? Tsunade questioned, her eyebrow raising. Hardly. He said. I just think that I would be more than prepared for what is to come. He concluded. That is better. Do not let arrogance get in your head. She lectured. Of course. He said. And, I wanted to train in an isolated area for a while, can that be arranged? Naruto questioned. I suppose. Tsunade said, adopting a thinking pose. How does the forest of death sound? She questioned. 
I don't mind the place, my concern is isolation and freedom from the responsibility of the damage caused due to my training. He replied. No one goes to that place, and the terrain is a forest, so there should be no problems. She said, very well. May I take my leave then? He questioned. Sure you can. I will let you know of the decision that is made through a messenger bird. She said, thank you Hokage-sama. He bowed before. You actually managed to get it? Zetsu questioned. Yes. They had no counters against the space-time I use, and I was there only for a split second, so no one actually detected me before I was gone. Abito said. That is great. Zetsu exclaimed. It is not. Abito sighed. This reanimation is the one that the Sakando Kage had created. It is not very effective. We will need to revive Arachimaru from some curse mark to use a better version of it. He said. If you want, I can get some of his experiments here. Zetsu said. Please do. That is the only option we have left now. Abito said. And how is Sasuke progressing? Zetsu questioned. He is doing fine. He has learned to maintain his half-body Susanoo. He can probably rival any of the cages as he is. But, he is still no match for people like Madara or even Naruto for that matter. Abito said. That nine tails has been a big thorn in our side. Zetsu said. He will be taken care of too. He is only an obstacle in the plan. Everything will conclude as it should. Eventually. Abito said. You need to train your base sage mode before stacking my chakra onto it. Kurama said. That is understandable. I really don't want to die experimenting after all this, anyways. Naruto said. Stop talking now. Try pulling on Goku's chakra now, theoretically, you should be able to use lava style as his now. Kurama said. Sure. Naruto said, closing his eyes and concentrating on the chakra within him. Got it. He said. Lava style. Magma bullets. He continued, shouting the name of the out of habit now. As a consequence, a bullet covered in hot magma got released from his mouth and burnt the tree in front of him. This is good. This will be useful to surprise your opponent, as no one knows of your newly gained bloodlines as of now. Kurama said. Indeed. But I don't have enough time to get used to all of them. I am just going to improve what I am already used to. Naruto said. And what do you mean by that? Kurama questioned. This. Naruto said, a chain made of lava erupting from his back. I am more used to using my chains. It would be beneficial and economic for me to integrate new techniques with my already mastered techniques, rather than learning everything from scratch. Naruto explained. That is uncharacteristically smart of you. Kurama was complimented. We will be initiating our attack soon, Sasuke. Abito said. Finally, took you long enough. Sasuke said, sheathing his sword. But before that, I need to know if you remember the hand signs of the evil containment seal that was used on you. Abito said. I do. I saw Kakashi perform the seals with my Sharingan. But, why do you need it? Sasuke questioned. I need you to unseal Orochimaru from one of the curse marks. Abito said. No. Sasuke stated, folding his hands. We need him to perform the reincarnation for us. We cannot take on the five nations alone. Abito said. Oh, is the great Madara Ichiha scared? Sasuke questioned. I suppose I should have told you this before. I am not Ichiha Madara, I am only his disciple. We will be reviving the real Madara Chiha through Rachimaru too. Abito stated. On this revelation, Sasuke's eyebrow rose. How are you sure that Arachimaru will help us? He questioned. That snake will do anything to survive. You and I are both stronger than him. He will help us or die. Abito said. Fine. Sasuke stated, deciding to revive an abomination for the sake of a better world. All right. Abito said and turned around. Zetsu, get the army and the sacrifices ready. The war shall start soon. He concluded. Chapter 36. I have called all the Jonin and Jureya back from the field. At this point, we need all of our military force to defend the village from any sudden attack. Sanadi said. That seems like a smart decision. I wonder if they are done playing around. Naruto said, taking another sip of his sake. It had been three weeks since Naruto had asked for a place to train, and ever since then, invasion in the territory of the Fire Nations had become very common. Several of the white Zetsus had been invading their territory and causing havoc. They were not strong individually, but they were several in number. They had effectively blocked all the communication networks between the great villages by randomly attacking the messenger birds and the ship network. They probably are. The white creatures have been spotted dangerously close to the leaf village now. The final fight is probably on the brink of beginning. Tsunade sighed out, following Naruto and taking a sip of her sake too. Then why not deploy a heavy attack squad to just obliterate the Zetsus? Naruto questioned. It is not feasible. From what we know, they have a way of traveling underground. If I centralize an attack, they will just hit our weak spots. Sanadi explained. Well, I am on duty as of now, I can go and do it for you. Naruto said, filling his glass again. 
Do you think you can take on an entire platoon? Sonati questioned, raising her eyebrow. Do you still have doubts about that? Naruto countered, his eyebrow as high as hers. Of course, as drunk as she was, she could not win in a staring contest against Mr. I cannot get drunk. I suppose. She sighed out. I will let you know about it tomorrow, let me enjoy the time I have for now. She said, sure. Naruto murmured, enjoying the little time he had before the inevitable violence. Are you prepared, Sasuke? Abito questioned. It looked like he had changed his attire now. The attire included a pair of black pants and gloves, with a white form-fitting shirt underneath. Over this he wore a purple, high-collared, long-sleeved mantle that splits down to the lower half and had the Ichiha crest over his back, similar to that of the blue mantle. Around his waist was a simple, light purple obi and belt. He had also replaced his orange mask with a white one with three openings, as opposed to the single opening of his previous mask. The openings of his mask blazed red, one of the eyes with a unique three-pointed shuriken, and another, a matured shuriken. As ready as I am going to get. Sasuke replied, his eyes blazing red similarly. The pair of you look quite prepared, Kuki Kuku. A voice hissed. Did I not tell you to not move around without my explicit permission? Abito asked. Now, little Abito, no need to be so rude. Arachimaru said, a grin splitting his face. How far have you progressed? He questioned. Far enough. All the modifications will be done in a few more days. They will be ready for use then. Arachimaru said. You better not try to backstab us, if I find a sliver of doubt, I will end you myself. Again. Sasuke said, raising his sword threateningly. My my. What have I done to gain your hatred, Sasuke? Arachimaru questioned, his voice deceptively calm. Everything you do and stand for is disgusting for me. The only reason you are alive is because you serve a purpose for the greater good. Sasuke said. My, all I was doing was finding a way to not die, what is so wrong about it? Arachimaru questioned. Enough. Abito said. We have places to be at, Sasuke. He said, moving to the exit of their hideout. Fine. Sasuke hissed, following Abito. Sage art. Rasen shuriken. Naruto said, releasing one more towards the herd of white zetsus, obliterating a couple hundred in a single move. You are not very strong, Sanadi should have just sent me earlier. You would not have become such a big problem then. Naruto said, snapping the neck of the zetsu who was trying to stab him from the back. Summoning. He shouted, summoning a large owl in the forest. One more thing. He told the large summon. Let's head towards the next camp. He concluded, getting on the furry back of the summon. You can fly now, you know. Kurama said. It is tiresome, I will save that for a fight. I want to rest before I have to destroy another such camp. He replied and fell asleep on the bird's large body. Naruto had been traveling throughout the outskirts of the Fire Nation for a while now, destroying all the Zetsu camps he had seen. Till now, the count was 39. Since most of the major ports and communication routes were free now, Naruto was heading back towards Konoha, searching for the camps on the way. Lady, Hokage. One of the shinobi shouted, barging into the office. In an instant, there were seven blades on the neck of the intruder. The Tetsu? What is it? The Hokage questioned, forming hand signs to dismiss the Anbu. There are snake summons marching towards the village gates, Lady Hokage. It is speculated that the attacker is Sasuke Chia. They said, is that so? She questioned. Shizun. She said, prompting Shizun to get into the office. Inform Jiraiya and his squad that their expertise is needed on the village entrance. Or, get the village defense system ready and prepare the platoons for any sort of battle. She ordered. Hi. Shizun and the Anbu said, and disappeared. Yamato announced the village lockdown. Sanadi said and stood up from her desk, moving towards the large window of the Hokage office. The shit is about to get real, eh? She said, taking a sip of the sake in her hand. Summoning Jutsu. A cry was heard on the outskirts of the Hidden Leaf village, and in a split second, the large snakes marching towards Konoha were not looking threatening anymore. Bunta, you haven't gotten rusty, have you? Jiraiya questioned from the top of the summon's head. Eh, never too old to carve out a wallet out of snakeskin. The summon replied, unsheathing its sword. Well then, let us get our old bones working once more. Jiraiya sighed out. I am hardly old. Gamma Bunta said, jumping towards its rival summon. While the fight between the gigantic summons was taking place, in another corner, stood a sensei and student face to face, both of their hands shining blue, ready to do what they must. I was not expecting you to fall this low, Sasuke. Kakashi said. I am doing nothing for myself. I aim for a better world, just like you. But, unlike you, I am willing to make sacrifices for it. Sasuke said. You are only leading us to the next great war. Things will never be ideal, Sasuke. You still have time, surrender and you will stop havoc from spreading throughout the world. Kakashi warned. I have come too far to surrender now, Kakashi. He said, his eyes evolving to become the eternal Manjekyo Sharingan. 
I suppose I will stop you like a good teacher should, Sasuke. Kakashi said, his eyes turning to their Manjekyo state in response. Chapter 37, Bait of Opening. Open. Mike Guy shouted, opening first of the eight celestial gates to counter the smaller summons and the horde of white zetsus. Bait of Opening. Open. A similar, but noticeably younger voice exclaimed, green aura blasting from his body. Niji, take the frontal role with Tenten as your backup to counter the summons, Lee will deal with the white things, and I will rush forward to combat the larger summons. Guy said. Hi. A chorus of three was heard and in a split second, there was no one where Team Guy once stood. Eight trigrams. Rotation. Niji shouted, creating some space for Tenten and himself. Eight trigrams. Sixty-four palms. He exclaimed again, stopping the flow of chakra in the snake's body and subsequently dispelling them. Twin dragons. Tenten said, unleashing hundreds upon hundreds of pointy tools from it and launching it in all the directions in the form of a tornado. Dynamic entry. Lee shouted, clearing the horde of Zetsus charging towards him in a sweeping kick. Bring it on, my archenemies, I shall show you the power of my youth. He exclaimed and vanished in a green blur. There is no Orochimaru. Gamabunta questioned. I doubt he is on the field. These snakes were summoned by another kid. Jiraiya replied. That sucks. I wanted to shut his skin too. Gamabunta said, jumping on the small summons, dispelling them, and rushing towards his archenemy. You show yourself again. Manda said. I am not very happy either, but I suppose this is what we have come down to. Gamabunta replied, stopping from his rampage. Is that so? Let me finish you once and for all, then. Manda hissed. Stop talking big if you cannot back up your words. Gamabunta replied, unsheathing his sword. You just stole my words. Manda hissed in reply and charged towards the giant toad. Gamabunta replied by jumping high towards the sky and free frilling towards the large snake with his sword below him. The snake managed to slither out toward safety just in the nick of time to avoid getting slashed. As the pair of giant summons came face to face again, they rushed towards each other again. Amabunta slashed his sword towards Manda, who caught the sword in his canines and swung his tail towards the toad summon. Abandoning his sword, Gamabunta flipped back to save himself and his summoner. It is time for the oil, Bunta. Jiraiya said. As you wish. Gamabunta replied, spitting a river of oil from his mouth. Combination style. Toad flame bullet. Jiraiya shouted, igniting the oil. The deadly attack connected with the snake, burning it to ashes. That was surprisingly easy. Gamabunta said. Below you. Jiraiya shouted. The shout alerted the toad summon to catch the tail of Manda coming towards him from underground. The face, however, came from the behind. As busy as his arms were with the tail of the snake, Gamabunta could only turn his head to see the sharp teeth of Manda coming towards him. The Damara Sengen. Jiraiya shouted, slamming the large into the face of the snake. An attack. Naruto questioned. The bird chirped in reply. Boy. Naruto said, caressing the back of his large owl summon. We need to hurry towards Konoha now. He said. As you command. The owl said, flapping his wings to change the direction towards Konoha. Naruto was flying around, searching for more Zetsu camps when a sparrow came onto his shoulder and informed him of the ongoing events in Konoha. So, abandoning the mission based on his priorities, he decided to rush towards Konoha. I suppose this was expected. He sighed out. Dodori Senbin. Sasuke said, releasing a lightning bolt towards his sensei. With his Sharingan out, it was a no-brainer for Kakashi to dodge them and reply with a hail of kunai. Of course, as in Ichiha, Sasuke was no slouch at using his own Sharingan too. Taking the battle up a notch, Sasuke summoned two shuriken from the seal on his hands and launched them towards Kakashi. Kakashi managed to dodge them well enough but was not able to counter it when Sasuke used the strings attached to them to pull them back and got stabbed. Of course, Sasuke did not need to see the poof of smoke to realize that the one who got stabbed was a clone. But, he was not ready to get pulled down into the ground by the real Kakashi. Flipping backwards after realizing that the one in ground was an illusion, Kakashi strained his Sharingan eye to look for his wavered pupil. Chidori. Sasuke shouted, free falling towards Kakashi from the sky with a Chidori in hand. Earth style. Earth dome. Kakashi countered, a dome of earth covering Kakashi. Flipping backwards Sasuke's body started to get surrounded by a purple aura. I will show you what a true Sharingan can do, Kakashi. Sasuke said, a purple skeleton protecting him. What is this? Kakashi questioned. This is called the Susanao, the true power of a real Ichiha. He said, straining his eyes further as an armor surrounded the skeleton. Take this. He shouted, his armor forming an arrow and shooting it towards Kakashi at speeds that a normal eye cannot follow. Hamui. Kakashi countered, blood erupting from his eye as a vortex opened in front of him that absorbed the arrow. Manjekyo? Sasuke questioned. Indeed. Kakashi replied, strain of using the Manjekyo audible in his voice. It looks like yours drains a lot of chakra. Sasuke said. 
Amaterasu. He shouted, blood erupting from his eyes like Kakashi, as black inextinguishable flames were launched towards Kakashi. Gaining control of his body again, Kakashi flipped back to avoid getting burned, but there was no rest for him as a large purple hand smashed towards where he had landed. To avoid getting flattened like a bug, Kakashi continued to flip backwards until he got an opportunity to breathe. Hamui. Kakashi shouted, creating an opening in Sasuke's Susanoo and launching a hail of kunai towards it. Unsuspecting of such a possibility, Sasuke was too surprised to dodge the attack and got stabbed right into the stomach. As common as the kunai were, a sharp edge was dangerous for any human. But such injuries, even Sasuke with Orochimaru cells needed some time to recover, hence, his Susanoo vanished like it never existed. Seizing the opportunity and strengthening his resolve, Kakashi charged a Chidori in his hand and lunged towards his once pupil. I am sorry, Sasuke. He said. Chapter 38 I am sorry, Sasuke. Kakashi said as he rushed towards his student, his hands blazing blue, prepared to do the worst deed. Didori. He shouted, thrusting his hand towards his once pupil's chest. Now, he is a very valuable investment of mine. Kakashi heard as he realized that he had phased through his student. Turning back, Kakashi was met with a white mask. Who are you? Kakashi questioned, fighting his exhaustion as he flipped back to a comfortable distance. I thought a well-reputed ninja like yourself will not forget such an important name. The masked man replied. I am prone to forget useless things. Kakashi said in reply. Well, let me remind you then. I am Ichiha Madara, the one who initiated this state of war. He said. Ah, the impostor. Kakashi questioned. Deny the facts and you will never be able to see the reality as it is. Madara said. Well, I suppose I will cross-check your intel after I kill you. Kakashi said, lunging towards the alleged Madara. Bold of you to assume that a borrowed Sharingan can match my power. Madara said, as he phased through Kakashi's Yadori. We will see that, won't we? Kakashi said, preparing to fight with his exhausted body. These creatures just would not stop coming, Sensei. Lee said. Go through, my pupil. Only with such harsh fights can you hope to become the greatest you can be. Guy replied. Of course, Guy Sensei. I will not disappoint you. Lee shouted as he prepared to charge towards the next wave of the White Zetsus. Lava style. Magma bullets. A voice came from above as hot molten bullets started to rain from the air towards the horde of Zetsus. You can go now Naruto said, landing down from the owl. What is going on here? He asked as he turned towards Guy. Ah, Naruto. It looks like we must fight with all our youth to fight off the invaders. Guy exclaimed. We are being invaded. Niji simplified the sentence after realizing that Team Guy was the only team that actually understood what Guy speaks. I see. What is the attack pattern? Naruto questioned again, looking around to make sure that there were no Zetsu sneaking around. Master Jiraiya is fighting the snake summons, Kakashi was fighting Sasuke when I saw him last, and we were managing the white creatures. Guy explained in a surprisingly normal voice. I see. You guys go ahead and help Jiraiya, I will look out for Kakashi. Naruto said and disappeared, not giving any time to Team Guy to counter what he had said. So, he can phase through anything, but the catch is that he cannot attack anyone while he is phasing through something. Kakashi thought, analyzing his opponent. Things were looking bad for Kakashi. He was bleeding from head to toe, while his enemy looked pristine enough to attend a meeting with the daimyo. But, the fact remained that he had to continue to fight or die trying. Pamui. He said again, pushing all the chakra and concentration he had left within himself into his Sharingan eye. Kamui was the only attack that Madara was actually defending against. Thinking that the attack was directed towards him, like before, Abito prepared to get out of the way of the portal that was about to be summoned, but his eyes widened in anger when he looked back towards Sasuke's body, which was now missing a head. How dare you? He shouted in rage, charging towards the now exhausted Kakashi. Even in rage and anger of seeing his plans fall apart, Abito was keen enough to notice the purple ball of destruction falling towards him from the sky. Rasengan. Naruto shouted, smashing the land below him after phasing through the alleged Madara. Realizing that he did not hit his target, Naruto grabbed Kakashi by his collar and flipped backwards to avoid getting sneak attacked. Can you fight? Naruto questioned. I cannot. In fact, I cannot even stand straight without support. Kakashi replied. I still haven't found a breakthrough against his intangibility. So unfortunately, you will have to fight. Naruto said. I would be glad to help, but I am restricted by my body. Kakashi stated. Well, I guess I will have to take him on by sheer speed, then. Naruto murmured. Curl yourself out of here, things are going to get ugly now. He said to Kakashi. How sweet of you. Kakashi said, covering his Sharingan eye to preserve some much needed chakra. Quite bold of you to come face me like a man. Are you prepared to die already? Madara questioned. Believe me, you are not even a match for me. All you are is a one-trick pony, and I will break that soon enough too. 
Naruto said as a golden cloak started to surround him. A moment later, his eyes shined brighter, the only indicator of him tapping into the sage mode. As a consequence of tapping into the sage mode with Chakravalda, his long cloak became shorter until it was little more than a jacket, and nine black balls adorned his back. W.Y. Abito was cut mid-sentence as Naruto punched him straight on his mask, untraceable even with his. Um, you are definitely not Madara. Naruto said, seeing Madara's scarred face as the shattered mask fell apart. Our Yuabito was cut off once again, this time due to a punch to his stomach. You know what? I really don't care who you are, you have been a nuisance for me long enough. He said, summoning one of the black balls in his hand and covered it with lava. How about you die now? Naruto asked, launching the deadly ball of magma towards Abito. I suppose it is done now. Arachimaru murmured. Zetsu? He shouted, causing the white creature to grow out from the ground. Yes. Get me the body and the sacrifice. I think I am done with the modifications. He said. Well, if you are sure. Zetsu murmured, disappearing into the same ground again. Chapter 39, How About You Die Now? Naruto asked, launching the deadly ball of magma towards Abito. Being in his six paths mode, Naruto was just too fast for Abito. Unable to sense or see him, and not being fast enough to use his Kamui or Izanagi, Abito could do nothing but melt away from the heat of the magma that covered him once the Rasengan expanded. We never got to know who he was. Kakashi said, limping on one leg towards Naruto. Do I look like I care? Naruto questioned, moving towards Kakashi, his hands glowing green. You really don't, and I wonder if that is a good thing or not. Kakashi said, the soothing sensation of the six paths chakra healing him, relaxing his body. I don't see how it concerns you in any way. Naruto replied, apparently done healing Kakashi. So, is it over then? Kakashi questioned. I don't think so. I sense a large reserve of chakra being summoned nearby. Naruto replied. Shall we be on our way then? Kakashi questioned again. Yes. You, towards Konoha. And I, towards the enemy. Naruto said, preparing to leave. Ah, that is not how it works, Naruto. I am coming too. Kakashi said, eyes smiling. That was not a request. Naruto said, disappearing from where he previously was in a split second. A sigh escaped from Kakashi's lips. I suppose I will do as you say. Kakashi said to no one. Summoning. Impure world reincarnation. Arachimaru said, beginning to form the log sequence required to use the reincarnation, but before he could begin with the tiring process, a golden blur burst into the underground hideout by splitting apart the ceiling. Stopping his hand signs halfway through and creating a distance between himself and the intruder, Arachimaru took a good look at the glowing person. Arachimaru. A black creature shouted, stumbling into the cave. I cannot sense a beto anymore. He exclaimed without sensing the tension in the room. I suppose we have the suspect right in front of us, Zetsu. Arachimaru said, guiding the black creature's vision towards Naruto. The last time I saw you, you were only half black. Naruto said. Well you see. Zetsu was cut off mid-sentence, literally. I don't really care, I am getting tired now. Naruto sighed. You are the last one now, I guess. He murmured, looking towards the white snake. Now. I hope you understand that I, too, was forced to work under the mastermind. Arachimaru said slyly, realizing that his prowess faded in front of his enemy. You are a known enemy of the leaf regardless, and unless you leave this cave alive, no one will know if you were with that Madara guy willingly or not. Naruto replied. Kukuku. How very dubious of you. Surely you would not fall to such an extent, right? Arachimaru questioned, raising his hands as a sign of surrender. As Arachimaru's hands raised, three chains shot out of Naruto, binding Arachimaru. Oh, so you are going to hand me to Konoha now? Arachimaru questioned, eager to at least make it out alive. No, I am just relieving you off of your chakra, we would not want you to slither into another body after I kill you now, would we? Naruto said. And, true to what he had said, Arachimaru could feel his chakra leaving his body. Damn you. Arachimaru shouted, panic visible on his face for the first time. And, fortunately for the world, these were the last words that the snake had spoken. Ah, I suppose I can spend some time with Shizu now. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want another. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.